everybody and welcome you to React Native EU 5th edition. My name is Mike and I'm your host of React Native EU. So welcome everybody to our stream. We are streaming out of Wrocław, Poland. And as you can see, this conference is happening remotely this time as well, just like one year before. Now, regardless of this fact, we want to make sure that you take maximum out of it because networking and sharing knowledge between each other is what we think is the most important aspect of React Native EU. So despite being remotely, we put a lot of effort to making sure that this will be easy for you um, to do. So before we start with the talks, I do have a couple of informations to tell you uh, connected to the networking part. There is a Discord channel on our Callstack server. You can find the link down below. You can join it and ask your questions about the talks. We will answer them on our special React Native show podcast that will be published soon after the conference. You can also talk with other participants. You can share your knowledge and experience within each other based on the talks. So just log in there, stay there and treat it as your networking aspect, just like we were all here in Poland in the same place in Wrocław. Now also make sure to follow Colstack IO on Twitter and React Native EU on Twitter and tweet React Native EU hashtag everything about the conference. Let your friends know that we are live so that they can join us and they will not miss the first part of the conference, which will be very exciting, like the entire two days that are in front of us. You can also visit our React Native EU website where you can see the agenda, all the talks, and in case you are busy, you can pick the ones that you want to attend, but worry not, we will all, we will publish them to our YouTube channel um, a couple of days uh, or maybe weeks after the conference. So it's still better to be here with us so you can have the first-hand experience and knowledge uh, straight from the speakers. We are organizing this conference here, as I said, in our Colstack office. So as you can probably assume, Colstack is the organizer. Uh, now, Colstack is a team of super great React Native and React developers. We are doing very, very interesting projects all about cross-platform software. So in case you are here somewhere from around Poland or maybe from Poland, uh, make sure to apply or just let us know that you are uh, interested in changing your job. We have a lot of great, interesting opportunities for you and challenges that may uh, feel you like there is still a lot of exciting projects in front of you. Just one important information before we start, this conference is also co-hosted by my friend from Colstack, Wukash. So in case you see somebody else, not me, uh, introducing you to another call today or tomorrow, uh, don't be afraid, uh, everything's going okay. Uh, we are doing this together uh, because there is just so many great talks here today that I, I felt like it's going to be a good idea to share some of that experience with uh, somebody else at Colstack that also likes doing podcasting and conferences. So let's start with what you are all in for here. So the React Native Talks. Now, the first block is a cross-platform and architecture block. So in this part, we will be talking about the things that are important to React Native at a core level. So underlying building blocks and some things that you may not hear uh, every day about, but understanding them and having full exposition to them will make you feel like you can build even more advanced apps. So our first speaker is Mark from Expo, and he will be talking about how JSI powers the most advanced camera library out there for React Native. Now, uh, of course, he will be talking about the camera library, but one thing that you may, that you don't that you can't miss out of this talk is that uh, GSI is something that is yet to be public and open for everybody. Yet still folks at Expo are using it already for the camera library. So we are not only here for a great talk about camera features, but also how JSI is enabling you to do even more advanced things. So you can think about it as a very, very future-proof talk, something that maybe next year or two years from now will be what everybody will be talking about. So let's learn about how they are using JSI and how their camera library is working. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark, and welcome to my talk about Vision Camera and JSI. I will be splitting this talk into two parts. So in the first part, we're going to take a look at Vision Camera as a library and how you can use it in your app. And we're going to create a simple object detector app using frame processes. And the second part, I will go over how JSI works, what JSI really is, and how you can create a simple, fast, and synchronous library using JSI. So let's get right to it. So I've created a new React Native project and installed Reanimated and Vision Camera. I've added some basic code to request for camera permission. So if the user has not granted permission, we're going to display that. And if there is no device available, we're going to show a loading indicator. Otherwise, we can display the camera. Let's take a look at how this looks for now. And as you can see, the camera is running fine. All right, we have our camera running. How do we implement an image label now? 
So let's first try to understand how this works in native apps. In a native iOS app, you have to create your camera session and then create a new instance of the AV Capture Video Data Output class. Then you can implement the Capture Output Delegate method, and this method gets called for every frame the camera sees. So for example, if your camera is running at 60 FPS, this function gets called 60 times a second with a new frame. In there, you can try to implement any sort of processing you want. You can use this for facial recognition, object detection, image labeling, QR code scanning, and even upload the frames to WebRTC to create a real-time video chat. On Android, this is basically the same story. You create a new image analyzer, and this image analyzer gets called with the new image every time the camera sees a new image. So for example, in here, you might want to run your image labeling, object detection, facial recognition, or WebRTC uploading. Okay, we now understand how it works in a native iOS or native Android app. But we're React Native developers, we're all afraid of native code. So how can we do this in JavaScript? Luckily, Vision Camera provides an API for this. It's called Frame Processes, so just like the Image Analyzer or the Capture Output Delegate from the native iOS and Android apps, this function gets called for every frame the camera sees. You can use the frame object to access frame data. For example, you can inspect the image's width or height properties. For high performance algorithms, you can also create native functions. So you write a few lines of native code and then directly call them inside a JavaScript frame processor. For example, the detect is hotdog function is a native function written in Objective C or Swift and Java or Kotlin. Let's take a look at how we can create a simple frame processor. We're going to create a new variable called frame processor, and we're going to use the use frame processor hook to create a new frame processor. Inside the use frame processor function, we have to use the workhead directive. So let's add it, and let's just simply log something to the console every time a new frame arrives. All right, and let's add the frame processor to the camera. Let's hit save, and that's the change. In our console below, we can now see that a new frame arrives every time the frame processor gets called, which gets called every second per default, we can also adjust this behavior by passing frame processor FPS and pass some higher value, such as 10, which gets called 10 times a second. All right, let's start creating our first frame processor plugin. A frame processor plugin is a native function. You can write in Objective C or Swift or Java or Kotlin, and you can directly and synchronously call it from a frame processor. For example, if we create a native function that's called label image, we can call it like this. So to create the native function, let's go ahead and open the project in Xcode. All right, let's start implementing a plugin. We're going to create an interface and an implementation for the plugin. And then we're just going to create a static inline function, which is called every time you call the plugin. So for example, in this case, I'm calling it label image and the function receives a frame as well as any arguments passed to the function. We're going to export it to make it available in the Vision Camera runtime using the Vision Export Frame Processor macro. Let's go ahead and start implementing the label image algorithm. We're going to use MLKit for this, and MLKit has an API where we can label images. We need to add the library to our pod file and then run pod install. And then we're going to create an MLK Vision Image instance and assign an orientation. After we've created this, you have to create an MLK Image Label instance, which is responsible for labeling images. Then you can use the process image function to process an image. Let's try it. We're going to create an MLK image label instance, which is going to be a static instance we're going to reuse. And then we're going to create a new MLK vision image instance. We're going to initialize it with the frame buffer. As you can see here, we use the frame. And we're going to set the orientation to the frame orientation. Then we're going to scan for labels. In this case, we're using the results and image function, which is synchronous. Using the labels, we can now initialize a new array and fill in the labels. So in this case, we're creating an NS mutable array. I'm going to call it results. And then we're going to iterate over each label in this array and assign it to this array. Then we just return it. All right, that's it. That's all of the native code you need for a frame processor plugin. Let's go ahead and create the JavaScript side now. I'm going to create a new file called label image. In this file, I'm going to export a new function called label image. It, I have to use the workload directive so it can be called from the Vision Camera runtime. Then, as we learned earlier, the function now exists in the Vision Camera runtime prefix with two underscores. So I'm just going to call it like this. And lastly, we need to add it to the bubble runtime. So open your bubble config and then find the line where the reanimated plugin is added. We just need to add a new configuration to it. 
and pass it in as a global variable. That's all you need to do. Now restart your Metro Bundler, and you can simply call a function. We're going to import it. Now let's try just logging all image labels. So let's start the app and take a look. As you can see, the frame processor plugin gets called and we're logging all of the labels to the console. All right, now that we know how to use frame processes, let's take a look at how JSI works. We're going to create a simple JSI library and afterwards we're going to look into more advanced examples such as a JSI host object and how Vision Camera uses JSI to provide all of this functionality. Let me start by explaining what JSI really is. I'm sure all of you already know that React Native uses a bridge for communication between JavaScript and Native. Since the JavaScript runtime runs in a very isolated context, there's not a lot of things you can do in it. Sure, you can create functions, create numbers, add numbers, create strings, create objects and stuff like that. But what if you wanted to access the device name or the phone's IP address? Those things are available through platform-specific APIs, so APIs written in Objective-C or Swift and Java. As with most programming languages out there, you cannot automatically and directly call into another programming language. There always has to be some sort of communication layer in between. For example, in Java, you can call into native C or C++ code using JNI, the Java native interface. To call C++ APIs in Swift, you have to manually create a bridge using C or Objective-C, which acts as a communication layer in between. In C-sharp, you have to reference the function's name and the DLL it lives in. So that's why the React Native bridge was invented. It provided a tunnel to send messages between native and JavaScript. If you wanted to find out the IP address, you have to send a message like get IP address to the native world. The native world receives that message, finds out the actual IP address, and then sends back another message with the IP address in it. JavaScript receives that message, and now JavaScript has a value which contains the IP address, which is a string. This is of course not an ideal solution, since the bridge uses a batching system, and the message is not immediately sent, but rather batched with other messages. At some later point in time, all of the messages are then sent to native. Also, there's a lot of serialization going on here, which is done in the JSON format. So you cannot send a number to the native function. It has to be converted to a string, a JSON, first. As you can imagine, that's really slow. Okay, so what's the solution? Well, since our JavaScript runtimes, JavaScript Core, Hermes V8, are written in C or C++, some very smart people invented a C++ API called JSI. JSI is an abstraction layer over virtually any JavaScript runtime. It works the same for JavaScript Core, for Hermes, for V8, and any other runtimes that might implement JSI. So if you know object-oriented programming, you can think of it like an interface, which is exactly what it is. It has functions defined, which the runtimes implement. For example, you can create a JavaScript number straight out of C++. Okay, but let's take a look at some actual code. So in JavaScript, we can create numbers by using the assignment operator. In this case, the variable number stores the value 42. Let's see how we can create this in C++. In C++, we use the JSI value constructor to create a new value called number, we can also use in C++, which holds the value 42. This variable can directly be passed to JavaScript, either by passing it as a parameter or by setting it as a property on an object. Let's try creating a string. In JavaScript, we can, again, use the assignment operator and two quotes. In C++, we also have to define the encoding format, so in this case, it's UTF-8 and we have to pass the runtime. Again, the value name exists in the C++ world, so we can directly run some operations or functions on it. Now let's take a look at functions. Let's create a function which just adds two numbers together. We're going to call this function add. In JavaScript, we can again use the assignment operator and create an anonymous function. This function adds first and second together and returns the result. In C++, we have to create a JSI function which creates a new function from the host function. A host function is a function which actually lives in the host environment, so in a native world. This function contains C++ code, but can be directly called from JavaScript. We have to pass a runtime, we have to pass a prop name, which will be add in our case. We have to specify the number of parameters, in this case it's two, the first and the second number. And then we can create a C++ lambda. And the lambda's first argument is the runtime. The second argument is the this value, so you can bind a function to another this value. The third argument is an array 
the C style array of all arguments passed to the function. For example, on the first position there will be the first number, on the second position there will be the second number. And the count parameter specifies how many arguments were actually passed to the function. In our case this will be two. Then the lambda returns a JSI value. You always have to return a JSI value, and if you don't want to return anything, you have to return a JSI value of undefined. So in this case, we're casting the first argument to a number, then casting the second argument to a number, and add it all together. Then we return a new JSI value of the result. Numbers in JSI are always doubles. Let's try calling this function. In JavaScript, we will simply use add and pass two parameters. This function add can either be the one we created in JavaScript or the one we created in C++, the host function. We can call both of them synchronously. Let's try calling the same function from C++. Again, we have to have a reference to the add function and then we can simply use the call property to call the function. We have to pass the runtime and then all the variadic parameters we want to pass. So let's try adding this function to the global namespace. In JavaScript, we can simply use global.add and then use the assignment operator to assign this property. In C++, we can use runtime.global to get the global property, and then we can use set property to set a new property. I won't go into detail about C++ memory management, but you have to move the add function because there's no copy operator for JSI values. So in this case, if we set the add function to the global namespace in the JavaScript runtime, we can directly call it in JavaScript, which we call the native host function from here. So if we compare this to a bridge module now, you notice that this function no longer has to be awaited. This function is completely synchronous, so the result returned in the host function can directly be used in JavaScript. This value holds the result we return here. To do this with a bridge function, we had to use await, which cannot be used in a top-level JavaScript code. So as you might have already noticed, this is the benefit of providing a direct, fast and synchronous access to the JavaScript runtime. If we go back to our IP address example, we can now create a function in C++ that simply returns the IP address. We can then install this function in a JavaScript runtime's global property and then simply call this function. We don't have to use a wait anymore and the function is directly called just like any other JavaScript function. Also, there's no more serialization going on because as we learned earlier, all of the JavaScript values can be directly accessed in C++. So a JavaScript number can be directly used in C++ as a JSI value of type number. For our IP address, this would be a JSI value of type string. So let's take a look at the IP address example. We create a host function in C++, which simply gets the IP address from some platform-specific API, for example, from an Objective-C API, and then simply returns a JSI string, which contains the IP address. We move this function to the global namespace in JavaScript, and then in JavaScript, we can simply call it. So global now contains the get IP address function, which is a host function that exists in C++, and you can directly call it without using a wait. This is how you would install a native function into the JavaScript runtime. So let's quickly recap. JSI is a replacement for the bridge. While currently both the bridge and JSI exist in a React Native project, the bridge will soon be completely removed and every native module will use JSI under the hood. JSI is faster than the bridge, and JSI is more powerful than the bridge by providing a direct access to the JavaScript runtime. With the bridge, the communication between JavaScript and native was asynchronous. Remember the batch message system? So this means you have to use a wait for every single function you call, even if that's an add function, which simply adds two numbers together. With JSI, everything is synchronous per default, so you can use it at top level JavaScript code. But don't worry, you can easily create promises to make something awaitable if it's a long running or an asynchronous task. Since JSI exists as the JavaScript runtime, it is no longer possible to use a remote debugger such as Google Chrome. Instead, you have to use Flipper. Remember, JSI is just a replacement for the bridge, so only the underlying technology changes. In most cases, you don't need to use JSI directly or even C++ at all. The Turbo Modules API will be almost the same as the Native Modules API. So this means for every Native Module that exists today, it will be very easy to migrate to Turbo Modules without rewriting the entire thing. Currently, there are three runtimes that implement JSI. JavaScript Core, which is the default runtime for now, Hermes, which might be the default runtime sometimes in the future, and V8. Also, JSI does not implement any sort of thread safety locking. While JSI is ready, it's a bit quirky to get access to the JavaScript runtime at the right point in time. There are a few hacks involved I will show you now. We'll take a look at my React Native MMKD library, which provides a fast and easy storage solution for React Native using JSI. 
It's about 30 times faster than async storage, and it is a really good example for JSI, since you benefit from better performance, as well as synchronous access and top level JavaScript code. Let's take a look at the project structure first. So compared to native bridge modules, there's currently no way to auto-link or automatically install a JSI module. Instead, we have to go into our main application of Java, find the React Native host instance we're creating, and then override the get JSI module package function. In this function, I'm going to return a new MMKB module package instance, which is a class that implements the JSI module package interface. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, the class implements the JSI module package interface, and overrides the get JSI modules function. In this function, you can return a list of JSI modules spec instances, but we just return an empty list. Why do we do this? Well, there's something special about this function. This function is actually called on the JavaScript thread. So since this function is called on the JavaScript thread, before the JavaScript bundle executes, we can quickly install the MMKD module into the global namespace. If we wanted to do that on another thread, for example, in the native module thread, we would likely get an error at runtime and the app simply crashes. So let's take a look at how the install function works. We're going to open the MMKB module class, which is still a Java class. And as you can see, here's the install function, which takes a JavaScript context holder as a parameter, which is the JS context. This is a Java hybrid class, and it actually contains the JavaScript runtime as a C++ instance. But we cannot access this in Java right now, so let's take a look at how we can pass it to C++. We call the native install function, which is a JNI function. It's a native function that exists in C++, but you can directly call it from Java. This is the first time we cross languages. So in this case, we go from Java to C++. To implement the C++ function, we have to create a CMake and Gradle setup. I'm not going to go over this right now, but you can take a look at this at GitHub. So let's take a look at the native install function. This function exists in a C++ file. And as you can see here, it is prefixed with the full Java namespace. So the first parameter is the JNI environment. Then I'm going to get the class, which is the MMKD module. Then I'm going to get the first parameter, which is a long. In my case, this is the pointer to the JavaScript runtime. And then I'm getting a Java string to the path where MMKD stores all the documents. If we take a look at the Java function, this is exactly what we defined here. So now in the C++ file, I can now reinterpret the JavaScript runtime pointer to be an instance of the JSI runtime. So, and if the cast succeeded, we can now install the actual functions. If the cast didn't succeed, we're likely not in an environment that supports JSI. For example, if you use a different runtime than the three runtimes I listed earlier, or if you're using a Chrome debugger. So let's take a look at the install function. The install function receives a JSI runtime reference, and now you can use this reference to install variables into the global namespace. In this case, I'm installing the MMKD set function in the global namespace. So this is a JSI host function, as we saw earlier, which simply sets a value to the MMKB storage instance. As you can see, we can check the arguments for the types using is bool, is number, is string, and we can also throw JSI errors. At the end of the function, we always have to return a JSI value, and if we don't want to return any value at all, so no number, no string, no object, we can simply return undefined. And then here's the actual implementation for MMKB, where we simply set a value to the default MMKB instance. In this case, we're calling set and getting the value. If you want to convert the JSI value to a number, you can use as number and you get the returning double value. Same thing for booleans and for strings, there's a JSI string wrapper. So as string will return a JSI string. Of course, you can also convert the string to an actual C++ string, so an std string using the .utfa function. So let's take another look at frame processes. Earlier, we saw that we can directly access a frame's width and height properties, and we can even directly pass it to a native frame processor plugin, which, by the way, is a host function. So how does this work? What exactly is the frame object? How does it contain the full 10 megabyte image from the camera? Isn't it really slow to copy frames from native to JavaScript for every frame the camera sees, which can happen up to 240 times a second? Well, there's actually no copy of serialization happening here. The frame parameter is actually a JSI host object. This means the object has been created in C++, but JavaScript can also interact with it, similar to how host functions work. So if I access frame.height, this actually resolves to the C++ code and calls get property on it. So let's take a look at the shape of the frame object. I've created simple TypeScript types for this, which don't contain any code or anything, but we can understand the shape better. So for example, for the frame, we have an isValid, width, height, bytes per row, planes count, 
properties, and then we have two functions, to string and close. All of these properties actually do not exist in JavaScript. They all exist in C++. Let's take a look at how we defined the host object. So as you can see, this is the frame host object header. This is a C++ class, which inherits JSI host object. We can override those two methods to provide information for the JSI host object. So you cannot directly use the frame object in JavaScript because it's an objective C object and JavaScript doesn't know how to interact with it. Instead, we create a frame host object, which acts as an interaction layer between the JavaScript frame instance and the objective C frame object we stored here. So for example, if we call frame.height, the get function gets called with the name being height. And then we can simply access the frame with Objective C code to find out the actual height of the frame and return it as a JSI value, a number. Let's take a look at the implementation. So the get property names function simply returns a list of all valid properties. This is useful if you want to use object.keys on the frame, which then returns all of these keys. So for example, two string is valid with height, vice plane planes, count and close get returned. Then you can implement the get function, which acts as a getter. So if you call frame.height, which is not a function, it's simply a property getter, this function gets called with the name being height. In our case, we can then get the height using an Objective-C API from CM sample buffer. Then we can simply return the height as a double using the JSI value constructor. So for every time you try to access frame.height, this is not a value stored in JavaScript. Instead, this C++ code gets called. If you try to access some value that is not supported, you just return JSI value undefined. The same thing applies to the close and to string functions. For example, for the close function, we have to create an host function and then return the host function. So if you access frame.close, this function gets returned. So then if you try to actually call it, so two brackets, this function, which is a host function, gets called. As you can see, all of this exists in C++ and JavaScript only provides an interaction layer by using the host object instance. You can find all of this code online on GitHub at the Vision Camera repository. So let's start creating our own custom host object. I'm going to create a class in C++. I'm going to call it example host object, and we're going to inherit from JSI host object. Then we have to override the functions get and get property names. So in this case, we have to add get property names and override. The signature is always the same from JSI host object. And now we start by implementing get property names. You have to return a vector of all property names that you can access in the host object. This is useful if you want to access object.keys on the given object. So in our case, we're just going to add some value. In this case, you have to create a prop name ID and give it a string of some value. Now let's start implementing the get function. So now let's try to find out what the user actually wants to access. You can use name.utf8 to actually get an std string value for the past prop name ID. With the std string stored in the name variable, we can now work. Let's find out if the user actually tried to access some value. We simply compare name to some value, and if it's true, we can return some value. In this case, I'm going to return the lucky number 13, but you can also return an object, a string, a boolean, whatever. So let's look into some other value types. First, we can try returning a boolean. So if the property some bool is accessed, we simply return true. Next, let's try returning a string. If the value some string is accessed, we create a new string from a UTF-8 SCD string, in our case, hello. Let's try something more complex. We try to build an object with two values, some value and some bool. So we create a new object using the JSI object constructor. Then we can simply use set property to set some values. Some value is set to JSI value of 13. And some bool will have the property true. Then we can simply return the object. Let's try building an array. If the value sum array is accessed, we build an array with two elements inside. Since we already know the size of the array, we can simply pass it to the JSI array constructor. Now let's try inserting the values and simply returning them. Oh, in this case, this should be one instead of zero, but you get the idea. Now let's try creating another host object. Let's try creating a new instance of the example host object. So in this case, we're creating a new shared pointer of the example host object using the default constructor. And then we can use JSI object create from host object to create a new host object. Next, let's try creating a host function. Host functions look very complex at first, but in reality, they're really easy. So the first step is to create a C++ Lambda. You have a capture list of all values that get captured in the Lambda, and then you have four parameters, the runtime we're currently using, 
the this value of the function, if the function is bound to any specific this value, a C style array of all arguments and a property defining how many arguments are actually passed. So how big this C array is. Then you return a JSI value, which is undefined if you don't want to return anything, or any other JSI value if you want to return something. In our case, let's just add the first and the second argument together. So it's a simple add function. We're getting the first argument as a number and adding the second argument as a number too. Then the result is a double. We can create a new JSI value from the double and return it. Now we still only have a C++ Lambda and not a JSI function yet. So to create a JSI function, you have to use the create from host function function. You have to pass the runtime and then you have to pass a prop name ID, which is in this case, just fun. And then you can specify the number of parameters that will get used for this function. In this case, it's two. We're expecting two, two parameters, the first and the second number. And then you simply pass in the C++ Lambda. In most cases, you want to move this. So SCD move. And then we simply return the function. Then you can also access the global namespace. So anything that's defined in the global namespace can be accessed by using runtime.global. For example, you might want to create a host function that can be called from JavaScript and it performs some asynchronous task on a new thread, such as uploading something to a server. To make it awaitable in the JavaScript world, you can create a new promise by accessing runtime.global, get property as function, and then simply get the promise property, which is a function. Remember, all constructors in JavaScript are simple functions. So then we call the promise constructor as a constructor, and then you have to pass in a JSI function, which is a host function, which then can resolve or reject the promise. This promise object can then be returned to JavaScript, and your code can execute inside the lambda you passed in here. Then, as soon as your upload is complete on the other thread, you can simply call the resolver, and the code that is awaiting in JavaScript can then continue executing. There is also another JSI value type that's not directly included in the JSI implementation, and that's the array buffer. And ExpoGL implements this as a typed array, as you can see here. So if you have a large data buffer in a native code, converting it to a JSI array by looping over it and pushing element by element um, will probably make you hit an out of memory error or you're, or you're going to notice serious performance problems. Instead, you can use the typed array implementation to quickly make the buffer available to the JavaScript world. You create a new typed array by using one of the available typed array types, which are the sizes of the types. So 8-bit integer, 16-bit integer, 32-bit integer, and so on. And then return it to JS. This is faster because under the hood, only a simple man copy operation happens, as opposed to looping over the entire thing and pushing a new JSI value into the array each time. And this is also more memory efficient because, as we learned earlier, JSI values are always stored as numbers, with the only exception being a typed array, so an array buffer. So if you're dealing with anything smaller than a 64-bit double, for example, a 32-bit integer, a 16-bit integer, or an 8-bit integer, the typed array implementation actually only allocates that amount of memory. So for example, for one double, you could actually allocate eight 8-bit eight integers. So this means if you have a one megabyte array of 8-bit integers, this would actually be eight megabytes in size if you use a normal JSI array. With the typed array kind of type int8 array, it would stay at one megabyte. So now that we finally understand how JSI works, it's about time it's already dark outside, we can take a look at how Vision Camera uses JSI to provide the frame process a feature. First of all, why can we not use the bridge for this? There are multiple reasons for this. First, since the bridge sends messages in JSON format, we cannot pass the entire camera frame to JavaScript. That would be a 10 megabyte JSON for each frame, and it will simply not be fast enough to run this 30, 60, or even 240 times a second. Second, we would have to pass the JSON back to the native world for every time we want to call a frame processor plugin. This would be twice as long with the bridge, since we go from native to JavaScript and then JavaScript back to native. But with JSI, this has almost no overhead at all. Third, all of this JSON conversion would be blocking the JavaScript thread, so any state updates, navigations, or re-renders would be blocked. With JSI, we can use reanimate this work at API to spawn a secondary JavaScript runtime and run all of this code in parallel and uninterrupted to the React.js runtime. So this is how the frame processor gets created. Inside the frame processor, we create a new instance of the JImage proxy host object, which is the frame, from the JImage proxy. Then we simply call the function, which is frame processor, by passing in the host object. I'm not going to go into much detail as to how the work that API from reanimated works. This is a topic for a whole other talk, but if you really want to know how it works, I highly recommend you to read the source code of reanimated.
Basically, that uses JSI to copy all values captured in a function in a worklet and then call that worklet function with the captured variables. This means all of the captured variables used inside the worklet are actually only copies of the original objects. So if you want to make changes to an object, you can't. It's frozen. Also, for the frame processor plugin API, the user can use Objective-C or Swift to write the frame processor plugin. To make this possible, I convert all of the JSI values to Objective-C or Swift values. For example, a JSI value of type number can be converted to an NS number. Same thing for JSI objects, which get converted to an NS dictionary, or a JSI array, which gets converted to an NS array. This of course also applies to the Android side, so any JSI value can be converted to a JNI value, so a Java native interface value. In this case, booleans, numbers, strings, and objects can be used. And for the arrays, you use the native array implementations from Java. So that's about it for my talk today. If you want to learn more about JSI or worklets, I highly recommend you to check out the reanimated or vision camera codebase. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you have any questions, just DM me on there. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Really exciting talk. And like I said, this is something that I think will be very popular next year when JSI becomes something that everybody is using. So I kind of take this talk as a look into the future, uh, into how we all are going to be building apps and how we can benefit from the new architecture. So thank you. Now, our next speaker is Joshua from Facebook. And this is a very, very special talk uh, because this talk is about fabric, but it's unlike all the other talks. We are not going to be talking about how Fabric works and what Fabric is. This talk is actually showing how Fabric can be utilized in production. So you all have been listening that Fabric, JSI and new components were still in, pro in development and one day they were about to become public and production ready. But you know, we've been waiting quite a while for it and I'm so happy to finally see a talk that is actually talking about this particular thing, how Facebook is using Fabric in production. What is their experience with it? Results, performance benefits. So this is another look into the future on how React Native apps will be looking and working like uh, next year. So I'm really excited to learn more about Fabric, how Facebook is using it and how they migrate it because their code base is huge and Fabric is probably not the easiest thing to migrate to. So let's learn about their experience and how they are using Fabric in their Facebook app. My name is Josh Gross, and I'm an engineer on the React Native core team at Facebook. For the past three years, the React Native team at Facebook has been re-architecting core pieces of React Native, and we've been testing rollout of them uh, within our own apps, including the flagship Facebook app. Today, I'll talk about just one part of that, the fabric renderer rewrite and rollout. React Native was originally built for iOS and then for Android. Today, React Native has renderers for VR, Windows, Mac OS, tvOS, and many other platforms as well. React Native is written and essentially rewritten in Java for Android, Objective-C for iOS, C++ for Windows, uh, and so on. Basically, every one of these platforms is a full, unique uh, re-implementation of React Native. And they attempt to behave the same way, but they, they don't all behave exactly the same way. In 2018, the React Native team embarked on a project to build a new architecture that would be future compatible. We wanted concurrent rendering, we wanted better performance and reliability, but we didn't want to build this n times for every platform. Ideally, we could build these features once using a cross-platform implementation and then deploy it to every platform. In order to accomplish this goal, we had to rewrite React Native. But we needed to make sure that we could bring along all of the apps in the world. Our first step was making sure that the rewrite would work in the biggest app in the world, the Facebook app. I'm going to focus today on our journey of rolling this out in the Facebook app. If you want more technical details, I highly recommend watching uh, these talks or some of these talks given by current and former members of the core team. The first one here is a high-level overview of all these projects by Ram N at React Conf 2018. There is a deep dive of Fabric given by David Vaca at React Native EU 2018. And there is a talk about the new architecture by Emily Janzer at React Native EU 2019. We will also be publishing more blog posts soon, so you can watch out for those as well. 
This will not be a technical talk. Um, I'm not going to be doing a technical deep dive into any uh, details of Fabric or its features, but instead I'll describe our experience of using it at scale and migrating a very large code base to use only Fabric. This is going to be a story time. So sit back, relax, grab a warm beverage, or a, a, you can also grab a companion if you'd like. And I'll share with you our journey of deploying Fabric at scale at Facebook. So this is Marketplace in the Facebook app. Specifically, this is the Marketplace home surface. Marketplace consists of many, many surfaces. Other surfaces include product detail and commerce profile. All of these are built with React Native. In the Facebook app, React Native is used to build many other products as well. So dating and jobs um, and, and many other products. Altogether, there are over 1,000 surfaces in the Facebook app built with React Native. That's a lot. So I tweeted about this recently, and a lot of people were confused or didn't believe me or thought I misspoke. Some people thought I meant that React Native within Facebook has 1,000 components. I can assure you it's a whole lot more than 1,000 components. So when we talk about a surface within React Native at Facebook, what do we, what do we mean? Technically speaking, um, if you have an iOS or Android background, a surface would be like a full screen UI view controller on iOS or a fragment on Android, um, sort of roughly. Regardless, the assumption here is that if you navigate to a new surface in React Native at Facebook, we expect that surface to sort of take over and redraw the entire screen. So some of these can be relatively small. Say you go to a privacy policy surface, maybe it's just some text, but most of them, the vast majority are much more complex and some of them are huge with hundreds of features packed into a single surface. So I wanna emphasize that number, a thousand plus surfaces, however you wanna think of it is a huge number. Another unique part of our setup is that uh, at Facebook, um, all of our apps using React Native use React Native from the main branch of GitHub. So whenever we make a change to React Native or whenever we merge a pull request from GitHub, that change goes into our main developer build immediately, and then it goes live to all Facebook users in the next weekly release. This only gives us about a week to ensure that every change we make is stable on every one of those 1,000 plus surfaces for all of our users. So what does it mean to be stable? More than 1 billion people globally visit Marketplace each month. We have to make sure that Marketplace continues working well for people from different countries with different network conditions, different device types. Since the launch of dating, over 1.5 billion matches have been created. So even the smallest regression in React Native easily affects product usage metrics and that gets amplified by the scale of Facebook. A tiny performance regression of a few milliseconds will get caught and matters a lot. Incredibly rare race conditions or crashes that are one in a billion events will happen many times. It'll happen thousands of times a day. We've had to ensure that every screen, every metric, every interaction was working properly. In the meantime, the Facebook app is a moving target. Products and libraries built on top of React Native are constantly changing. They're being reworked and refactored. So in order to accomplish our goals of unifying React Native and enabling new features and better performance, we focused on stabilizing existing features and maintaining neutral metrics. So as part of this rollout, we specifically decided not to focus on improving metrics or expanding capabilities yet. We also made sure that any breaking changes were absolutely necessary and very easy to, to migrate and to roll out. I'm very proud to share that as of last month, React Native in the Facebook app is now completely powered by the new architecture. This doesn't mean, however, that it's quite ready for everyone to use right now, mostly because documentation is lacking, honestly, and some things like popular open source native modules may need to be updated. I'll say more about this towards the end of my presentation. So let's talk about the development and rollout process of Fabric. We modified our navigation system to support selectively turning on and off the architecture for individual surfaces um, and, and allowing us to control what percentage of users would get Fabric or the old renderer for a particular screen. Our work kind of followed the cyclical pattern. We would identify a surface, we would play around with it, we would, we would investigate if we found any issues and, and try to fix them or implement a new Fabric feature 
um, that they were using that wasn't supported yet. We'd fix any of these issues, and then we'd run a production test. We'd analyze data, fix any issues that we found again, and then repeat the cycle. Pretty straightforward. After we kind of nailed the cycle and, and this workflow, all we had to do was repeat it a thousand times. It was easy. We just had this playbook, and we had to just keep doing it over and over and over again. We thought that this was going to be a six-month project. That's not a joke. Um, it took us about a full year before we realized the full scope of the migration. From the start, it took about two years to enable the architecture on the first surface, and nine months after that to enable Fabric on all the rest of the surfaces. So to be fair to us, our estimations were fairly close. Only five times off seems pretty good in the world of software estimations. So what challenges did we face? Well, first, um, we had challenges of scope. So the full scope of the project, like I said, wasn't realized until about a year into the migration. Our scope expanded a lot after the investigation kind of uh, went underway. Along the way, we discovered a lot of hidden features of React Native, as well as hidden and undocumented optimizations. I, I hinted towards this at the beginning, but we also found a lot of subtle differences between the Android and iOS code bases, the vast majority of which were not documented and the vast majority of which were not even intentional. They just sort of accidentally drifted over time. We discovered and documented and patched a lot of these and actually improved the non-fabric code base as well, but a lot of them couldn't be fixed without the fabric rewrite. Some of these platform differences over time had resulted in JavaScript product engineers writing platform checks and slightly different code for Android and iOS. So platform switches were sprinkled all across the Facebook code base. Thankfully, with the, the migration effort, we were able to delete many of these entirely because of the unified code base. So in this way, our production code has become much easier to read, much easier to reason about after the migration, and the experience between Android and iOS users has, has, has been unified. One concrete example is that scroll view for Android has been almost entirely re rewritten internally compared to two years ago, and it's much more stable, performant, full-featured, and in general, just higher quality and aligned with existing features that iOS had already, already had. Um, and a lot of these changes we were able to backport to the non-fabric renderer as well. Another example is layout animations, which was never fully supported in React Native on, on Android previously. It was always uh, flagged as sort of a, an experimental feature. Now it works well on both platforms with Fabric equally well. Another challenge for us in the migration was coming up with backwards compatible alternatives to APIs that we were deprecating. So this is a pain that nobody else will go through because we spent a lot of time making it easier for ourselves and for our own engineers internally to migrate code. In most cases, because of the time that we spent upfront, the migration work involved uh, just required deleting code because the new APIs are simpler in most cases and some of the changes involved just like using a best practice. Um, and uh, some of the APIs are simpler so we could just delete code. This applies to APIs used for rendering, for native modules, and for custom native components. Because we always ran screens uh, during this experiment in both Fabric and the non-Fabric render at the same time until the experimentation was complete, all code needed to be compatible with both. In the vast majority of cases, a surface's code didn't need to be modified at all to work in both Fabric and non-Fabric. We also encountered challenges with scale. First, there's a spectrum of instrumentation across the Facebook code base. Some surfaces have no instrumentation at all, besides sort of the basics that are provided for all surfaces. So our only signal might be crashes or bug reports. We would test these screens ourselves. We would rely on QA teams to do some manual testing. Um, but you know, this sort of lack of instrumentation could pose some challenges. Other surfaces have everything instrumented and would catch regressions of just a few milliseconds in performance with some specific interaction. These hyper-instrumented screens are, of course, also challenging, uh, but did offer us an opportunity to you know, kind of really make sure that Fabric is very performant in, in all corners of it. 
Um, another challenge we faced is that screens were hyper-optimized uh, specifically for the non-fabric renderer. Um, and Facebook had, had really found like a local, op, uh, a local maximum and a local optimum for, for the, the performance of these screens within the React Native renderer. Screens would rely on undocumented, undefined, and sometimes just unsupported behavior in order to squeeze out any performance win. Non-fabric code does some things incorrectly, but was sometimes faster because of it. A good example is measure APIs. The timing is not guaranteed. Previously to Fabric, it's not guaranteed. So there are many possible race conditions that can and do occur. And sometimes the measure API returns incorrect results because of it. But the API is very fast since it was optimized for speed and not correctness. We were eventually able to optimize the new Fabric APIs enough to, to get to, to parity with uh, many of these APIs or all these APIs. And Fabric is very performant now. But we did have this initial disadvantage um, because the non-fabric renderer had sort of an initial unfair advantage here, right, due to its trade-offs. Another challenge we faced is that Facebook is a moving target. Surfaces are being iterated on very quickly. So there are, again, I'll reiterate the number, a thousand plus surfaces. But this number is growing daily as well. And in addition, many of these screens are being worked on very, very actively. So new features are being released, old features are being deprecated, new metrics are being introduced, old metrics are being removed, metrics are being updated. And the baseline is sort of constantly shifting. Especially in the early days, in 2018 and 2019, we would try to experiment with screens that uh, didn't use as many features so that we could experiment with Fabric without having implemented all features necessary for the, for the full implementation. So we'd implement, say, 50% of Fabric and then find a screen that only used sort of those 50% of features. The problem with this approach is that those screens could be updated at any time to introduce some usage of, of an unsupported feature. So um, this, was, th this was a bit of a challenge, especially in the early days, because of how fast Facebook moves. Given all of that for context, Let's move back to the timeline. So hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense now. Through mid 2020, most of our time was spent discovering the scope of Fabric and re-implementing existing APIs for Fabric. We provided migration paths for a very small number of APIs that we're deprecating, like set native props and find node handle. And we provided replacements, backwards compatible replacements for them. We also migrated screens from using these deprecated APIs to using the new APIs. By the end of um, uh, like December 2020, we were 99% feature complete. Most of the 1,000 plus surfaces had Fabric enabled, but only for a very small number of users, so around 1%. By the end of 2020, 99% of surfaces were only using Fabric for all users. So that left only 1% of screens. But as you can imagine, that is because these 1% of screens were very important. Um, those were the very high volume, hyper optimized, hyper instrumented screens like Marketplace Home, for, for instance. These screens were extremely optimized specifically for the non-Fabric renderer. So we had to spend a lot of time understanding the the, the, the screens and these products and improving their performance specifically for Fabric. Luckily, so when I say that, that we improved performance for Fabric, basically this just meant adhering to best practices, no longer using all of these undocumented, uh, you know, sort of unsupported corners of React Native that, that people had been using, just using best practices, using some of the new APIs, using just the documented features. Six months later, those 1% of screens were migrated fully to Fabric as well. Now I'd like to tell um, a couple of interesting stories from my personal experiences with this rollout. So this is a real photo um, from very early on in the Fabric architecture discussions. And we spent a lot of time like this in the early days, huddled around a, a whiteboard with someone trying to explain to us or figure out how Fabric worked. Uh, sort of one person at the whiteboard explaining it and the rest of us just kind of staring confused until you know, it clicked. Um, and a lot of time in the, in the early days, it was us 
trying to pull ideas out of Sebastian's head, as you can, can see in, in this photo, until the idea sort of clicked for the rest of us. I want to share these stories because I think they can reveal the scale of Facebook and, and how things can work internally. And I also want to emphasize, um, I expect the vast majority of people migrating to Fabric to never have any issues like this, in part because we already went through all of this pain at Facebook. So this is part of the reason that we haven't encouraged Facebook adoption as much before. We wanted to iron out as many of the edges as possible. Another point here uh, to make is that some of these problems are specific to Facebook. So believe it or not, sometimes code within the Facebook app isn't perfect. I know that's hard to believe, but sometimes you know there's bugs that get introduced. Sometimes there's suboptimal patterns um, that really shouldn't be used. And this did make um, getting feature parity and, and, and debugging harder. Um, so the, the, the first one of these stories I, I like to tell um, is that every November, like clockwork, um, there ends up being some big crash or bug that blocks my work in production. And every time it takes over a month to solve, usually well, well over a month, actually. Um, and this has been true every November that I've been at Facebook. So I'm really hoping it doesn't happen this November, but you know, we'll see. We'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see. So to give an insight into what my day-to-day -day looked like during the migration, um, I generally would wait until a new version of the Facebook app was released. So every week, a new version is, is released to production. I would wait 24 to 48 hours for you know, some significant chunk of users to, um, to update um, and then you know, have some time to use the app as well. And then I would analyze early crash data. So basically, I wanted to know, did Fabric crash more or less? And if it crashed more, I would do a deep dive into finding out what the issue was, and I would you know, try to fix it as soon as possible. Um, and if the crash is big enough, I would I would just like disable Fabric temporarily as well, obviously. As we were rapidly uh, implementing new features, especially in the early days in 2019 and 2020, we would get maybe usually like a maximum of one to two new crashes a week. Many weeks we got nothing, but if we got new crashes, it was like one or two. Most of these were very small volume, uh, very marginal, like one in a billion or one in a trillion type events. And most of them were very trivial, like a null pointer exception where the, the root cause is very obvious and the mitigation was like a null check, you know, like one line of code and, and the fix is easy. Um, but the reason I'm telling the story is that sometimes the crashes were not as easy to, to fix or root cause. So in one particular case, I got uh, an Android crash that was pretty high volume, so higher than I was comfortable with. Um, and uh, uh, you know, much, much higher higher than the most crashes I had gotten. I looked into the stack trace, and there was no Facebook code involved, and there was no React Native code involved. Something in the internals of the Android UI layer was crashing. That's basically all I knew, and so initially I was going to just ignore it or punt it to another team. Um, but there was a clue that I had, was which is that it was only crashing on React Native surfaces. And in addition to that, it was only crashing within uh, the sort of the Fabric experiment. So it was only crashing for React Native Fabric users on React Native screens, um, and only on a few screens as well. So there's you know, sort of very little for me to go on in terms of debugging, but it was very clear that it was actually a Fabric and React Native problem. Um, but yeah. React Native is huge, our products are complicated, so uh, I didn't have that much information. So at this point, I did what I would normally do. I tried to reproduce the issue. Um, and of course, I couldn't after you know, many, many hours of trying to reproduce it on different devices and different emulators. I just I couldn't reproduce it. My coworkers couldn't reproduce it. So the next step is to add logs. So hopefully, I could get some logging information with a production crash telling me roughly what React Native was doing right before the crash, at least what section of code was executing um, before the crash. So I added logs over the course of a few weeks and predictably got no new information. Um, 
And because of the cadence of the releases of our apps, it takes a while to, you know, write the code to do logging to, to land it and then for that code to go into production. And so this is a pretty expensive process. Um, so it essentially took me a month and a half to get no new information. At this point, um, I wasn't just waiting. I wasn't just sitting around. I had already uh, looked into the data deeper and noticed uh, an unusual pattern, which is that it only reproduced on a few specific devices. That itself isn't that unusual, but it didn't reproduce on any Samsung devices or Google Pixel devices, which is very unusual. And in fact, it only reproduced on a few devices that are generally not used at all within uh, North America or within Europe at all. And uh, some of these devices, it's not even possible to buy within the US. Uh, so this is also a problem. Um, but at this point, you might be thinking, well, why did I just waste all this time? Why didn't I just buy one of these devices that like, I could get my hands on? Uh, and the answer is pretty simple. I had never had to do that before. In all the times I'd, I'd done development before that and in all the time after it, I had never run into an issue this thorny that required that I have like one specific device. Um, and, and often, um, you know, I, I have run into a lot of device specific issues, but usually there would just be a stack trace that indicated that like, oh, there's a null pointer exception that only happens on this one device, it happens in this code, dig in and, and it becomes clear after some investigation. Not, not so easy in this case. So I finally uh, got one of these devices and uh, in order to protect the innocence, I will not name the OEM. Um, and, but thankfully I was able to immediately reproduce the crash within 30 minutes of unboxing this phone. Hopefully you're curious at this point. Um, so the problem was that if you have an empty parent view on Android and you attempt to remove a child from it, so a view with no children and you want to remove a child with no parents from it, uh, Google, like Pixel, Samsung, stock Android will just fail silently and move on and don't do anything because the end result has already been achieved. You're trying to remove a view from a parent with no children, so you can kind of kind of squint at it and say like, well, you've already achieved your goal, so we can just move on. But some OEMs have modified Android, I guess, to crash at this point. Um, and not only that, but uh, a, a few custom internal Facebook view managers on Android uh, did this in some, like used this behavior in some marginal cases. This is notable and kind of funny to me because it's the first time i would run into a case where the OEM had changed really core behavior in this way um, and changed basically an undocumented feature of Android without also any documentation. Um, so sort of just undocumented on, on both sides. It's really unclear you know, what to expect from this API without uh, digging into the code. It's also worth noting that this is kind of a classic design problem for APIs. If the user does something nonsensical, should you fail silently? Should you crash? Should you give them a warning? So there are pros and cons with any of these approaches. I don't think it's incorrect or correct for you know, stuck Android to just move on uh, silently. I don't think it's correct or incorrect to, to crash at this point. They're just different decisions with different trade-offs. Um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I ran into, into a case where sort of both decisions are made in different cases. Um, for closure here, fa Fabric became resilient to the sequence of operations. And Fabric now does just fail sort of silently in this case, um, although it logs something to the console if it happens. So technically, there is some clue here in case you have an, an issue and it's, and it's related to this. Um, another November bug I had was related to performance and event ordering. I, I believe that this was the, the previous, previous November, so about a year earlier. So earlier days in Fabric, I was testing a marketplace screen and I noticed that in Fabric, it would take like five seconds to load the screen. And most of the time, the screen was just blank and I could tell uh, from like Metro logs that it wasn't like loading JavaScript. It wasn't really doing anything. It wasn't logging anything. It was just sitting there as far as I can tell. So I did what we normally do for performance investigations. I collected log markers, which we have instrumented in React Native and in our product code. Um, and so I got sort of a linear sequence of events 
for the startup during Fabric and then during non-Fabric, and I would compare these timelines. And over time, I would drill down to find you know, which specific regions were slower in Fabric. Um, and you start, you, know, you add additional markers, so you can do like a binary search of where in this startup and which segments of code are slower. Um, and, and I basically just use this, use this method and, and sort of rinsed and, and repeated to dig down. Um, but I kind of exhausted that eventually. Um, and I ended up uh, using another tool, which is one of my, my favorite and most sophisticated uh, logging tools, which is logging text to the console using console.log. So I had a hunch here. I would add uh, logging statements all over the code base. I would collect text logs in Fabric and then in non-Fabric. I would literally copy and paste them into text edit, put them side by side on my monitor, and just comb through line by line. Um, you're probably horrified by this. After a couple times of doing this, I did end up using like more sophisticated diff tools to highlight the differences between them. But I was still ultimately just using console.log. Um, and what I ended up finding was pretty interesting, and it was that the ordering of some events was different in Fabric. So these are like Android lifecycle events mixed with React Native lifecycle events and methods. The specifics don't matter here too much. And I, I want to emphasize that for the vast majority of even our surfaces in Facebook, like over 99%, did not have any issues related to this. And most of those surfaces don't do anything with those lifecycle methods. So they're usually just not needed. But for a few surfaces that were highly customized, highly optimized for the, for the previous renderer, they were doing certain things to optimize startup. So they were using, they, they were doing sort of some, some special stuff in like Android fragment, on fragment create, on start, on stop, on activity results. Sort of th that's what I mean by lifecycle methods. Um, mixed with React Native Java lifecycle methods like layout and, and measurement and you know, again, startup, things like that. So again, the specifics don't matter. Just want to give you kind of a general idea of what kind of APIs were, were, were involved. Um, and so yeah, so some of these events were happening in a different order in Fabric than they were happening in non-Fabric. So I thought, well, it's, it's a long shot, but, but I kind of followed my gut and dug further. And it turned out that the startup of the screen was constructed as a state machine, sort of an asynchronous state machine, where it expected event A to happen, and then event B asynchronously, and then event C. And if the sequence was, was changed at all, the state machine just broke. So if the sequence, instead of being ABC, was ACB, startup just didn't work. And the screen would just sit there in, a, in sort of a perpetual loading state. Eventually, there was there, there is like a long running timeout that would force the screen to re-render um, so that users were never like truly stuck. Um, but the screen could appear more slowly in those cases. So I want to be clear here. I'm being intentionally vague because the specifics of like the APIs don't matter. This is one of those local maxima of performance that I mentioned earlier. We were doing something uh, sort of not great to squeeze milliseconds of performance out of React Native in the best case. Um, and I actually expect this optimization will go away entirely. This, this is like, again, an internal Facebook optimization. I think this, this will go away internally, uh, entirely in the future. It's not really as relevant with Fabric. Um, and I've never heard of anyone else doing this outside of Facebook. So before I continue, I just want to be clear. I don't expect anyone to run into this uh, scenario, period. Um, but why is the ordering, why, why is like this a problem if the ordering of events has changed slightly? And since it was causing us an issue, why didn't we just change fabric so that we could guarantee the previous ordering uh, of operations, even though it was never like documented or, or guaranteed? Why didn't we just do that? Well, since it was never documented or, or guaranteed, um, the ironic thing is that the sequence of events changed because we were able to optimize certain things in the internals of Fabric. So maybe that's still not convincing. You're saying it's, it wasn't documented, it wasn't guaranteed, but we still changed something that was working, right? So sort of. So this is where things like Facebook scale become important. It turned out that even uh, with the old system, 
the ordering of events was never consistent. So not only was it not guaranteed, not documented, but it also wasn't ever really consistent. So it would have this particular sequencing of events like 97, 98% of the time. And in Fabric, we had that expected sequencing of events only 90% of the time. So we always had this problem for some number of users, but we never realized it because it happens sort of too infrequently for our metrics to really like alarm on it. And internally, uh, nobody reproduced it. And so, you know, didn't catch it really in, in production. It wasn't a big enough problem in, in production to raise any alarm bells. And then internally, nobody was impacted by it. So we just uh, ignored it, just never caught it. Um, the, the real problem is that, you know, basically if you're building a state machine based on asynchronous events, you need to either know that the ordering of events is always going to be the same 100% 100 of the time, and then you have to add warnings or crash if you ever encounter a different ordering, or you can be resilient to different orderings of events. Um, this is a hard problem. Um, you know, async programming is difficult. Uh, state machines are difficult to get right, but especially at scale, it's crucial to get this correctly. If you assume a particular ordering and it's wrong for 1% or 5% of users, that's, that's a huge number of people at scale. So long story short, we were able to fix this issue by making our product code more resilient to different orderings of events. And in so doing, we actually also improved the user experience for both Fabric and non-Fabric and Im improved performance for both as well. So again, want to reiterate, for the vast majority of difficult issues we face with, say, poor interactions between product code and Fabric, fixing the issue for Fabric also improved the user experience for non-Fabric because generally the issue was caused by usage of like undocumented APIs, undocumented behavior, or just like not using best practices. Um, and um, yeah, so, so we, we, end, we ended up, uh, as part of this process, also um, spending a lot of time thinking about and analyzing the ordering of events in React Native and Fabric, um, and, and sort of ways of solving this class of problems in general. Um, and what I, what I will say is that it really illustrated how important it is both for APIs to document any assumptions and constraints they have, but also that it's very important as a, as a developer, as a user of APIs, for me to keep an eye on what is not documented. So if documentation was perfect, it would just call out explicitly that something is subject to change. Um, but obviously, that doesn't always happen. And, and now when I notice a gap in documentation, when I'm looking for something and I kind of can't find it, sometimes now I wonder if that's almost intentional. Sometimes maintainers don't want to provide guarantees. Because if you do, then people rely on them, and then that causes parts of the systems to become less flexible. Again, uh, I don't expect, frankly, anyone outside of Facebook to be impacted by this. Most people will never use or think about these events that were involved. Um, as a side note, one thing that we thought about uh, doing internally to force product code to be more resilient is to have like a chaos monkey event mode, where for you know, developers only, in some cases, we would just randomly delay events or reorder some events. Um, so we haven't done this yet. If you hear Facebook engineers complaining about it in the future, maybe it's maybe that's my fault. Um, but I, I actually suspect that doing this sort of thing would catch a lot of bugs and like future bugs in waiting. Finally, um, it's taken us a you know a very long time to fully migrate the Facebook app onto the new React Native architecture. We're very proud of this moment and you know, uh, very proud of all the work that went into it. But we know that we are, we, are, we are not done yet. And our next step is to bring it to all of you. We're starting to plan this work now. We're clearly you know, very bad at estimating. So I'm not going to make any claims for dates. Um, so while we don't know how long this full process will take, we, we do know the next steps. We're currently working on tutorials and guides to help people take advantage of the new architecture. We're partnering uh, closely with companies like Expo, Callstack, and Software Mansion, um, as well as maintainers of the most popular packages in open source to make sure that they're compatible with the new architecture. 
It's very, very important for us that this upgrade goes as smoothly as possible for everyone, and we really can't wait to get, to get it into all of your hands. I am but one part of a, of a pretty large team, uh, and this effort involved a lot of people, including a lot of engineers within Facebook that are, that are not on the React Native team. Too many people to count. Um, but within the team, I'd like to give a big thanks and recognition to the people that I've been working with daily for the past few years. So especially David Vaca, Samuel Susla, and Valentin Shurgin. Big thanks. This is a huge effort. Thank you for uh, making my life easier and, and, and helping me out along the way. Um, I'd also like to thank our leadership who supported such a huge ambitious rewrite, especially when it took years longer than expected. Um, so big shout outs here to Tom Aquino, Tim Young, Yuzi Zhang, Kevin Gozali, and Eli White. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on GitHub. Thank you, Joshua, for this talk. It's been really great to learn about your experience. And uh, I guess I'm really happy to see that you at Facebook are actually sharing that knowledge. I feel like this is not something that everybody would do because to a certain extent, this is sort of a, um, uh, you know, your business domain. So maybe not something that you want everybody to know about, but I'm so happy that you are sharing this knowledge with the community so we can all learn from you. So uh, I just wanted to thank you for being around with Coldstack and React Native EU. Uh, Ever since I guess we started, your support has been great here and I'm so happy that we can have this uh, React Native EU as a field for you to kind of share those breakthrough uh, updates. So uh, thank you and I'm looking forward to the next year edition already. Now let's move to the next speaker, uh, which is Kalev from Microsoft. And Kalev is going to talk about React Native for Windows and Mac OS. Now you probably heard about React Native for Windows quite a while ago, but Maybe you haven't heard about it, but it's been rewritten to a new version and then folks at Microsoft added the macOS part. Now, Windows and macOS didn't have an easy start because React Native has been always about Android and iOS. So making sure that React Native architecture is ready for another platform has been always a challenge and we have seen that in React Native CLI, for example, that I'm contributing to, but also in other parts. Uh, so they've been doing a very, very hard job into not only supporting Windows and Mac OS, but also into backporting the features that they are doing uh, into React Native itself. So today, Caleb is going to share uh, their experience creating that framework and how they actually enable their teams to build great applications. So I'm kind of excited to see what they are about to share with us, but I'm kind of expecting that there's going to be some interesting use cases of how React Native is working uh, in desktop applications in both Mac OS and Windows environments. So let's learn about that. And Kalev, good luck. Hi, everyone. I'm Kalev, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about React Native for desktop platforms. So a little bit about myself. I am an engineering manager at Microsoft, and I work in the office division. Uh, before becoming an engineering manager, I was an engineer, and I worked primarily on accessibility. And when it comes to React Native, I have been in this space for the last couple of years now. I really like how with React Native you can learn the technology once and then uh, be able to, to run your apps anywhere you need to. And you can imagine that for applications like Office, such technology is really important because our code base has millions of lines of code. And so we really benefit from being able to share our code across multiple platforms, as well as reapply the same, the same technology across. We've seen a lot of engagement around React Native at Microsoft as well. Like the, there are multiple apps and features that have been built, either you know brownfield or greenfield applications, um, using React Native, and we have a nice little ecosystem that keeps growing every day. So this is a very very exciting place to be, and uh, I'm glad to be here to talk to you a little bit about how um, we are evolving the desktop platforms. And so what we'll talk about today, first, we'll go through the investments in React Native for Windows and Mac OS that have happened recently. And then we'll talk a little bit about some applications that have been built using those platforms. So let's go ahead and jump in and talk about React Native for Windows and for Mac OS. Um, and as you probably know, uh, this has been a journey for Microsoft for a few years now uh, with a lot of investments for, so that we can bring the power of React Native uh, to, the, to the desktop platforms. 
And it's been a really nice partnership. Like we've worked very closely with Facebook uh, to, to evolve those platforms. Lots of design meetings and discussions, uh, uh, alignment and directions and where we're going. And uh, uh, we've made a lot of improvements over the last few years. Uh, and, and the fact that we're seeing multiple applications shipping on top of that platform is really encouraging for the future. So uh, let's talk about a little bit about the investments that we've actually made. And uh, uh, when we think about those, we typically bucket them into three different areas. The first one is the core runtime itself. So think of this as the core of React Native that runs on user devices and allows you to build your experience on top. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about some UI frameworks that we've built on top that allows you to augment the default uh, experience that's provided with React Native. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about some tooling uh, that is making our lives easier and hopefully will make yours as well. So let's jump in and talk about the runtime first, starting with React Native for macOS. And so the major highlight that we have for macOS is that uh, we recently released uh, version 0.63 uh, of the platform. Uh, there are several improvements uh, in it, including support for SVG for tooltip and keyloop. Uh, we are currently working on version 64 and expect this to be ready in the next few months. And uh, uh, there's also been a lot of really nice additions to community modules uh, for macOS. So if you're interested, uh, head over to directory and then filter on macOS, and you will see all of the modules that are now currently supported. Uh, and then when it comes to React Native for Windows, uh, we've released version 64, 0.64, and we're currently working on version 0.65. So uh, one of the things that uh, I would like to highlight here is that uh, for this version 0.64, we were able to release uh, React Native for, for Windows at the same time as the iOS and Android platforms uh, version 0.64 as well were released. And this was something that was uh, very important to us because what we want is we want to make the upgrade process as seamless as possible uh, and allow people to upgrade both the desktop and the mobile platforms at the same time. So we spent a lot of time getting Windows up to, up to date and current with uh, React Native, and then we're able to release that 0.64 simultaneously. Now, we are working on getting Mac there as well, such that uh, once we're done, like you will be able to see all four platforms being released at the same time. Uh, and then the next thing is uh, we now have support for React Native Windows in Upgrade Helper. If you're not familiar with this, uh, what Upgrade Helper is, is it's a place where you can go plug in your current version of React Native and plug in the version that you would like to upgrade to. And Upgrade Helper will show you what changed and how you can go ahead and update. It's a really cool tool, uh, makes upgrading a lot easier. Uh, we've also improved the developer experience. So uh, you are probably familiar using uh, you're probably familiar with Code Push already. So uh, that technology was available on iOS and Android, uh, and what it does is it allows you to update your bundles over the air without having to redeploy your application. Uh, it's very powerful, and it's now available natively in React Native for Windows as well. Um, Code Push itself is part of uh, our Visual Studio App Center offering. Uh, and if you head over to microsoft.github.io slash codepush, you'll get more information on how to get started and leverage it. Uh, and the next thing I want to talk about is the documentation. So uh, this is one place where uh, we've spent a bit of time uh, to, to make to improve what we have already, and we definitely want to spend a bit more time there, uh, like getting the whole spectrum of our uh, documentation uh, out there for you to use. Um, but right now, the biggest improvement is on the native API side. And so if you head over to our documentation site, you will see uh, a lot more uh, native APIs being documented, including you know like how to use it if you need to. Um, also, we want to make it easier to, to use React Native across, uh, again, across multiple platforms. And in order to do that, we've increased the parity that we have in Windows with iOS and Android. So there are new props supported like accessibility info and platform version, and we have more coming up as well. Um, 
So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, is your build time. And uh, we have in experimental support right now a binary distribution. So what this is, is uh, instead of consuming React Native for Windows uh, as source code, you can consume uh, binaries that have already been built and just start building your application on top. Uh, this is something that we've been experimenting with. And we've seen really, really good improvements to both build time and disk usage by doing that. So uh, in our tests, uh, the build time was about 80% faster, and the disk usage was about was about half of what it used to be. So this is still experimental, We're working to make it full production quality, uh, but you can give it a shot and see if it works for you. Uh, and then let's talk about Hermes. So I'm sure everyone must have heard about Hermes right now and uh, uh, how, how it improved both the startup time and the memory usage on the mobile platform. So uh, we've had Hermes for some time in React Native Windows as well. And uh, recently, we've done a lot of work to make it easier to use. Uh, so first, there, um, in order to use Hermes, all you need to do is turn on one build flag. And we will take care of the rest. So we will package the runtime. Uh, we will. Uh, do the bytecode generation and package this with the, with the application, and then and then configure React Native for Windows to use Hermes instead of the default engine on Windows. Um, and what we've seen is that the performance gains are similar to the ones that uh, that uh, have been seen on mobile platforms as well. Uh, it's easier now to debug your application using uh, when you're using Hermes. We support direct debugging. And uh, uh, we've also recently added support for profiling, so you can uh, see how your performance characteristics are measuring up. So uh, Hermes right now is supported for our C++ applications, and uh, uh, we will have support for the c -sharp ones as well in the future. And then let's talk about community modules. So these are, of course, super important in the ecosystem. And uh, uh, we've increased the number that uh, is supported by Windows as well. Uh, uh, there, there are a few here that I listed to give you an idea. Uh, for example, the React Native Sketch Canvas is one that I will talk about a little bit later in one of the demos. Um, but I think at this point, we support around 40 community modules. And if you want to see that full list that's supported, just head over to React Native directory and filter on Windows, and you'll see them. So in summary, when we talk about React Native for Windows, uh, it is much easier for you to upgrade to the more recent versions. Uh, we are, so as, as I mentioned, we have version 0.64 uh, up and running. We are currently working on version 0.65. It should be available very soon. Uh, and uh, we've improved the developer experience. We've improved the support for Hermes. Uh, and also, we built React Native Windows on top of the WinUI library. And so when we make changes to the UI layer, you get that for free. And that's what happens in the case of Windows 11, uh, where we re rejuvenated the UI layer. So you will just get that for free by using React Native for Windows, which is pretty great. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the UI frameworks. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Fluent UI React Native. Uh, right now, this is mostly for early adopters. We have a few controls that you can and see if it works for you. Uh, we're in the process of adding new controls um, and, and, and being able to support additional scenarios as well. Um, but what this is, so Fluent UI React Native is a, is a set of controls that are supported across multiple platforms and that have the Fluent design system built in. And the Fluent design system is, is essentially a set of styles that is designed to look great across all platforms. So this comes built into the controls uh, when you use them. Uh, now, if for any reason you want to override uh, the built-in design system to match what you would like to, to render, you can do that as well. Uh, uh, so head over to github.com slash Microsoft slash UI React Native, and you can learn more about it. Uh, and, and I'll show you a quick demo of how this works. Uh, so you have a Mac OS, an iOS, and, a, and an Android application. And what we're showing here is the difference between light mode and dark mode, as well as the ability to inject your own branding. So uh, if you see, for example, uh, Word is typically blue and Excel is green. And so you can, you can customize it such that uh, on, on Excel, it looks green, and on Word, it looks blue. And then, and so have that branding for those applications. And here's a couple of examples of controls that we have today. So uh, these are the ones that are on Mac OS uh, in light mode. Uh, these ones are controls on Mac OS using dark mode. 
these are the ones that are on iOS. And these ones are on Android. So again, uh, uh, and, uh, this, is an in, this is an area that we're investing fairly heavily in as well. Uh, so you'll see more controls coming up, uh, but feel free to give it a try and let us know what you think. Uh, so the next UI library that we'll talk about is React Native XAML. And what this is, is it's a library that exposes the XAML UI controls to React Native for Windows. If you're not familiar with XAML, what it is, is it's the native UI framework uh, that, that's built into Windows. And uh, what React Native XAML does is it provides a projection of those controls into JavaScript. So that allows you to write uh, you know, any of your view managers like purely in JavaScript without having to touch the native code at all. Um, so let me show you a demo of what this looks like. Uh, and here, uh, what we're doing is we're using the, the color picker of the XAML, of the XAML library. So uh, with, with just a few lines of code, about like five lines or so, uh, you can, you can uh, use the control inside of your application and then uh, respond to the callbacks that it provides. So in this case, uh, what we're doing is uh, we are uh, rendering the control and then just displaying the RGB values uh, that are coming back into a text block. Pretty powerful control and very easy to use with, with just a few lines of code. Uh, so React Native XAML is intended for uh, Windows developers who are familiar with the XAML uh, language already and who are not planning to, uh, to use their applications across multiple platforms. And then the third uh, UI library that we'll talk about is uh, Babylon React Native. So what this is, is uh, first let's talk about Babylon.js. And Babylon.js is a very popular JavaScript library that is built on open web standards. So it is completely free and open source, and there are several uh, really nice uh, models that have been built using it. If you head over to the Babylon.js uh, website, you will see s hundreds of examples of, of this uh, already. And Babylon JS on native is also supported on native platforms. So the first thing is what we, that we have is Babylon native, and it brings that power of Babylon JS over to those native platforms. And Babylon React Native is the integration of that Babylon native platform into React Native. So what it does is it provides you a React Native component uh, that you can use as a rendering surface for your Babylon uh, model. And you can use that to render the model and, and et cetera. This is currently supported on iOS on, and Android and Windows. So over to a quick demo. Uh, this, is, this is, for example, uh, one that's actually running on Android here uh, that shows you uh, live reload working, so you have a couple of models, and on the left side, what we're doing is we're just switching between them. And so, here's the first. Here's the first one. We went to the second one. Now we can go back to the first one, etc. And so that's completely supported in React Native for Windows. And one of the experiences that you can build there is uh, is an augmented reality one. And so here's the same model that was built earlier, running on top of the Hololens device. So we can render it in, inside of the space uh, of, of, uh, that the person is seeing uh, in augmented reality, which is pretty cool. And again, that's running on top of uh, React Native for Windows. So here, so those were a few UI frameworks that uh, we provide. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of work going on there. Uh, let us know what you think. Try them. Uh, happy to hear feedback uh, on, on how, this, uh, how your experience is using them. And so now let's talk a little bit about tooling. And, uh, uh, and I will mention a couple of things. So one is uh, we, have, uh, we recently built a test app. We call it the React Native Test App. Uh, that simulates, you know, like a, like a real, nat real React Native application on multiple platforms, so iOS, Android, macOS, and Windows. And uh, uh, it's really nice because it abstracts a lot. It abstracts a lot of the complexity of all those platforms for you, allowing you to just go ahead and just write your applications on top fairly easily. 
Uh, and the other thing that's cool about it is that there is a we have a workflow that's uh, supported that allows you to quickly switch between React Native versions. And that's important because you can then just try a newer version and see how your experience will run um, in a very quick and efficient manner. So uh, the link for this one is github.com slash Microsoft slash React Native Test App. Uh, the other one I will mention is uh, a repo called RNX Kit uh, that is also uh, supported by Microsoft. So what this is, is it's a set of tools that we built uh, to help you uh, maintain and build your React Native applications and libraries. It's a lot of things that we learned as we were building our own applications that uh, th where we felt we needed uh, small tools to help us. And all of those are in this RNX Kit repo. Uh, so I, I put a table on the right here where you can see some examples of, your, of those tools. Uh, but I would say if you're interested in learning more about this, we have a separate talk at the React Native EU conference where we will discuss that. So that talk is by Lorenzo Chandra and Tommy Nguyen, and it's called Improve All the Repos. Highly recommend that you check this out. We will go into a lot more details uh, around one of the tools that is in the RNX kit, as well as the React Native test app. Cool. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications that have been built using React Native. Uh, and, and maybe starting with one that you might have heard already. So Facebook is, is building the new Messenger application on top of React Native for Windows and Mac OS. Um, and this is a great testament of the power of the platform. It allows you to build that, to build one app, to build your app once and have it running on both, uh, on both operating systems. Um, so you've heard about that one. And I will now talk about a couple of other ones that you may not have heard about. So uh, the first one is the Nomadics Backpack application. And what it is, is it's a digital classroom experience with tools that are integrated for students and teachers to use. Uh, the app was originally developed about for iOS and Android. And then Nomadics saw that there was a high demand for Windows as well. And so what they did was they migrated the application for, to Windows using React Native for Windows. Now you can imagine like those applications right now are really important, especially with people working uh, studying remotely and, and needing really good uh, applications for them to be able to do this efficiently. And so here's a screenshot of the dashboard for Nomadics. You can see it's very detailed. Uh, it gives you an idea of the classes that you have, the assignments that you need to do, etc. Um, the next one is what uh, Nomadics calls uh, its smart paper experience. Uh, and this one is actually using the React Native Sketch Canvas. So it supports touch, it supports inking. Uh, and uh, uh, what it does is it allows you to uh, for example, here do a long division and uh, enter your uh, step. You enter your content step by step, and that's really nice because uh, the teacher can then replay uh, the steps that the student did and identify areas where they might have made mistakes and help them there. Uh, so, so in some cases, these applications are optimized for touch, as in the case of uh, when you're running on Android, um, and and when you're running on Windows with uh, touch support, you can use that as well. Uh, the next one is the one called uh, Smart Label. And so this one allows you to take a static image and be able to add labels to them uh, dynamically. So really cool experience as well for kids uh, so that they can label things uh, uh, as part of their workflow. Cool. Uh, and then let's look at one at the second application. So this one is co is coming from Mashrec Bank, and uh, uh, Mashrec is the oldest uh, regional application, uh, the oldest regional bank in the United Arab Emirates, and it has uh, offices in several uh, continents. So here's what Mashrec uh, had: they had an, they had an Android application already uh, that was being used by their frontline workers to interact with their customers, uh, and what they what they needed was this, a similar application for Windows, because uh, part of their part of their uh, employees were also using were using Windows devices, so they used React Native for Windows in order to stand up that application. Now, what's great about it here as well is that on Android, the application is optimized for touch, uh, and on React on Windows, it's optimized for mouse and keyboard uh, thanks to the built-in support that we have there already. Uh, the, the, the team was able to do this uh, while sharing the majority of the code between the Android and the Windows application, which is a really nice win as well. 
So this is a screenshot of what they built. Uh, this is the uh, logging part of their experience. And then uh, when a user is logged in, uh, you can see what uh, a sample customer information page would look like. So this is also very rich and again built on top of uh, React Native for Windows with a lot of code shared between the Android and the Windows implementation. Cool. Uh, and then let's talk a little bit about how Microsoft is using React Native on desktop platforms. So we've got several apps, again, that I mentioned that uh, we've, we've been shipping already. Uh, some are brownfield applications, some are, some are greenfield ones, but at this point we're shipping to hundreds of millions of customers around the world. So uh, we'll talk about Office first. Uh, and uh, Office builds brownfield applica uh, applications in the client apps. So think about Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook. There's at least an app, there's at least an experience in it today running React Native. Uh, and these are shipping in iOS, on Android, on macOS, and on Windows. As a couple of examples, uh, this is a, a revamp of our commenting experience. Uh, so previously, when you commented in Word, it used to be inline on the canvas. We've now moved it to a pane and provide you a very rich experience where you can comment uh, and, and interact with other users who are, uh, who are looking at the document. Uh, this is a screenshot of what uh, that experience actually looks like. Uh, the next one is our privacy dialogue. This is again like completely built using React Native. Uh, this is the dialogue that you get when you sign into Office for the first time and then uh, to be able to set your privacy settings. And then this one is, is what we call the Unity Canvas. It's, it's a place where we can advertise some really cool features around the application that we would encourage people to use. Uh, so this is this. These are examples uh, for Office, and then we can talk about uh, React Native uh, for Windows on Xbox. And uh, you might have seen those uh, screenshots already because we've shared them before. Uh, but but again, I just wanted to show the richness that we have here. Uh, so there are multiple uh, experiences today on Xbox that are shipping on React Native. And if you have a fairly recent version of the operating system and an Xbox at home, chances are you're running React Native on it. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, the When you get to the Xbox events, uh, this page is built using React Native. Uh, once you go, uh, once you go inside and start looking more about the events, uh, you get into a new, a new React Native uh, for Windows view uh, that is that you can interact with. Uh, here's a couple of additional screenshots uh, with showing apps that you can purchase, um, and and a, and a set of search results. So uh, we had really great feedback from our uh, Xbox colleagues as well uh, on their usage of React Native. Uh, they, they highlighted a lot of really good performance improvements that they saw. And uh, if, if, you, if you're using this experience on, uh, uh, on the Xbox, you'll notice that it's, it's very, very smooth. So it was, it was, a, it was a great experience for us. And so how do you get started uh, writing your own React Native applications? So the first thing you want to do is head over to aka.ms slash React Native, and we have a bunch of getting started guides, guides there. Um, you can start you know, writing an app from scratch, or you can port an existing app that you have for Android or for iOS uh, over uh, to, to Windows and, and Mac OS. And uh, we'd be very happy to hear you know, how your experience is and what are the things that you've been able to do. So you can always connect with us on GitHub if you have any questions as well that we can help you with. Uh, so, so just as a short demo, I, I went over to that website and uh, in the interest of time, I already set up an, an environment. So here I am on my macOS laptop uh, and uh, I am running a virtual machine for Windows. And what you can see is the, uh, the application for the, our test application. When you go through the first experience, you will get this test application. Uh, on the left one is the one for Windows and the right one is the one for macOS. And so, uh, so I have the uh, development experience set up, and uh, uh, I already downloaded the prerequisites. The prerequisites. I have my bundler running. And so, what I will do next is go ahead and just um, show you show you how what this looks like. So, on the Mac, uh, you can use you will use Xcode, and uh, we have live reload working, for example. So here, you know, I'm increasing my font size uh, from 24 to, 40, to 48. Once I save, you can see uh, the live reload working pretty quickly in the test application, uh, and that's all fully supported. 
And uh, the same thing on React Native uh, for uh, for Windows as well. So here I'm using using Visual Studio. You can use Visual Studio Code as well. Let me just make this a little bit bigger, and I'll just try the same thing. So change the font size, and then go ahead and save. Uh, the new bundle will get pushed there, and here you can see on the left that uh, the font just became bigger. So you can you can try those as well. It's it's very easy to get started and write an application on both of those platforms. So give it a shot. Uh, let us know how it how it is, and uh, we'll be very happy to hear what your experience was like. So with that, I'd like that's the end of my presentation. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, thank you also for Coldstack from Cold, for Coldstack to set this this conference up. It's really great to have everyone together to talk about those experiences. And I know it takes a lot of time to get those conferences up and running. So thank you again. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, my contact info is here uh, on this page. Uh, and then I have on the left a link to all of the repos that we talked about in this presentation. Uh, so again, if you want to get started, aka.ms slash React Native, uh, give it a try, let us know how, it, how things go. Uh, and again, thank you for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Thank you, Khalif. Really exciting talk. And honestly, I'm, I'm so happy that there is Mac OS and Windows at the same time because I can kind of make Windows apps developing Mac on Mac OS at the same time. So I don't have to deal with those VMs. Now, I guess, you know, this has been a very, very intense first blog. So I guess you are all probably excited for what's next to come. But before we do that, I do have a 15 minutes break for all of you to kind of maybe get more coffee, have a break, and most importantly, open up Discord, go to the React Native EU channel and just talk with each other. Maybe you have some interesting insights about the talks that you have just heard, or maybe you want to ask questions to folks at Microsoft or Facebook or Expo about the things that they have shared with us. So just take the most out of this time and we will see each other in 15 minutes from now. This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts.
Hello, I'm Mike, CTO and co-founder at Callstack, and today I'm looking for the best React Native developers to join my team. Besides working on high-end software used by millions, we also contribute to many open-source projects such as React Native Paper, React Native Testing Library, or Repack. And so you will have an opportunity to develop your skills and knowledge within these projects, as well as move your own ideas into life by taking part in our R&D program. We are a great team full of people crazy about React Native technology, and we can't wait to share our knowledge and description with you. Trust me, it's great to be part of such a team. So don't wait anymore, join us, check out the job description in, in the link below and apply and I'm hoping to see you soon in our Colstag office or maybe remotely depending on your location. Bye bye. Hello everyone, this is Wuka speaking. I have a pleasure to co-host this fifth React Native EU conference live from Wrocław, Poland, from our Callstack office. Uh, I hope you're having a great time today. Uh, we just had our ice-breaking session and we talked about cross-platform and architecture of React Native applications. Uh, at our first session, we had a great uh, speakers. Mark from Expo, Joshua from Facebook and Kalev from Microsoft. Thank you guys for doing this. Um, I want to remind you all that all of the talks will be available on our YouTube channel, Callstack Engineers, please ch check that out. Um, join us also on Discord when we can do some networking and you can ask questions that will be answered either by our speakers right now or will be addressed in our next React Native Show podcast. Um, you can also, and you are encouraged to, uh, tweet about this conference using React Native EU hashtag so that you can let your friends and family know that you are here with us today. Um, yeah, and that was all from this break. Uh, let's have a cup of coffee and uh, we'll see you in a few minutes for our next round of talks. Wake up in Wrocław, get up and get at him. React Native EU is on and it's happening. Check in to check up on all of the latest news and strategy. Man, it's kind of the greatest. Welcome to React Native EU 2019. <laughs> Keynotes that unlock a new world of insight. Lightning talks this cutting edge? It really seems so right. Networking with everyone in the React Native community, from the thinkers to the linkers, we're all here in unity. Q&As that dive deep into cold DNA, and it's all covered here in only two days? Especially when it comes to trouble. After the last session, we're gonna party, okay? Drinks with good vibes and dope karaoke. Hot vibes all around. It was good to be here. Can't wait till the next one. 
We'll see you next year.
This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts. Welcome back after break, and uh, we are after a quite intense series of talks about React Native core features and what's here to come. So now let's focus on something that you can probably all relate to, which is application development and features or libraries that we are using every day. Now, next two speakers are from Coldstack, so these talks are what I'm particularly excited about. Um, so the first speaker is Alexandra, and she's going to talk about uh, game development with React Native. Now, uh, there's been quite a few talks in the past about game development with React Native on React Native EU, but this one is different because it's talking about using Unity 3D. Now, I've been also doing Unity development quite a while ago, but my prototyping with React Native failed. So that's why I'm particularly excited to learn more about what she has to tell us today and how she has succeeded on her journey while developing games with React Native and Unity. So, let's learn about that and see how she made that happen. Hello everyone, I hope you are all having a great time at React Native EU 2021. I'm Alex, I'm here to talk to you about game development. The exact title of my talk is What if I want to be a game dev? I would like to start with a quote by Ernest Klein from the book Ready Player One. Maybe some of you have heard about it, or the book, or uh, the movie. Being human totally sucks most of the time. Video games are the only thing that makes life bearable. Okay, that quote is kind of a bummer, but video games are really a great way to spend your free time, right? And we do play a lot of games. That's why I would like to talk to you about developing games, because, you know, somebody has to create the games that we play. My talk will be divided into four parts. First, I'll do an introduction about a little bit about myself and about the reasons for making this talk. I will then go on to presenting your options. What can you do if you want to develop games? Uh, then I will concentrate on a game engine called Unity. And uh, lastly, I will talk about integrating Unity in a, with a React Native app. I would like to start off with a little introduction. As I said in the beginning, my name is Alex. This is actually my second talk at React Native EU. I spoke last year about animations in React Native apps. And I showed you a little preview during that talk of a small app called Pusha that I worked on. And I'm very proud to say that that app is currently available on the Google Play Store and on uh, the App Store. Uh, I would like to briefly add that publishing uh, the app by myself was a challenge, but it's doable. So if you're out there doing some solo mission and you're worried if you will be able to make it, you will. It's okay. You can, you can do it. Um, I like to push boundaries of uh, what I do, of currently of app development. So working on games is kind of pushing it, what, pushing what we currently do in React Native apps, usually. And uh, last but not least, I recently joined Callstack, and I'm very excited about that. Let's move on to the topic of this talk. I entitled this slide, Why So Serious? Because we developers sometimes take ourselves a little bit too seriously. So let's talk about games a little bit. Let's wake up our inner child. Uh, I would like to convince you that developing games is a great thing to do because it creates new challenges in very new areas. Uh, it can become your creative outlet. You know, some people make bread, some other people like make pottery. You can make games. Um, you can learn new stuff, new programming languages, but also new concepts in programming. Um, especially if you are self-taught like me, uh, then facing like new approaches to programming is very enriching. And uh, maybe there's some game that you would like to play yourself, but that doesn't exist yet. So you can 
go ahead and create it. So now that you're super convinced that game development is fun and is a good way to spend your time, let's weigh your options. You can take pretty much one of three votes. You can go with just plain old React Native, and it can be done in React Native. Uh, there are a lot of Flappy Bird examples of games developed in just plain old React Native. I guess Flappy Bird is the game equivalent of the to-do apps for React.js tutorials. Another road you can take is using a library called React Native Game Engine. It's just exactly what the name says, it's a game engine. It has some built-in functionalities like loops or character movement, and it will help you start uh, faster. Or you can try to integrate a game engine that can be super useful if the game you have in mind is maybe a bit more complicated than Flappy Bird. Let's take a deeper dive into those three options. There are many games written in React Native alone. Um, I myself saw a presentation of Flappy Royale uh, on the stage of React Native EU 2019, written in React Native alone. Um, there's a Minesweeper game, a basketball game. You can, you can find all kinds of great examples on GitHub. And uh, I would li also like to um, recommend watching William Candilon's YouTube channel where uh, the channel is called Can it be done in React Native? And the answer is usually yes. So what he did is he created a uh, three, baby 3D engine and uh, he shows how to use it and how he used it uh, with just React Native and Reanimated. If your game is a little bit more complicated or complex, you may want to go with um, open source library, React Native Game Engine. This library will help you tackle some standard game functionalities such as character movement or loops or many, many others. But what if your game is even more complex? Then you may want to go with a game engine. There are many, many game engines out there in the world. Uh, two, two game engines that are really renowned are Unity and Unreal. Unity has a vast tutorial ecosystem and it has actually existing integrations with React Native. Unreal is, um, is a famous game engine that has great 3D rendering. And there is an Unreal JS plugin where you can use the Unreal Engine and write all your code in JS. So why am I talking about Unity here? Unity is simply my personal preference. To be honest, both of those game engines have editors uh, which have a little bit of a learning curve. It takes some time to understand all the fields and there's a lot of fields. And it's, it, it, you, have to, you have to put some time in. So I put my time into Unity and uh, what I got back was really satisfying for me and that's why also I wanted to present it to you today. Here you can see a, a few second GIF of a game I created thanks to a tutorial on Unity. It was a 14 hour tutorial that I took a couple of hours a day for a week. So after a week I had I have this complete game uh, with Ruby, the main character, who is animated, moves around, she can get damaged, she can eat her little strawberry to get her health back, you can see her health in the corner, she can talk to other characters. And this was all done in just a few days with the help of a very uh, nicely done tutorial 
uh, all the assets were free. And this was a real fun way to learn Unity. And at the same time, I ended up with a game that I can play, that I can show to my friends and family, that I can uh, build out, I can create a whole world now um, and make this a really big game. Here are a list of some key points which convinced me to use Unity. As I said, Unity has a lot of tutorials some of them are in editor, very, very comfortable to use uh, with highlights of buttons that you have to click to, um, to achieve the goal of the tutorial, as well as tutorials on the website. Uh, the website also contains learning paths where by completing tutorials you earn points and um, it's, it's a pretty nicely gamified solution for learning. There are a lot of free assets to start off. Uh, there are a lot of paid assets as well, but if you don't want to invest any money, uh, you can start off with really a bunch of very nice free assets. Uh, Unity is great for 2D games as well as for 3D games. And it is used for some very, few, uh, for some very big titles, uh, which I will mention in a second. And there are uh, actually, a few React Native integration libraries out there that you can use. Here are a few notable titles that use the Unity engine. It's used in the game Overcooked 2, Fall Guys, or Subnautica. And as far as mobile games are concerned, Unity is used for Super Mario Run, Monument Valley, Angry Birds Epic, and many, many more. If you notice Super Mario Run here, I can add that Nintendo actually uses the Unity game engine for all of their mobile games. And that includes Animal Crossing, Crossing uh, Pocket, or Dr. Mario World, and Mario Kart Tour. Um, there's really quite a few titles out there. So now I have convinced you that game development is great. Then I hope I convinced you that Unity is great. Now the last piece of the puzzle is talking about the marriage of React Native and Unity. I believe they create quite the power couple. Integrating React Native with Unity can be done in two ways on a high level. You can have a React Native app and integrate a Unity minigame or some Unity functionalities in your app. Or you can have a Unity app in which you integrate a React Native app and functionalities. So let's start with the first approach. We start with a React Native app and integrate a little bit of Unity goodness inside of it. On the high level, it takes three steps. You start by creating your app, your React Native app. Then you can use Unity as a library, which is a new feature introduced to Unity in 2020. Uh, or you can check out some open source implementations. And then you just sit back and uh, admire your beautiful app game. Uh, here are some examples uh, of such integrations. Here you can see a, a game, like a shooter game, which is inside of a React Native view. It's a pretty, it's a pretty big, complex game, um, but at uh, any time you can go back to your React Native app. Um, there's also another, here you can see another example uh, of an app which has a React uh, a Unity game, a React Native app with a Unity game, but it's presented on a tab. And um, if you look closely, you can actually even see there are buttons uh, in the Unity app where you can change the background um, or like rotation of the 3D object. Can you imagine trying to render this 3D object in JavaScript? I mean, that would be and that would be a lot of work, right? And Unity is pretty much a few clicks. 
um, here you can see another example of an integration. It's, um, it's different in the sense that the, react the Unity uh, game or view is in the background of your React Native app. Um, and on the right, you can see something that I find super exciting. Uh, it's an example integration um, made by the Unity team uh, of using Unity as a library inside a native app. So uh, they have like a native app with a store, which we all know you can do in React Native. And then at the touch of a button, you go into an augmented reality powered by Unity uh, where your shopper can see what their item would look like on their actual desk. So, as you can see, there are a lot of ways to use Unity. You, they have uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, uh, 3D models, games. You know, the sky's the limit. And, uh, this is my cat who really wanted to participate in this talk. <laughs>
from the very beginning, developing ever since you know the React Navigation came out to the open space. And he's been, I guess, last year talking about React Navigation, new features, and now he's going to talk about kind of the same thing, but worry not, it's not going to be boring because there is a whole new version coming up, and that's what Satya is going to tell us about today. So React Navigation 6, let's fasten our seatbelts and see what Satya has prepared for us today. I'm Satya Sahu and I work at Postdoc and I'm the maintainer of React Navigation. Today I'm excited to share React Navigation 6 with all of you. So navigation in React Native is one of the most important parts of React Native. It's one of the first things that users experience in the app and that's why it's important to provide a smooth and native feeling to the user while keeping things mature brand. Today we have React Navigation, which is one of the most popular navigation libraries. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, there have been many attempts at solving this problem. There have been a lot of libraries with a lot of different APIs and varying approaches. I still remember when I first tried building something in React Native, one of the first things I was looking for was uh, to replicate that native feel. It was one of the first things that came to my mind. Uh, so I wasn't like searching for navigation libraries per se, but uh, that's what I meant. Like that's the feeling I wanted to capture. So interestingly, React Native already included a navigation library when it first launched, uh, unlike right now. So initially there was Navigator iOS. It was uh, long before React Native added Android support and it was iOS only. So it was a fully native uh, component, uh, which was only for iOS and it replicated iOS navigation controller. It had a very uh, small set of customization options. You could only change the header color and the font family, etc. But since it was native, it was pretty smooth. This component is no longer in React Native Core, but luckily this was just the beginning. So, when React Native launched on Android, we needed a new navigation library since uh, Navigator iOS did not work on Android. So Navigator was born. Navigator was uh, fully JavaScript written and did not use any native APIs. And this was a little bit uh, more customizable than Navigator iOS since it could change uh, a lot of stuff. But there was one major drawback with it. It did not use the animated API. So the problem is when animated added support for native driver, you could not use a native driver because it used to call request animation frame to drive its animations without using the animated API. So the migration wasn't straightforward. So we needed something new and we had navigation experimental. It was built by Eric Vishanti from Facebook and it was part of React Native Core. It was a set of navigation related components which are uh, now built with the animated API. It was very low level which allowed users to build own behaviors on top of it like our own navigation library on top of this. It was very customizable but wasn't easy to get started. I remember when I was using this API in one of my apps I had a lot of custom code uh, to like manage the navigation because this library only managed the animation, not, uh, not the logic. So not long after a new navigation library from Wix was born called React Native Navigation. This was fully native navigation library, worked on Android and iOS, is still maintained and currently at version four and one of the most popular navigation libraries after React Navigation. It introduced the concept of registering screen as separate groups. So each screen acts like its own independent app. So this data is still accessible from JavaScript and you can use JavaScript to do everything, but it still used some native APIs and some things were not possible. So next we got X navigation. This was kind of continuation of navigation experimental by expo and uh, 
mainly built by Brent Bartney and Adam Miskevich. Similar to Navigation Experimental, it used animated API for animations and implemented in pure JavaScript. This was also one of the first navigation libraries uh, which supported multiple patterns such as uh, tabs, drawer, etc. And it was very customizable and had a lot of features. But as all good things should do, like this also came to an end. Uh, it wasn't forever. So yeah, the next big navigation library was Airbnb native navigation. So this was built around brownfield apps and it was to make um, integration with brownfield apps easier, which Airbnb did a lot. So it was very similar to native navigation, uh, React Native Navigation by Wix, and we had to register the screens uh, up front, like we can we do in Wix. So sadly, now it's uh, no longer maintained since since Airbnb is no longer working with React Native. But yeah, it's it's now abandoned like a lot of navigation libraries in React Native. So all of these libraries have their pros and cons. Uh, I also didn't mention many libraries because they're not very popular and probably I, I cannot like mention all of the libraries that exist in this presentation. But yeah, but now it is time to come up with something uh, from the community, something that people who actively work with React Native maintain. So the community, Facebook and Expo came together and built a new navigation library called React Navigation. So it was very customizable, addressed many use cases. It was written in JavaScript only like X, uh, X navigation, like Navigator. But the main limitation of this uh, library was a static navigation API, which prevented many use cases. It went through many major releases. So current version is React Navigation 4, but the core API of defining the screens uh, statically is still the same. So even if all, all of these things changed, the basic API stayed the same. So React Navigation 4 is still used in a huge number of apps. So we are not going to deprecate it anytime soon because it will be like terrible uh, to migrate all of them to new React Navigation 5, which, which is completely different API. So yeah, we are still merging pull requests for React Navigation 4. And it's, uh, while we're not adding any new features, it's still actively maintained. So yeah, uh, mentioning React Navigation 5. After React Navigation 4, the next thing we had was React Navigation 5. Even though it's still React Navigation, I, I thought like I should mention it here because it had a reimagination of the core API. So I think it's a like big milestone in the landscape of navigation. So one of the biggest changes was the dynamic API. Instead of the old static API that navigation for React Navigation 4 used, uh, React Navigation 5 had a new API which was fully component based and it was dynamic that you can change any time uh, depending on state or props. The core had to like go through a rewrite to uh, to be able to support this and. Uh, it was a like major undertaking for us. The migration for React, Nav React Navigation 4 to 5 is not straightforward because the whole API for the navigation changed. Uh, while some APIs remained, a lot of APIs are like totally different. But I guess it was worth it considering how, how many pain points it's solved, like how many new use cases it enabled and people tend to find it like a lot more intuitive than uh, the previous API. So now there is another major version. We introduced React, Nav React Navigation 5 here on React Europe two years ago. Now it is time for React Navigation 6. Largely React Navigation 6 maintains the same core API as React Navigation 5. And you can think of it as like further polishing of the API on the code base of what was in React Navigation 5. When working on React Navigation 6, 
there were a few things we wanted to focus on. The first thing was flexibility. Many of the navigators accept some customization of props, which means we cannot customize them based on the uh, currently active screen. So, for example, here is a video I have where we have a bottom tab and we have several tabs. Uh, we have contacts, we have album. Say I switch to the album tab and you can see that the whole styling of the tab changed. Now we have a translucent uh, and dark background tab bar and the highlight color of the tab changed to white instead of blue. So previously this was not possible at all because all of the options we wanted to specify were specified at navigator's level. So at navigator level, you can have like only one set of props. So we cannot change the background color when you switch to album screen. So to make this possible, we had to make this all of these options customizable per screen. So this is how we did it. We had tab bar options, property top on navigator before. And instead of using tab bar options, now they are part of screen options. So now you can pass all of these things inside screen options, but you can also specify them in the options prop of the screen. So screen options is the default for all of the screens in Navigator and options will be specific to the screen uh, where you're using it. So with this, we'll be able to have a set of default for the whole Navigator and you can override those defaults per screen. So we did the same thing for uh, bottom tabs, material top tabs, and drawer. So all of them, instead of having tab bar options or drawer content options, you can specify all of these options in screen options. It will also be simpler for users to understand because you, know, you don't get confused about what is tab bar options and what is screen options. So to make it more flexible, we also introduced a new library called React Navigation Elements. So React Navigation Elements is a set of components and utilities that we use in React Navigation, uh, but they're like exported for using any, any, any app or any library. If you're building a custom navigator, you can use these or you can use this inside your app. So we have currently header, header back button, header title, platform traceable, and some other components and we'll be adding more soon. And if you have ideas on what to add, then feel free. This is not a like full-fledged full, full component library. These are only components which are useful for navigation and integrations with navigators. So next thing is we want to do simplify some of the API and reduce the manual work. React Navigation supports a lot of customization and it's possible to achieve many advanced things with it. And uh, you can do a lot of things, but you have to tweak things a bit. You have to play around with it a bit because sometimes things may not be obvious. But what we wanted to do is like, we wanted to simplify some common tasks. Because yeah, if you want very advanced uh, niche tasks, it makes sense that you will have to like figure out things your own, but for common tasks, if we just make it one line, it's much better for everybody. So yeah, one example of this was model presentation style. We introduced this in React Navigation 5 and also in React Navigation 4 with React Navigation Stack version 2. So to, do, to use it, you had to specify the animation with the transition preset, and you had to specify card overlay enable to true. You had to specify header status bar height. So you had to specify all of these things manually. Now with React Navigation 6, all you have to do is like specify the transition and everything else will be set automatically. So you can still customize everything if you want to, but the common case which is the native model presentation styles from iOS, you just need one line. So this is not all. Uh, another common example was when you 
set a custom header on Stack Navigator. You have to also set header mode to screen, or if you don't do that, you have to handle the animation manually. So while it's nice to have nice to be able to handle the animation manually, a lot of people got confused that they had to do that. They uh, they did not read the documentation even if it was mentioned, and we wanted to reduce this confusion. And um, so in React Navigation 5, we could not do this automatically because the problem is we had this option for the header, but we also have header mode, which is a prop on navigator, and these props cannot be changed based on screen. So in the Navigation 6, we moved header mode to screen options. And since we did that, we are able to automatically set it when you specify a custom header. So now it will default to screen when you have a custom header. You can always change it to float. Uh, and if you if you need it, but the default will be screen when you're using a custom header. Another small thing is when you had use header height, it would return zero if you had if you had a hidden header hidden header. So in the navigation six, if you have it inside a nested stack, and the parent stack has a header shown, and the nested stack has a header shown false, now use header height will return the height of the parent header, which is more useful. So another thing is transparent model. For transparent models, you also need uh, a couple of options. Now we have only one option, presentation transparent model, and that's all you need for transparent models. Of course, you can also customize it more. Uh, there are examples in the documentation, but the simplest case requires online. Uh, similarly, we added a new feature to specify a background for bottom tabs. For example, you can specify a blur view, or you can specify a gradient, or like an image, or whatever you want, without having to use the custom tab bar and or wrapping the default tab bar. So yeah, we we wanted to make these things simpler for users. And the Navigation Six includes a lot of these quality of life improvements. So another API we looked at is uh, in a lot of apps, people wanted to uh, navigate from Redux middleware or like things which are not in components. And to do that, they had to add a ref to the navigation container. But when you do that, you have to manage some things manually. For example, you have to like make two refs. You have to check if the navigation ref uh, was assigned. And you also have to add a ready ref to check it if uh, navigator, uh, navigation was ready to be able to dispatch actions. Now we have like a create navigation container ref helper and also use navigation container ref hook. And it has all of this uh, set up automatically. So all you need is like just check is ready on this ref. And then you call navigate on this ref. So which is much simpler than before. So another thing we often noticed that people nest their navigators a lot, sometimes due to necessity and sometimes because of organization. We always recommend keeping nesting to the minimum when possible because of a couple of reasons. When you nest more, it becomes harder to do some things. For example, uh, you have like TypeScript. There is a lot of, uh, lot of complicated code when there are nested navigators. And when you are navigating, you have to like write uh, screen, then pass patterns where you specify the uh, name of the child screen. So it also becomes more complicated as you nest more and more. A flat navigation tree is much simpler to use if, if you have the same, uh, same amount of screen. So another reason is performance. When you nest more, uh, the performance decreases because updating deep navigation trees is slow and also nesting a lot of views is uh, not, not good for memory users. In the React Native, there are layout views which are automatically optimized out, but if you're nesting navigators unnecessarily, um, it's gonna increase the view count. So there is, a not, there is not a lot we can do. 
So we wanted to minimize these uh, these necessities by providing alternatives. So one of the alternatives, uh, I mean, one of the use cases was uh, for nesting navigators is model and regular screens. So earlier you had to have a model screen at the root, and then as a child you have to have a regular stack. So you, you put all of the model screens inside this model stack and all of the regular screens inside of this regular stack. It was not possible to mix model screens and regular screens. So you had to have uh, two stack navigators. So we did some work to make it possible so that you can use a single stack navigator with two types of screens. So now you can have one stack navigator and where wherever you want model, you just pass presentation model and options, and that screen will be treated as a model. So in case of uh, here, you don't need to nest anything. It's all possible in one navigator, but there is still the case of organization. Maybe maybe you like to keep all the models in one one group. Yeah. So what we did is we introduced a new new API to group things. Uh, normally, you can use React, React fragments for this, but fragments are couple of things, issues. I mean, they're not issues, but they're more readability thing because it's not obvious wh why you are using a fragment. Uh, like maybe uh, you read the code and like there is a fragment, why is there? Maybe if you add a comment, it gets clearer, but still. Another problem is fragments do not pass, do not pass options to their uh, screens. Like you cannot pass options like you can on a navigator. So if you have two navigators, say for all of the models, you want like a blue blue header or something like that. So you cannot do that when you are just grouping the fragments. So we introduce a new API called Group, and with Group you can just like group things inside this group component. And you can also pass common options in screen options to this group like you can do on a navigator. And you can even nest groups inside groups. So yeah, you can go crazy with like how much organization you want. Groups don't actually render anything like fragments. They are just used for configuration. So it's not going to affect performance like nested navigators do. So here you can see that we have two groups. We have one group for regular, regular screens and one group for model screens. So another common reason for nesting was headers. Previously, we when we wanted to show a header in a tab, bottom tabs or drawer, we had to nest a stack navigator inside because they did not render a header by default. So what we do now is we render a header by default in drawer or bottom tabs, and then you don't need to nest anything because it's already there. there. And for drawer, we automatically add a button to open the drawer. For tabs, uh, we don't add any button, but uh, in both drawer and tabs, the header will represent the name of the current screen by default. So you don't have to handle that manually. So I think um, as a whole, it simplifies things. You can of course hide this header if you want, but yeah, it's there if you want it. So next thing is native navigation. Historically, React navigation and a lot of precursors like X navigation, navigation experimental have been JavaScript only. Oh, with animations and gestures, everything written in JavaScript. It works for a lot of apps, uh, but apps with heavy, heavy screens can suffer. So we also wanted to address this concern. Uh, so we wanted to like promote use of native navigation primitives. So with React Navigation 5, we introduced the native stack package. This native stack package uh, from React Native Screens. And we also had uh, the view page of backend for natural top tabs. And this backend used view page 2 and UI page view controller. So yeah, uh, we wanted to promote use of uh, UI navigation controller for stack on iOS and fragment on Android. 
and view page of 200 for the material top tabs and UI page view controller for iOS and for material top tabs. So uh, in React Native version 5, these are these were optional, and I mean in React Native version 6 now we promote use of native native stack by default. If you go to reactnavigation.org and you go through the getting started guide, by default you will set up native stack. The JavaScript stack is still there and still maintained, but uh, for new apps we'll have the native stack by default. Uh, so you will have better performance unless you need more customization, then you can always go for the JavaScript based stack navigation. So I wanted to thank uh, React Native Screens from Soft Dimension, uh, made by Christoph Maguera, Wojtek, and Casper. And Native Stack is possible only because of React Native Screen. Without their work, it wouldn't be possible. So yeah, I want to thank them. And similarly, I also want to thank uh, Piotr, Mateusz, Michal, and Alpha0010 for React Native Pager View. It would be possible to um, have a native backend for natural top tabs without their work. So yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for making React Native better. So next thing we wanted to focus on is better types. React Navigation 5 had much better type than React Navigation 4, but some things that as use navigation were still untyped by default. You could like uh, navigate to any random string and it wouldn't give you a type error. So we wanted to change that and make them more type safe. So now in React Navigation 6, you do not need to annotate use navigation to get auto completion and type checking. Uh, it is typed by default, but like it's not automatic because we cannot know all of the screens uh, in your app automatically. You still need to change one thing, uh, but like if you already have typing for your React Navigation screens, it's just like very few changes to make this work. So it is possible by defining a type for the uh, root, na root navigation the navigator of the root, uh, and it works by using a feature in Tasha called declaration merging. You can find more about this feature on how to use that uh, in our Tasha related docs. So next thing we want to improve as developer tools. Now we have a flipper plugin for React Navigation. Uh, this is only working in React Navigation 6. Uh, but this plugin includes similar functionality to what's currently in the what's currently available in the Redux DevTools extension that we have. Uh, this Redux DevTools extension works with both React Navigation 5 and React, React Navigation 6. But um, the problem with uh, React De Redux DevTools extension is that it is not our UI. We are just using the Redux DevTools, so we cannot like build anything we want. So with this Flipper plugin, since it's fully custom built, we can add any any new features we want. We can, like here, you can see there is a linking tab where it shows you the deep link structure. Uh, another advantage of this Flipper plugin is it doesn't need Chrome debugger. So when you are using Chrome debugger, some things may not work properly. So this Flipper plugin gives you a better idea of uh, like how things are working uh, instead of this Chrome debugger, which, um, which may break things. Unfortunately, this Flipper plugin doesn't work in Expo, but it works in other React Native apps. So yeah, with every major releases, there is this still question about upgrade because Everyone did this upgrades. Uh, while React Navigation 6 isn't a huge change over React Navigation 5, uh, it's a much smaller change than React Navigation 4 to React Navigation 5. And there are still a lot of breaking changes. So there are a few things we can do when upgrading to make things easier. So first of all, all of these changes are listed in our upgrade guide. We have some mandatory breaking changes, which you will have to do if you're upgrading. 
Uh, we also have some deprecation warnings. You don't have to do, uh, change them immediately. These things will continue working until next major release, but they'll show you deprecation warnings, which you can ignore with yellow, yellow box API. So another thing you can do to um, simplify this migration is you can mix versions from 5x and 6x. So generally, it's not something you do if you're starting a new application, but for upgrading, uh, it's perfectly reasonable and it will work, uh, but there are some caveats. Please refer to the upgrade guide for the list of uh, caveats if you're mixing these two packages. And as long as you keep these two things, uh, keep these things in the mind, uh, you should be able to mix those versions. So yeah, go to our upgrade guide and read more about it. We have a full list of breaking changes, full list of duplications, and we also have the list of uh, caveats when you're mixing 5x and 6x packages. So just wanted to uh, mention a few more things before I sign off. We enable GitHub discussions on our repo. So feel free to go there and talk with other community members. It's not a little my community. So yeah, please participate in these discussions, answer people or like ask questions or like just share things you have done with React Navigation. So if you want to help, um, you can help with code obviously, but there are a lot, lot more things you can do to help. So you can improve our documentation, you can answer questions uh, on Stack Overflow or GitHub discussions. You can try as issues, uh, check which issues are valid, which are not, check the, uh, check the repo they have posted, or if they haven't, you can ask for something or try to make a repo yourself. Or review pull requests. Uh, we have a very small development team, so any, any help will help us a lot, and it will be very beneficial to everyone. Another thing I wanted to ask, is uh, we enable sponsorships for React Navigation. And if React Navigation is valuable to you, if it uh, brings value to your company, consider sponsoring us. We appreciate any financial contributions and sponsorships. So you can go here, github.com slash sponsors slash React Navigation. And we have a lot of different tires and you can sponsor whatever is comfortable for you. Okay, so that, that's all for now, and uh, I thank you a lot. Hope you have a nice day or nice evening, and hope you enjoy React Navigation. Thank you, Satya, for this talk, and I'm really excited, can't wait to actually try these features on uh, a application. Now, maybe this is a challenge for you, but let's see if we can uh, challenge you to do React Navigation 7.x next year. If you submit a talk like that, I'm pretty sure you will be on our agenda as well. Now, let's move to another speaker, Truls, and he is working at Crown, and he's going to tell us about React Native going native. And while this title may seem like something very generic, this talk is about very interesting use case when sometimes you have to do a bit of native code while doing React Native. In their particular use case, they were building a podcasting application, so related to music and audio streaming, and they had to do quite a few things natively uh, to make sure that the application works properly with the system, syncs properly, uh, reacts to the native events, and most importantly, works properly in the background. So. There are cases when sometimes you have to go native, and I guess there, his talk is about these use cases and when they are happening and how to handle them. So let's see how they did that and how he made that happen in his podcast app. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about how you can leverage the native site in order to improve the performance, the readability, and maintainability of your React Native app. Some of you might know that Airbnb tried to integrate React Native into their existing app. And Coinbase recently rewrote their app from a native app into a React Native app. Today I'm going to talk about another option where we actually started off with the React Native app and we moved some of it to the native side. So a bit about me, my name is uh, Truls. I work for a company called Kron here in Norway, where we make investments available for everyone. Uh, a shameless little plug here, if that's something you're interested in, we are looking for React and React Native developers, so please reach out. 
Other than that, I've been using React Native since version 008 when uh, upgrading to a new React Native version was actually a pain in the ass and iOS was only supported. Uh, I've also uh, built and maintained several React Native apps uh, for, uh, uh, for a period of, of years. And the project I'm going to talk about today uh, is a project called Shift that was started over three years ago. So before we dig deep into that, I just want to give you an overview of uh, what this talk is going to be about. So I will start off giving you an introduction to Shift, the app, so you can get a better context of, uh, of what the app is about when I'm going to show you the use cases of where we moved uh, code from React Native to the native side. And then I will talk a bit about the motivation of why I wanted to have this talk in the first place. Then we will start off with the use cases, and then I will close off with some closing thoughts. So let's dig into it. So the elevator pitch for Shift is that it's a workout, workout app that lets you shift within podcast and music. Uh, it's, it all started over three years ago when uh, my friend and I wanted to carve out more time for podcast in our daily life. So uh, we figured that listening to podcasts while you work out is, is a good start, but really, you can't really uh, listen to podcasts when you are working out hard, but the rest times in between worked uh, flawlessly. So what we did is that uh, we built an app that plays music and podcasts and is all controlled by a timer. So if you run in 12 for four minutes, it will play four minutes of music. When the uh, four minutes is up, the app will automatically shift to podcast and then play podcast for your rest time. And then it will uh, shift back to uh, music when your rest time is up. So uh, I guess that's uh, enough talk. I want to give you uh, just uh, a short intro to the app as well, just to give you some visuals. It might be easier to, to, uh, to understand what I'm talking about. So let's go. So uh, this is the front page of the app. You have a podcast section and a music section. Uh, for music, you can uh, either use Spotify or our own curated uh, mixtapes. For podcast, it's basically just a normal podcast app where you have your queue. We have a set of Discover uh, episodes, and you can also import podcasts from other podcast apps. Uh, but the most important thing for this talk is the workout screen. So let's uh, start a workout and jump right into that. So as you can see now, I've started working out and I'm in resting mode and then I'm listening to podcast. So one thing, uh, we have a couple of settings and some of them are actually quite important for this talk. So remember them for later. We have setting where you can play beep when it's uh, a given set of time left of your rest or work period and we also have the same for uh, for speech so now i don't know if you saw it but the timer just ran out and it automatically uh, shifted to music and now we're listening to club live club live by tiesto and another thing to remember for later is that we also have uh, a notification that also shows the timer left and uh, what is current playing. So now the timer will run out again and it will automatically shift to to podcast and you can see that the notification is also updated. And uh, we also have uh, a feature where you can uh, pause or what we call it freeze the workouts and you can unfreeze it. and. These are uh, features that I will uh, break down later in the talk in the, in the use case. So um, I guess that's uh, enough uh, of that. Let's dig back into the, to the presentation. So uh, the motivation for me to, to do this talk was that when we started uh, thinking about moving stuff from React Native to the native side, um, there wasn't a lot of good resources out there. There are resources on how to create um, nati native UIs and to integrate them into your React Native app. There are resources on how to create a uh, bridge, but there, we didn't find any good resources on why you should do it. And that's essentially why I would like to have this 
talk here today to try to give you a tool in your toolbox that you can use if you also experience the same thing that's, that we have uh, experienced here. And I want to give a, a shout out here to my co-founder, Michael Gunnarsson. Uh, this is what I'm going to present here today. It's a, it's a team effort that uh, we have uh, done all together. So uh, let's dig into it. And before I start with the use case, uh, it is important to know what the bridge is in React Native, because that's essentially the whole point. So in React Native, for you to communicate with the native site, you go back and forth over a bridge. So an example of that is that if you create a view and you, for instance, have a style, that will go, will be passed over to the native site and rendered on the native site. And if you have inline styles, for instance, React Native need to serialize that and pass it over a bridge, which uh, requires more of the bridge. So if you have tried to console log uh, a property on your style sheet, you will see that it's a number, and that's for performance optimization. So majority of the time, everything runs smoothly, just like a real life bridge. Uh, but you can occasionally get traffic jams, and that's essentially uh, what I'm going to show you here today. So we have this concept of shifting. And uh, one thing that I actually didn't show you, but you can also press on this uh, button, and that will automatically shift to, uh, to the other uh, music source. And if that happens, then um, that uh, is catched by the JavaScript site, and it goes over the bridge and pauses the podcast. Because how we uh, play podcast, we're using a package called React Native Track Player on the native site, so we need to go over the bridge and pause the podcast. And that, in return, resolves a promise when the podcast is paused, and then that gets back to the JavaScript site. And then we can start playing music. And the music does the thing. So for music, we are using a package called React Native Spotify to play Spotify. And for mixtapes, we are using uh, a package or we have a package we have built our own. And then the same process here, it returns uh, a promise over a bridge when uh, the, uh, the, the play has started and we can finally update the UI. So you can see here we are going a bit uh, back and forth over a bridge. So this is actually the best case scenario for us. It's uh, it gets, it gets worse. So a lot of clients said that they don't want to, they don't want to click on this button in order to shift if they don't have put a, a timer here. So we implemented uh, a way for them to do that, and that's with headphones. So with headphones, you can press play or pause, you can, and it will automatically switch. And that, that means that we have set up um, headphones events on the native side, and we catch when the client press on play or pause, and that is emitted over the bridge, and then it starts the same process. And the same happens for uh, the beep that I showed you, and also the Android notification, in order for us to actually um, uh, communicate uh, that you're going to play a beep, then uh, we pass that back over the bridge in order to play the actual beep. And then now it starts to get a bit of calls over the over the bridge, but it's not much. It's, it works perfectly. But uh, what I'm going to show you next is, uh, is, is our worst use case. But before we get there, I want to just give a bit of background of what it actually, actually is. So I don't know how many of you have tried to run a background timer in React Native when the app is also in, in, in background. So uh, it seems like at least it's 3,000 people here who have uh, had this problem or at least looked for a solution. And um, what Jose is, is uh, mentioning here is that he tried to use a package called React Native Background Timer, uh, which we also tried to use, but it had some bugs at the moment and uh, the same for us, unfortunately. So, uh, but as a good Samaritan, as Jose is, he also answers his own question. And that's, he actually computes the value. He takes, computes uh, the, um, 
the duration between two dates. So he takes the value, he takes the, the timestamp when uh, the app does something and when it finished, and then he calculates how long the duration has been. And that's essentially what we do as well. But we have one more uh, problem for us, and that's uh, we have this timer loop because we need to uh, actually check every second uh, what is going on, and we also need to update the UI every second. So every second we are emitting an event over a bridge to the JavaScript side, and we update the JavaScript side and update the UI. It checks the counter. If the counter is zero, it will automatically switch. And we also uh, persist some data. Every 15 seconds, for instance, we are persisting uh, the podcast position so that when you close the app and open it again, uh, you will uh, start where you left off. And now, as you can see, uh, we are sending an event over the bridge every second. And now uh, that starts uh, to blow the bridge uh, a little bit. So, how did we solve this? So, I recently stumbled upon uh, this table on uh, the React Native documentation, and this is quite important for in this talk as well, because as you can see here, React Native has listed out a couple of uh, components and what they are in the native world. And that means that React Native is actually compiling your views into native code. And why that is important, that is because that's what we are going to do as well. We are going to create our own native views in order to solve this problem. So as you remember, this was where we was, where we were. We were meeting an event every second over a bridge. And maybe based on that, we will go even more over a bridge. So what we did is that we took the duration and the countdown timer and we moved those to the native side. And then we can get rid of all the calls going over the bridge. So essentially what it looks like then is that now we have our main counter, which is basically the same as the, as the time loop from before. And then that emits an event to a counter UI, which is responsible for just displaying this and displaying this. And then we have something called the shift master, which is uh, responsible for the notification that I showed you, playing a beep whenever uh, the counter is at the threshold uh, set by the user, playing speech, and also when the counter goes to zero, it will automatically switch. So you will also have control over which audio is playing and have a reference to uh, all the players. So this is essentially uh, the architecture we went for. And now we are not using the bridge at all. But another uh, great thing that came out of this uh, was actually that our codes got uh, much cleaner and uh, the readability was much better. So I'm going to show you an example of that. So uh, I've heard that you might not see this, and so I'll try to just go through it briefly. But the whole thing is the, the freeze or the pause mode that I showed you earlier. And the thing is that when you press there and you start to freeze, we need to get the current timestamp and also do some calculation based on previous timestamps. And then when you uh, unfreeze, it will uh, use those timestamps and calculate what the current uh, countdown is and what the duration is. And this was quite error prone. And you can see we also have some sort of reporting here that reports to Sentry for us. And uh, this was really hard for us to debug because we had events coming on the bridge, over the bridge every second. And then it was very hard to reproduce that the events came in a certain order. So after we did this uh, rewrite, this is essentially what the app looks like now. Now we just have uh, a basic counter, which um, most people start off with when they learn how to program, the same as uh, a to-do app, I guess. 
and uh, it's just made our confidence in the code so much more and this is just one of the examples of where our scalability and readability increased quite a lot. So I just want to emphasize uh, some of the key points I think it's important for this talk uh, before uh, we finish. And um, I hope that if there is one thing that you will uh, take away from this talk is that you will have another tool in your React Native tool belt when you are gonna, uh, when you are approaching problems. So this is the first time I've ever experienced a problem like this. And um, I, w I don't think you will reach for this uh, often, but I'm, I, it, it might be, and that's also the, as I said in the motivation uh, part is that why I want to have this talk in the first place to just show that this is actually in, is, is, is possible. And uh, we also did this change um, after three years of maintaining the app. So we had, we knew the ins and outs of the app. We knew where we had um, problems of bugs and where things were hard to, um, to reason about the code and also uh, where things might feel, feel a bit sloppy. And why do you think, and the reason why that is important is that when you start moving stuff from the native side, like from React Native to the native side, you lose one of the biggest um, biggest things of React Native, and that's learn once and write everywhere. Because now, essentially, we need to write every feature for uh, all the platforms that we support. And so I don't think this is something you should reach for whenever you have uh, uh, a problem like it, you really need to think, think it through and make sure that this is something that you would like to maintain for the period of the app as well. But another important uh, point for this is that our app was not, uh, did not perform poorly because going over a bridge as much as, as, as we did. Our app was uh, chosen as app of the day by Apple. We were monthly promoted in the App Store as well and we were also invited to the Apple Entrepreneur Program. So I'm actually, I was very positive, surprised how good React Native is when you're actually bloating the bridge as well and how much the bridge actually can manage. So I'm not saying that, uh, so I'm saying that this is, this might not be something that you will do that, uh, that often. And uh, another thing is that often when we, when I speak about the rewrite to other uh, people, um, a lot, of, a lot of them are saying that <laughs> this is not for them. They are not comfortable writing native code. They are comfortable in the React Native world, and I was the same as well. So I want to just share a couple of, of tips on how you can dip your toe into into the into the native side. So uh, what? How we started is that we took a small problem and we moved it to the native side and over time we saw how that went and then we just start moving more and more parts. And now each time I try to, each time I integrate a new React Native native package into my app, I always go and look at the score source code and see how, how they structure their bridge, how are they writing their code and then I use that as an example of things I want to get more interested in, and I start to dig, dig into that. And there's a lot of great resources out there on how to create native views for, for, for React Native and integrate them, create a bridge. And there's also a great resources if you want to pick up uh, Android or iOS development. And at least for me, going, going into the native side has made me an even better React Native developer, because now I have a better understanding of how the native platform works. So um, that's it. Thank you for listening all the way through. And if you have any questions for me, please route, reach out uh, on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Trushaya. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Schulz, very much for this talk. Now. Um... You know, if there is a way we can make React Native show our podcast be played while resting, let me know. We'll be interested in making that happen. Now, moving on, we got another speaker, Sanket, from Geeky Ants. Uh, 
he's going to talk about something very important, often overlooked, which is accessibility. Um, they have actually created a set of hooks uh, called React Native Aria uh, that lets you build accessible apps with uh, less effort than usually. So something that you probably should all be aware of and should be using to make sure that your applications are actually okay for people with visual impurities or any kind of disabilities that accessibility supports. So let's learn about their library and how, made, did, how they did uh, make that happen and how we can benefit from it from our, uh, within our applications. Hey everyone, I'm super excited to be back at React Native EU. And uh, today I'm going to talk about building accessibility hooks for React Native and web. I'm Sanket, I'm a software engineer at Geeky Ants. And uh, yeah, I go by the Twitter handle Sanket Sahu. Uh, you might have come across this tweet, uh, which went viral. And uh, yeah, so that's me. And uh, yeah, so I'm tuning in from the beautiful city of Bangalore. Uh, I wish I was there. Uh, and I wish it was a, an in-person conference. But yeah, here we are. Uh, this nice illustration by Abby Bach. So, Thank you so much for that. Uh, so let's get back to the topic and try to decode that building accessibility hooks for React Native and web. First of all, what is accessibility? So I went through the MDN docs and found this, which broadly defines what accessibility means. So it is the practice of making your websites uh, usable by as many people as possible. I think the same applies to apps too. So it would be websites and apps, uh, making them usable by more and more people. Uh, that's a very broad, broad definition. So if we narrow it down into like, what are the characteristics or what are the support that you need to make your website and apps accessible, it would be something like, it should be uh, compatible with screen readers so that uh, people with visual impairment or low vision can can uh, use the screen readers and understand what the app is all about or what the website says. Uh, and the same thing applies with contrast ratio with people with low vision. Uh, and then we have responsive design, like the, the app or the website needs to be accessible on uh, mobiles, like smallest mobile out there and, and to the like desktop and maybe to the largest display out there. 108 inches TV or something. Uh, and keyboard accessible, I think this, I, I really am fond of using keyboards a lot. And uh, I use like tabs and arrow keys a lot. And uh, websites that don't work uh, with, with keyboards, it's, it's like really hard. Uh, so let's see what, what are these things and how we can enable these things in our websites and apps. Uh, so yeah, how to build accessible websites. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically in, term, in terms of React. So straight to the documentation. Documentation says that uh, web accessibility, also referred as A11Y, uh, it can be enabled. We can work on this. And React fully supports building accessible websites, often by using standard HTML techniques. So what are these standard HTML techniques? So uh, W3C and WCAG, uh, these are like guidelines. Uh, WCAG is a guideline that is provided. Uh, and, and we can like go through all the things that we can do. So it's usually with attributes that you can add to, to HTML markup. And that makes uh, the, the particular page or app accessible. Let's see an example. For example, if there is an input box, and I would like that to uh, to make it ARIA compatible and, and make it required for people who are using it with just, say, screen readers. Uh, so I can pass in a prop called ARIA-required as true. And this is a, an HTML standard attribute that is also supported in, in React. Uh, if we pass that, when we are using a page with or this input box with a screen reader, it, it says that this is a required field. And uh, we can also add a label, something like aria hyphen label, and, and drop in some, some label, and it reads that loud. So React and HTML standards 
for Aria, it's it's more or less the same thing, but React provides reactivity on top of it, which makes more sense. So let's see that in detail. So how do we create a component? So a component can be created by these five steps that I always come back to, writing the markup, doing the styling, and uh, adding interactions like handling events, and then uh, handling the states, and last but not the least, accessibility. Uh, let's take an example of creating a, a checkbox component for the web. So say I want a checkbox, so I'll wrap it in a label uh, markup and then have input type checkbox and some text around it. As step two, I would add some styling just with class names here, no CSS and JS. And uh, yeah, so late. Next, we can add interaction. For example, on the right side, you can see like as, as we click on the checkbox, it shows an alert message. So pretty standard stuff, input on change, alert, and then it does the trick. Next, let's make it talk to the state and let the state update uh, the, the DOM. Uh, how do we do it? So create state and then on change set that state and pass in the same value in the checked value of the input box check prop of the input box. So as we do it, we click on that and then the state is updated and the screen, the component re-renders. Last, accessibility. So we have props like aria-checked, aria-labeled by that we are going to use here in this input box is uh, the same value that we pass to checked prop in input, we can use the same thing and pass it to aria-checked. So with screen readers or with uh, when we like use keyboard, so this says that the, the current value of checkbox is checked and the label also reads out. We can have aria labeled by as, as I agree. So one thing to notice here is that it's the, it's the React's component state uh, that is building the initial UI and it's not just the visual UI that it is building. It is also building the accessibility uh, tree structure and, and accessible, like something that is not, uh, that can't be seen by the users, just by the screen readers. It also builds that. And whenever that, that is being updated, it's, it's updating the state and that reactively updates the ARIA values as well. So React is working for both the things, for the visual aspect of things and, and the non-visual aspect of the things, which is super interesting. And uh, here we are using standard input of uh, type checkbox. So we don't have to do much, but we can also make use of, say, something like div and make it behave like uh, a checkbox by adding something like role is equal to, say, checkbox. And then we have our checked in there and labeled by. So visually, we can style a div uh, like a checkbox, but to make the browser understand and the users of the browser understand that that particular div is a checkbox, we can use role property. Great, uh, let's move on. So let's see accessibility for mobiles, uh, for iOS and Android. And uh, to do that, we'll, we'll use React Native. So straight to the documentation, React Native also provides a unified API for iOS and Android uh, to make the apps accessible. Uh, for example, we can say that a view, which is equivalent to, which is somewhat like to div, uh, accessible is equal to true. So as we do that, screen readers start identifying this piece of this block of code as accessible unit. And it starts to read out uh, like text one and text two at the same time. In this example, uh, both the text nodes are not accessible uh, directly, but the view wrapper view is, is accessible. And the, the sound, uh, the screen reader reads, concats everything inside that, like text one, text two, and it reads that out. Uh, it also has focus management and things like that, uh, which which just maps by using this accessibility. Accessible is equal to true. Anyway, uh, we have more props that can be used. So we have things like accessibility role and accessibility label. 
uh, and uh, yeah, accessibility role and state and value these three are like very important that makes the end users understand what type of element they are they are focusing on and then what's the current state and what's the current value all these things apart from these three there are like really important ones and uh, the the black ones are supported on iOS whereas the green ones are for Android so let's create a checkbox component for mobile devices uh, so standard react native We'll use the pressable component. We'll create a nested view inside that and add some text. Uh, then add an icon and style it with standard React Native style sheet dot create. And uh, then add handle the state on press handle toggle, update the state, and also update the UI based on that state checked with checked box checkbox marked and checkbox blank outline. And uh, then we need to wire the same state with the accessibility role. So here we are using accessibility role as checkbox and accessibility state as checked. Uh, now this makes it work for screen readers, for the visual aspect of things, and it just works. So this is a very basic example of like how accessibility can be enabled uh, on top of the existing UI. Uh, Talk back on. Not checked checkbox, I agree. Checked. So, that, to so this is a quick example of like how screen readers work when we have accessibility enabled. Uh, how can we do the same thing for web or can we write a unified, uh, say, markup or unified component that works on both the platforms? Uh, yes, it's pretty much possible. We can use React Native Web to map the same React Native API uh, on, on the uh, on the web and let's see how that can be done so let's assume that this is our dream api and this is what we want to do like create a checkbox component that works on all the platforms it has it takes an is check prop and it has on change handlers uh, that that sets updates the check value and then it has text inside it that says i agree so to build this and uh, to make it look the same on web, iOS, Android, on, an, on Android, without losing the capabilities of the native accessibility on all these platforms. How can we do it? Let's see. So we can abstract out the, the, the UI part and create a component, say custom checkbox UI. That, uh, that's a dumb component, takes in checked, and then uh, gives us the, the checked UI of that. We can pass in false for the check value and just empties out the checkbox. Great. And uh, so to make it accessible, we have to write some conditional code. React Native Web handles it well, uh, but there are cases that where we'll, we'll have to write something specific for web. Uh, the first default thing that comes to our mind is, is handling the keyboard. Uh, versus handling the touch events. So here's a quick example of like how we can make the same checkbox UI uh, like accessible on different platforms. So we can write some conditionals with platform.os as web, and then write if it is web, then use the native input uh, and and write the on change and type as checkbox. So this does most of the trick. Like if if we have uh, input as checkbox. But on the parent, if we see, we have accessibility role as label, and this makes it tappable on the web, uh, or maybe, sorry, clickable on the web. Uh, and here we are using the same custom checkbox UI. And if we have a look at the input on change, that component is, is wrapped in a visually hidden uh, view. So it hides the, the real input box and shows the custom checkbox UI. Uh, while maintaining the accessibility aspect of things because the wrapper view at the top level has accessibility role as label. Uh, great, and for mobile phones, we go ahead and add accessibility role as checkbox, accessibility state as checked. So 
on the web, where exactly are we handling accessibility role as checkbox? So we are using a native input type is equal to checkbox. So that does the trick. We don't have to specifically notify that we are using a checkbox. Uh, and then you yeah, update the state accordingly. So this piece of code works on all the platforms, like for native, React Native does the trick. On web, we are using a native input box. Uh, input type is equal to checkbox, and then this works. So this is a very simple and a high level uh, example of of like adding accessibility that works everywhere. Uh, there are more things to, to consider. The first one is definitely keyboard interaction. Uh, an example of this would be when we are building, say, combo box or select boxes. Uh, we focus that using tabs, and then when we press spacebar, it opens up, and we can use the arrow keys up and down, and then press enter to select that value. Then it closes the pop-up. Uh, that's one example, and and this is like one of the the hardest example when when it comes to adding accessibility to a custom combo box. It also goes as a joke in the community, in the design systems community. Anyway, uh, and then screen readers, we have to make it compatible with the labels and all those things. And contrast ratio, uh, even the visual aspect of things, uh, those with low vision, can they read the text? Do we have like enough contrast ratio in the foreground and the background color? Uh, we have more than this. this. These are like just few points. And uh, that's where the A11Y project comes in. Uh, it's a very nice project. They have detailed down like all the different aspects of accessibility. They also provide a check checklist that any developer or uh, a team can can go ahead and check if they are compliant with all those things. Um, and yeah, they have the compliance in like three different levels: uh, A, double A, and triple A. A is is essential uh, sort of. Uh, accessibility that all the apps and websites must adhere to. Uh, this can be something like adding alt text, adding captions, uh, adding adding placeholder, and and whatnot. Like these basic things that 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 is like essential for for any app or any website per se. Then we have double A. Double A is a little stricter than A. It has all the checklist of A, but it has a few more things. For example, it has uh, the contrast ratio of text versus background must be at least 4.5 to 1. Uh, so yeah, that's one thing. Then, then we also have uh, subtitles for the videos and few other things. And, and this is like required by multiple government and public body websites. Uh, then we have AAA. AAA is like very strong level of compliance. This is like, uh, for example, it has a contrast ratio of seven to one. And then we have, uh, if there is any video on the website that has to have a sign language uh, support for, for people who can't hear. So yeah, these three levels are really important to understand and also to cross check with the website, like if your app or website has falls under like which category. Anyway, uh, they also have a checklist, the A11Y project. For example, for keyboard, they have like these three things. Make sure there is a visible focus style for interactive elements that are navigated to via keyboard. Uh, then we have like when you press tab, does it like maintain the same order as per the visual layout, or does it like jump from the first one to the fourth one and then goes back to the second one? Uh, and then a lot of things like this. Uh, it's in their checklist, and they have a very nice. Uh, like write up around it. Same thing for mobile and touch. Do we have like horizontal scrolling? If we rotate the screen, does everything like re reorganize well? Uh, so go ahead and check out the A11Y project. And yeah, so this brings me to React Aria. This is a brilliant project by the Adobe team. Uh, React Aria provides a set of React hooks that that anybody can use to build like accessible UI primitives for uh, their design system or for just their component library. Uh, huge shout out to Devon, who is heading this project uh, at Adobe. And uh, they also have another project in the same uh, 
set of projects the the parent group of projects is called as react uh, spectrum which has react aria and react stately react stately is the state management piece of of building these like ui primitives for example we have use toggle state as a as a hook let's see that let's see one of the examples so to build the same checkbox if we are using react aria so we can use toggle state from stately uh, react stately and we can use use checkbox from react aria and uh, then we can have a label and input and spread that input props that comes from use checkbox right into the uh, input element and yeah this does all the trick of like making that particular component uh, accessible with like keyboard with uh, mouse on top of it and and uh, for screen readers and and everything also these hooks are like service layers and it's it's more like uh, they don't provide any ui so the the keyboard handling or mouse handling uh, and the the accessibility part of it all these things are like abstracted out which can be dropped into other ui components to make them accessible and that's the beauty of react aria uh, yeah so this is an example and we can go ahead and use like checkbox and this this just works uh, it also gets all those props like is indeterminate and uh, all the things that a checkbox has great so uh, then there's another project this is called react native aria uh, this extends the support of react aria to mobile phones so and this project a huge shout out to nishan uh, he has worked a lot on this project he's is like a sole developer but there were like people in the team who helped him out uh, and uh, yeah so so let's see react native aria and how nishan and team they have built this react native aria so react native aria is a set of react hooks to build accessible ui primitives for react native and web so very similar thing uh, but it works for react native but with the help of react native web it works on like all the platforms so here is another example so we can import use checkbox from react native aria and then uh, use toggle state from react stately and uh, then spread this input props uh, which has like on change on press and accessibility state so depending on the platform it returns if we need on change or on, on press on press works for react native uh, and and on change works on on the web so let's see so we can use like visually hidden that's another component that hides that that particular input box that comes from react aria and then the custom checkbox ui can be used and we just spread that input props that's received from use checkbox and uh, and pass it on input and uh, the same thing also goes on the pressable component in in react native and yeah so it handles like uh, most of the things for accessibility right from say tab uh, like focus ring or handling the keyboard interaction and checkbox is again it's a very simple example it gets really complicated when we have like uh, menu or combo box or uh, radio buttons here is the the source code a very high level source code that this hook provides it takes in all the props and state and also the input ref of the checkbox uh, and then it returns the input props that is actually spread on the uh, on the pressable component if you see it in the last slide pressable spreads input props so all these things are passed back to that particular uh, element pressable and it adds accessibility role and accessibility state uh, which is picked up by react native react native pressable component and on the website uh, so react native aria has a file for use checkbox.feb.js so this is straight away imports react aria's checkbox use checkbox and then exports it uh, the source code of react aria's checkbox is something very similar to this but instead of using react native specific roles we use 
like aria hyphen check then check great so we have a lot more uh, hooks that's available in react native aria another example is use focus ring uh, this adds the the focus ring on on uh, components so when using keyboard and pressing tabs uh, we get the focus ring of the keyboard which is independent of where the mouse cursor is so we can use it like use focus ring and then spread it right away on the pressable component so next we have uh, use hover use hover is similar to use focus ring but yeah this is straight away uh, does the trick of spreading hover props like uh, and all those things which, which makes it like hoverable great uh, so that's then we have use overlay position this places the 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 overlay something like uh, a tooltip or a popover and uh, yeah so we can use overlay position and this takes in the target element and also the overlay element the ref of them, them obviously and uh, then places that gives the props like top left bottom right position of that uh, of, of the placement and it just really works really well so we can use a trigger component and then click on the the button and then it just places that uh, pop over great uh, so that's use overlay pop o uh, use overlay position and then we have uh, more hooks like use combo box, use slider, use menu, use checkbox, use group, use radio, and yeah, switch tooltips and pop over. Great. So this is a joint effort. I would say that that Nishan and team they have like worked on something on the React native side and then mapped back to React Aria for the React uh, system. And yeah, we have uh, put all these things in in. Uh, UI component library uh, on the next version of native base. So native base essentially is mobile first uh, accessible components for React Native and web. Uh, this is based on the utility first principles and React Native Aria is used here with with many components of, of native base to make it accessible and also to make it work on all the platforms. So native base components works on iOS, Android, and web. And it also behaves natively, like with tabs, with uh, hover, and a lot of platform level things. Uh, yeah, so the checkbox example that we had in the earlier slides is actually available in native base, and we can uh, go ahead and use it. And yeah, here is another example that uh, is to create uh, a, a menu component. It's uh, really hard to make menus uh, accessible, like pressing enter or space opens up the menu and then using the cursor it goes. So let's see that example how this is done. So we can, yeah, we can press enter and then type even like R, M and, and all those things to filter out or hover that particular menu. So let's see it again, enter and then down and then we can type R and then M and it takes us there. This is. This is what we developers do most of the time, isn't it? And uh, the same thing works for uh, for screen readers uh, on, on different platforms. So this is an example of Android. Uh, let's see that. I hope you can hear it. Tapped. No options menu button. Pop-up window. Menu item aerial. Menu item Tahoma disable. Menu item Roboto. Expo go. No options menu button. Great. So yeah, that those were like few of the examples from React Native Aria being used in native base. And this is the team. They have worked really hard on building uh, React Native Aria plus native base. And yeah, it's open source. Go ahead and try to use it. Uh, all ears on the feedback. Uh, yeah, the team is trying to build it like compatible for all the platforms. It's a hard problem to solve, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, let's see how far we go. Uh, that's all from my side. Yeah, there are a few projects that you would like to check from the same team. Uh, from the, there's a state management library called Sync State. Then we have React Pluggable, a form library using MST, FormST, and then uh, BuilderX. That's a design tool that codes. And yeah, API Beats 
Great. So uh, that's all from me. I'm uh, Sanket, and go ahead on uh, and uh, let's let's connect on Twitter. My DMs are open. Yeah, that's all for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanket, for this talk. And once again, I'm really happy that you are working on something like this. I understand that sometimes these are not the most important or hottest topics, but are very needed for our community uh, to use. Now, we had four talks in this panel and seven in total so far, so I feel like this is a good moment to make half an hour break. So, you can take this time for whatever you want, from refueling your um, whatever you are having in your Mac right now, or just socializing with other attendees on our Discord channel, which is, I guess, the most important and fun part. You can also ask questions to our speakers. They are on our Discord channel, so some of the questions can be addressed right now. The rest will be addressed on our React Native Show podcast. So, we'll see each other in half an hour and have a good break. This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts. Hello, I'm Mike, CTO and co-founder at Colstack, and today I'm looking for the best React Native developers to join my team. Besides working on high-end software used by millions, we also contribute to many open source projects such as React Native Paper, React Native Testing Library, or Repack. And so you will have an opportunity to develop your skills and knowledge within these projects as well as move your own ideas into life by taking part in our R&D program. We are a great team full of people crazy about React Native technology and we can't wait to share our knowledge and description with you. Trust me, it's great to be part of such a team. So don't wait anymore, join us, check out the job description and in the link below and apply and I'm hoping to see you soon in our Colstag office or maybe remotely depending on your location. Bye bye.
Wake up in Wrocław, get up and get at them. React Native EU is on and it's happening. Check in to check up on all of the latest news and strategy. Man, it's kind of the greatest. And welcome to React Native EU 2019. <laughs> Keynotes that unlock a new world of insight. Lightning talks this cutting edge? It really seems so right. Networking with everyone in the React Native community, from the thinkers to the linkers, we're all here in unity. Q&As that dive deep into cold DNA, and it's all covered here in only two days? Especially when it comes to trouble. After the last session, we're gonna party, okay? Drinks with good vibes and dope karaoke. Hot vibes all around. It was good to be here. Can't wait till the next one. We'll see you next year. Hi, it's me again. We just wrapped up our second session today and we heard from amazing speakers like Ola, Satya, Truls and Sanket, two of which are actually my colleagues from Colstack and I'm really proud of you uh, that you gave such an amazing talks. Uh, and actually, if any of you want to join team at Colstack, go to our website and find out more there. We are constantly looking for new employees, for new uh, React Native developers. Uh, and while you're there, you can check out our blog. We publish a lot of cool technical stuff. We have a React Native show, which is a podcast, and we have a lot of um, conference talks and other video material on our YouTube channel, Colstack Engineers. And uh, yeah, you can also do, go to our Discord channel. Uh, we have a networking session right now uh, where uh, we can discuss all the talks that are happening today. Uh, and also you can ask questions that will be answered in the dedicated React Native show episode. Uh, also, please go to Twitter right now and tweet React Native EU hashtag so that you can let everybody know that you are having a great time with us today. Okay, it's enough of me talking. I'm going to grab some lunch and I encourage you to do the same. Uh, we'll see each other here again in 20 something minutes. Don't miss out on our next bunch of talks that we have prepared for you.
This conference is brought to you by CodeStack, React and React Native development experts. This conference is brought to you by CodeStack, React and React Native development experts. Hello, I'm Mike, CTO and co-founder at Colstack, and today I'm looking for the best React Native developers to join my team. Besides working on high-end software used by millions, we also contribute to many open source projects such as React Native Paper, React Native Testing Library, or Repack. And so you will have an opportunity to develop your skills and knowledge within these projects, as well as move your own ideas into life by taking part in our R&D program. We are a great team full of people crazy about React Native technology, and we can't wait to share our knowledge and description with you. Trust me, it's great to be part of such a team. So don't wait anymore, join us, check out the job description and in the link below and apply and I'm hoping to see you soon in our Colstag office or maybe remotely depending on your location. Bye bye.
Wake up in Wrocław? Get up and get at them. React Native EU is on and it's happening. Check in to check up on all of the latest news and strategy. Man, it's kind of the greatest. Welcome to React Native EU 2019. <laughs> Keynotes that unlock a new world of insight. Lightning talks this cutting edge? It really seems so right. Networking with everyone in the React Native community, from the thinkers to the linkers, we're all here in unity. Q&As that dive deep into cold DNA, and it's all covered here in only two days? Especially when it comes to trouble. After the last session, we're gonna party, okay? Food, drinks with good vibes and dope karaoke. Hot fives all around, it was good to be here. Can't wait till the next one. We'll see you next year.
This conference is brought to you by CodeStack, React and React Native development experts. Welcome back after break. Uh, for me, it's been lunch break, so I feel like I got a lot of power to guide you through the next panel of talks, which is going to be the last one today, but equally exciting. So we got four talks uh, in front of us. So let's fasten your seatbelts and let's get started. Uh, our first speaker, Milka, she's going to talk about um, the journey of going native from React. So uh, I guess this is an important talk to all of you that are React developers right now and are interested about React Native and want to start developing React Native or native apps in general. So if you are about to do that step or maybe you have already completed your journey from React to React Native, you will feel like this talk is going to probably have a lot in common with your experiences. So let's, let's, let's see how she did her journey and how she transitioned from React to React Native and how we can benefit from her experience to maybe potentially make this journey faster for ourselves as well in the future. Hi everyone, my name is Milica and today I'm going to talk about React developers in the wild world of native apps. A little bit about me, I'm a software engineer with experience working on React and React native application. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as Melikod. I'm working in a company, Badensoft, in Serbia, located in a city niche with a strong tradition in engineering and technology. And in one of our projects, we need a mobile application for iOS and Android, and we chose to go with React Native because the faster development you have, you will go to single code base for two applications, both iOS and Android, but it also has one more advantage, and that is the usage of React with all of its benefits, including the wide community of web developers. However, it's a whole new world because the mobile development is totally different adventure. So in this talk, I would like to go over all the differences, challenges and advantages to keep in mind when diving into the native app universe. Let's start. Starting with React Native comes naturally for React developers. Because of all of its similarities you have, you will still use components as a building blocks, you still have state and props, you will still use JSX, and you have the state management, so you can use Redux or Context API. But when you start going deeper, we can see more differences and challenges we have to learn. And you will see that the mobile world is a completely whole new world and a whole new adventure. So let's start with that adventure. The first one is go for web development, you only need a browser. For mobile development, you will require to run your code on some sort of mobile device. For web, you're familiar with the browser, it's easy to just open a browser and start developing and testing. But when it comes to native developers, you must always think about the platform, iOS and Android. You can use Android emulator, which you can do download from the Android Studio, or iOS simulator, which you can use from the Xcode. So, Simulators are good when it comes to testing or building application, but we have some cases in our projects when our feature we are developing and testing on the simulator and emulator and everything was working fine. But when we start testing on the real device, we will see that not everything goes smoothly. So because the simulation can never replicate 100% of the hardware on the real device. So you can find your application working without any error on the simulator and having trouble with an actual device. So my advice is that I can give you is to always test your application on real devices through the development process, especially if you want to release on both iOS and Android. So the next difference you can see is styling. Uh, styling on the web, you will use the CSS. You have a class name that is associated with the DOM element. The CSS will target the, uh, that element with the class name and assign a set of properties and values to the associated element. On the React Native, React Native does not use CSS in styling. Styling in React Native is done using the JavaScript. Since React components have support for the style property, you can also create an object of style values and pass them on the component as props. 
and the style names works exactly the same name as in the CSS, except they're writing in camel case. But don't worry, Flexbox is still here. For example, Flexbox will work the same way in the CSS with a few exceptions. The flex direction is defaulting to the column instead of the row and the flex is only support a single number as a parameter. And under the hood, Flexbox is implemented with the yoke. And one more thing about styling is you can use the popular CSS in JS library and that is style components. Style components allows you to write an actual CSS code to style your components and benefits of using style components are that you will have CSS syntax out of the box, you can use dynamic styling, you can use theming and with style components you can also support more complex styles like transform which is really great so if you're familiar with style components and you can use it on the web before my advice is to go for it and let's talk let's talk about one more big difference and that is navigation in the browser world you will have the url you will have a current page you will have to go back with the back button and you, if you're using React on the web, you'll probably use React Router. In the uh, React Native, uh, React Router has still support for, for the navigation, but you can use libraries like uh, React Navigation or React Native uh, Navigation. And um, having pages and going back on uh, history is not situation on the native world, and you must always have that in mind. In the native world, we have screens instead of the navigation between them. And uh, for navigation between screens, you, we will use the patterns like tab navigation, stack navigation, and back stack. And navigation works like you're having uh, different decks of cards where cards are screen. So you will define different decks of screens for each purpose. And this is because the user could add or go back to a previous screen. It's important to note that on, on native, you start from the first screen, in the deck and when you add screen it goes to the top of your deck when you go back it goes off the top of the deck as well and this means that the first screen is loaded on the background till you dismiss stack or go back so have that in mind always you're not using pages you're using screens and the navigation is really different you can always associate your navigation to the decks as I described so have that in mind the next one I want to talk about is the platform specific code. So unlike React, React Native others the needs to write a different code on different platforms and build application that follow a platform specific UI and UX guidelines. So React Native offers uh, two alternative ways to build a cloud platform application more efficiently. The first one is platform module. So React Native provides a module called platform to detect which platform or which version of platform we are developing on Android, the application is currently running. So this is especially useful when you're using a component that contains a small parts of the platform specific uh, code. And you can import the platform from React Native and set some kind of condition to check that if uh, you're using the iOS or Android. And the um, second way to check is platform specific extensions. So React Native will load the matching files for a specific platform by automatically detecting whether the file you're working on has iOS or Android.js extensions. And this way uh, you can be sure that each time you're coding for iOS or Android, React Native will always import the correct required component. And have that always in mind. The next thing I want to talk about is React Native application state. And this is one more thing you don't have to worry about on the web. And that is important to think about when you're working with mobile application, and that is application state. Because user can have application in the background or use it uh, in the foreground. And this is very important because you don't want a user putting your application in the background. And when it comes back to you want to show something or to update your state, and users back and forth on your application is very common and you must always think about that. Uh, you can use application stats from React Native, so it can tell you if your application is on the foreground or background and notify you when state change. So with app navigation from React Native, you will have the three states. The 
active when the application is running in the foreground, the background where the application is running in the background and the user is either in another application on the home screen or on another activity. And you will have the inactive when the state occurs when transitioning between foreground and background and during the periods of inactivity, uh, maybe some multitasking view or some incoming call. So always have that in mind when developing your application to check the application state and to check if your application is in the user foreground and background. This comes really handy. The next thing I want to talk about is the native features. There are many native features mobile has to offer like push notification and camera. On the web, too many of those are not used so often, but when building an application, you must think of when you want to ask user permissions for those or how to handle those permissions for future on your applications. For example, when um, you're asking for user permissions for the camera in order to update the, their profile pictures, you will uh, have to check every time uh, for user for permission because user may have pressed or not give the permissions. So think that uh, think about that as well. And uh, next thing I would like to talk about is the network. Uh, when we are talking about the mobile devices, your connections may be slow, unreliable, or non-existent, and you must build your software to support these cases, beginning with connectivity prompts and including offline methods such as caching. So be prepared for the possibility of the connections breaking in the middle of network activity. So the great user experience is that you will always show in your application some sort of the text message and maybe icon or some sort of offline screen that is showing that uh, your uh, connectivity is bad or non-existent, that you're offline and you have that to show your user that the application maybe does not working as well because you don't have the connectivity great. So think about that as well. And when you're talking about network, I want to think I want you to check out is the package uh, net info. The package provides information about the user's active network connections and connectivity status of their mobile devices. It also identifies the user current network type such uh, Wi-Fi. Um, and the, we, we are using the NetInfo packages uh, in our application to check the network type. So you can check it out and use it in those cases when you want to check the, the network on, on your application and to everything runs really good. So the next thing I want to talk about is sharing code. So if you're building both web and uh, mobile application, you can leverage some of the code reuse. So if you're converting a React Native application to React, you can use a React Native web to bring a mobile application to the browser. It will require some significant modification to perfect your port as well and some adjustments for the user interface. And there's also another way of sharing and using code in that you can build your application and share code uh, and share logics between web and mobile, React and React Native. And you can build the, the components uh, independently of the platform. And so think about that as well. Uh, that is one of the way uh, so, so you can uh, reshare share your code on reuse your code and talk about sharing code. I have to mention the monorepo. Monorepo allows you to have the multiple projects and share common dependencies instead of installing the dependencies for each of them. And this also simplifies sharing code between your projects, allowing you to import code from one package to another. And you might want to have a monorepo containing a website, a mobile application, and some shared code between them. And one of the most popular options to do that is to use the Yarn workspaces. And talking about monorepo, I want to mention one more thing to check out, and that is Lerna. Lerna is a tool for managing JavaScript projects with multiple packages. So my recommendation is to check it out. We use it in our application when we want to 
have multiple packages and uh, to share code between uh, web and mobile applications. So it's great thing to check it out also. And talking about when and mobile, one more thing I want to talk about is testing. So uh, programmers and developers are also humans and humans make mistakes and testing is important because it helps you to uncover these mistakes and verify that your code is working. It also gives you confidence that your application is working and it will work in the, the production, your code is working, your components are good. And when you're writing tests, test uh, the default template of react native ships is just so if you use testing before on the web you will probably use just so that things is simil similar and doesn't change and when you're testing with just i have to recommend some libraries for writing uh, the unit test of your react native application that is libraries like test renderer or react native testing library those two are really great libraries and you can check out and see what is working uh, for your application. So always have in mind testing also. And uh, one difference about I want to talk about is debugging. So for debugging, you can use the Chrome developer tools to debug your JavaScript code in Chrome. So that thing is not different from the web. That is like you're common to debugging in the browser, so everything is fine. But one thing I want you to uh, check out is the Flipper. Flipper is extensible mobile application debugger. Flipper is a platform for debugging iOS and Android and React Native application. It can help you to visualize, inspect, and control your application from a simple desktop interface. So I strongly recommend a Flipper for mobile developers. With Flipper, you will also also inherit the plugin ecosystem that exists uh, for native Android and iOS applications. This means that you will be able to use plugins that are aimed for native apps for your native app as well. Like you will have uh, plugins will include the device logs, the device crash report. Something that was really useful in our application is to inspect the network request. That is like really great. So um, one more thing you can check out is the device perform preferences. You can check the cached images. You can inspect native layout elements. And my strong recommendations is to use the, the flipper. It really helped us in our application as well. And one of the biggest changes when, when, we, are, when we are going from web to, uh, to native is the <coughs> deployment. On the React Native side, we are using the native way of uh, deploying applications. So remember that React Native is only a tool for writing uh, native apps. You will have to build and upload your build for uh, if you're using iOS to App Store, if, uh, for Google to Google Play Store, and for Huawei to App Gallery. So after your build is uploaded, for example, Apple will run some automated tests on your application for basic info provided for the App Store and let, let you know if there are some issues. And after this, everything is okay. Um, you can use application with other uh, developers through a program. Apple provides a test flight. And test flight is the way to send your application somewhere for testing without a plugin device on your machine. And test flight really comes useful when it comes to the better programs and better testing your application. And it's very important to know that each uh, deployment will need to pass some validation from Apple that uh, will take some days in order for your release to be available and to end user to go through testing phase. And for Google, you will use the Google Play console to publish your applications and maybe games for the Google Play. Uh, so, yes, and one more thing to uh, also mention here is the code push. Code push is part of the App Center, and Code push is in the App Center cloud service that enable the React Native developers to deploy mobile applications and updates directly to user devices. So if you have some cases when your tester needs a bug fix really fast and you don't want to wait for the build and everything, you can push it directly using the code push and your tester can, 
get jacket directly so Corpus is really great and I strongly recommend you to, to check it. So that will be it. Um, overall, yeah, I strongly recommend for all the, all the React developers who are thinking about going on the mobile and the native to go with React Native to dive deep into the, the native world and uh, so that's all for me. Thank you all. If you want to contact me, you can use uh, Twitter and Instagram. So that's all. Bye. Thank you, Milika, for this talk. Uh, it's always great to listen how people are moving from React to React Native. At Callstack, we are also looking for React developers and we kind of do the same steps for them as well with them together. And we, I, I feel like part of great um, like one of the great things about React Native is that it lets you actually build mobile apps as a React developer. That's how I started on Android myself, for example. Now, moving on, another speaker, John from Expo, is going to talk about Expo features and how you can benefit from it, but these features are going to be different from what we usually hear. Normally, we talk about Expo when we think about, you know, just getting started. Sometimes we may even talk about Expo being good for beginners or having just great set of libraries and features to make you build your application faster. But there is also another dimension of features that you may be interested about, which is about configuring your project, set, sharing it with your team members, submitting it to the App Store, and generally speaking, managing all the things that are not related to coding itself. So as you can see, Expo has a lot of interesting offerings for you related to the DevOps and management of the application as well. Uh, that go beyond the libraries that they have in their Expo SDK. So let's learn about what John has to say today about these features and how we can take advantage of that with our daily projects. Hey everyone, my name is John Samp and I'm a software developer at Expo. And today I want to talk about how to iterate faster with Expo. I started thinking of this idea because of an app that I use named Tweetbot. This is an app that shows you your Twitter timeline with a nicer design and a bunch of other features that I find really nice and convenient. I've been using this app since the early days, and it used to look like this. This design is really something and a relic of a past time that I think is really cool. I love the skeuomorphic icons and I like the glow around the different elements, but I know I can confidently say that if I were to ship an app that looked like this today, my users might think it's old or antique. So Tweetbot also had to update the look and feel of their app. If you remember when iOS 7 came out, they introduced this design language of really thin line icons and everything being very flat. And so Tweetbot followed suit. And just like that, they also made a very current version of this app that looks a little different, that has some of those same elements from Tweetbot 3 that has those thin line icons. But now the icons are a little bit thicker and things still look clean. We've got soft shadows, which is like something that's very in design right now. And looking at the spread of these different designs, it got me to realize that Tweetbot has to change to match what its users expect and what the current design language and philosophy looks like today. And they've really had to iterate a lot. They've had to take these features and change what they look like constantly. This means that the first version of our apps can never be the final version of our apps. It would be so nice just to design something and to build something and have it be done, but that's not really how apps work. They're living, they have to change, and they have to evolve. So to allow our apps to do this, what we really need to do is we must embrace iteration. And we must think about how our apps can change over time to better match what our users want. So let's talk about what iteration looks like in a React Native app. Here's what I think it looks like. First, you start with requirements, what your app should actually do. After that, there's the implementation of those requirements. Then you review that your implementation actually fits the requirements. Then you would make a build of your app. You'd submit it to app stores. And then once users have it, they're going to tell you things that are wrong and things that could be done better. So you're going to be fixing bugs and adding more features and making new requirements. And then this whole cycle starts over again. So usually we can get this circle spinning somewhat and hopefully at a good clip. But what if we could make this circle go even faster? I think we can do that with tools that Expo provides. So let's start with the first thing in this wheel, which is requirements. And so together today, we're gonna build an app together. And this app is gonna be a coffee app. So let's brew a coffee app together.
so let's talk about the requirements we need to implement to make a great coffee app. The first one is we need to know the amount of water we need to the amount of coffee we need when making a pour over coffee. And we can measure that with a scale. Usually a great ratio is 16 to one. So 16 units of water to one unit of coffee. One thing that's kind of hard to do in the morning, especially when you're feeling a little groggy, is trying to say, okay, I've got 27 grams of coffee. All right, what is 27 times 16 so I can figure out the amount of water? So that's one problem and one requirement we will have for our coffee app. The second requirement is around pulse pouring. So pulse pouring is pouring a certain amount during a certain duration during the brew. And usually you'll pulse pour three to maybe six times throughout the brewing process. So our app should also count down and guide us through the brew and tell us how much to pour and when. So those are our requirements that we're gonna to implement today. The next step is implementation of our app. The first thing to implement our app is to start an app. We can do that by installing Expo CLI globally with an npm install global command. After we do that, we can run Expo init coffee app. This is going to result in a folder structure that looks like this on our computer. On the left, you can see the directories that Expo init made, and this is exactly what happens right after running Expo init. We've got an app.tsx file, a few assets, and just a couple other standard files in our project directory. Notice that there isn't an iOS and an Android folder full of native code. Expo is able to handle that stuff for us, which can make our implementation much simpler. And then later down the line, if we need native code or custom native modules, we can always add them. Next up, we wanna start our app, which we can do with yarn start. And through the prompts, we can open up an Android emulator and an iOS simulator to let us preview in real time the changes that we're making to our app.tsx. Now, one thing that would make this a little bit better, and one problem I've had in the past, is when I'm developing something in a simulator and then I actually open it on my phone after building it and getting it onto my device, is that sometimes it appears a little bit differently. So it would be great if I could actually see the app on my phone right now. And Expo allows us to do this. And to me, this is such a big step in iteration during development. You can download the Expo Go app. And then when you run the yarn start from the command that we did earlier, you can use your camera app to scan that QR code, which is going to open up your app, a development version of your app inside of Expo Go. Once it's in Expo Go and you make a change to app.tsx, you'll see it appear almost instantly on your actual device. What a wonderful way to test the stuff that you're actually using and the stuff that you're actually developing. So I should mention, we've been talking about Expo a lot. I work at Expo. So what is Expo exactly? Expo is a company that builds free open source tools and also hosted services that help you build an application with React Native. And it might be helpful to talk about what is React Native exactly and what is Expo exactly. So here on the left, React Native is a set of component APIs. I think its main job is to render JSX from React into native views on Android, iOS, and also the web. It comes along with a small, unopinionated core. It's got great third-party libraries that you can plug in, but it doesn't come with a lot of the extra stuff you need to build a full application. And that's where Expo comes in. Expo provides a component SDK, tools like Expo Go, like we just showed you, and also services to build, submit, and update your app. It is powered by React Native and sits on top of it. And hopefully, along with both of these, you can create incredible applications. So at this point, we've got some requirements of what we need to build. It's always great to start with a design. I actually spent a while designing what this app could look like. And I went through a lot of different iterations and I ended up making designs and then implementing them. And this is what they look like. So on the left, I'm implementing requirement number one. I ended up putting a question of how many ounces of coffee would you like to brew first? So you can say, maybe I want 24 ounces. And then below it tells you how much water to heat and how many grams of coffee to grind. On the right, this fulfills requirement number two, which is pulse pouring. Once you tap start, it'll do a countdown timer and then tell you how many grams of water to pour over your coffee and when throughout the entire brew process. This makes every brew really consistent. And if you can replicate a really great process every time, you can wake up with a beautiful cup every morning. Also, when testing this app, it's definitely a caffeinating process. Uh, you could say I was maybe a little bit shaky after all of this. 
So the next step is how do we review our app now that it's built? How do we make sure that the requirements are actually implemented? And this is a problem. I can test it myself and think like, okay, this is looking good, but how can I let my teammates and my colleagues try this? If I wanted to do this manually, what I'd probably do is create an ad hoc archive, at least for the iOS side. I would add the allowed devices through the Apple developer UI, and I would also then build an APK for my Android users. After that, I would have to make builds of my app, and then I would have to distribute them, either by giving my team download links or distributing them via the Play Store internal track or via test flight for iOS. But there's a better way to do this, and we can distribute our app faster to our teammates with this solution, which is called internal distribution. If we let Expo handle our credentials and the whole process of this, and Expo can also build our app, we can distribute it to our team even faster. Let's look at how this works. So the first thing we need to do is install something called EAS CLI, which stands for Expo Application Services. And EAS is the services part of Expo that will help set up your app for internal distribution. The next command to run is EAS device create. And this is going to add a device to your credentials that we will then manage for you. So every time you make a build, you can say, okay, I've set up this device previously. Make sure that this build is built for that device that I set up, that I actually connected to the provisioning profile is what it's called. After that, I can run a command called EAS build profile internal. And this is going to create two different builds for me that are set up to work with those credentials, which enables me after these builds are done to do something like this, where I can just send a link to someone and say, hey, try my app and then go to this link and then download the app that I just built and they can sideload it on their phone. So what this whole process looks like is registering a device, then making a build, and then you can send a link to download. And that makes this whole process much faster and allows people on your team to try your stuff faster. And if you can try something faster, you might try more features. You might try stuff that you wouldn't try before. And this iteration is gonna help us make an awesome app. Now we can automate this process even further by setting up a CI action. Expo has something called the Expo GitHub action. And we could make a CI action that looks sort of like this, where we set up EAS to build every time we merge our code into the main branch. Our Expo action will install our CLIs and we'll, we can then install our dependencies. And then we can say, let's build for all of our platforms and then also build the internal builds. So every single time someone merges to main, we can go and test our changes. Now, there might be an even faster way to test our changes, which is using Expo Go and publishing our app with updates. So how does this work? We can do something called Expo Publish on our app locally. And when that occurs, we build a bundle of all of the JavaScript code and all of the assets in your app. And we make that into an update bundle that is stored on Expo servers. Then when you open up Expo Go, you can see I have this coffee app. And if I click on this thing that says default right here, it's going to open up that coffee app in Expo Go itself. So anytime I have a change, I can run Expo Publish. And then that change will be visible right here in the app without me needing to download another build. Anyone in your organization that's logged into Expo Go can access that app, which makes it super fast to share the experiences that you're developing. And we can make this even faster, just like before, by using that same CI action that we showed previously, but this time using Expo Publish. So that makes that iteration cycle super fast. And it also, after we've tested it with our colleagues and our team, means we're ready to build our app for the app stores. So the problem that we want to solve is how can we distribute our apps easily to the app stores? It's all built now. We've reviewed it. It's ready to go. What steps do we have to take? Hopefully not that many. If we were to do this manually, at least for iOS, we'd want to enable the app transport security. We'd have to configure the release scheme, and then we'd have to build the app locally for release. And that is a lot of steps and a lot of configuration you have to deal with. Instead, we could use EAS, our Expo's application services, to do this for you and your team and in the cloud, which will hopefully make it an even easier process and one where you don't have to set up everyone's computers identically to make this happen. So let's look at the steps to do this. We can use EAS build and then pass in a profile called release, which is set up when you run EAS build. And that's going to create two apps for us, one optimized for the iOS app store and another one for the Android app store or Google Play. Then on our website, we can see some UI 
where you can see all the builds that have ever been made for your app. You can download that build and you can also submit that build, which is the next step of our process. If you were to submit manually, we would have to, at least for Android, download the .aab file and then open up the Play Store console and drag and drop that thing in there. And then we have to wait for it to upload, make sure that everything is good. Same for iOS, we'd have to download the .ipa file and then we'd probably open up a program like the Transporter app and then we'd have to drag and drop that in there and wait for it to upload and see if any logs. These are just manual steps that we have to do. You could automate this, um, but it would take some extra work. So instead, EAS provides a command called EAS submit. And we've actually set up this automation for you already so you don't have to deal with this process yourself. And you can take builds that you've made with EAS and then run EAS submit and you can say, take the latest build that I've built. And then it will take that build and we will update or submit it to the app stores for you. This is super convenient and makes building and submitting to the stores really quick and it really speeds up our iteration cycle for those two steps of the iteration process. So our app is now out in the store and we've actually found a bug or let's at least pretend that we did. Um, a popular way to brew coffee is using something called an AeroPress. But let's say that instead of writing AeroPress, we accidentally wrote Sparrow Dress instead. So if I wanted to fix this bug in production, which is a pretty blatant bug, I would need to rebuild my apps, I would need to resubmit them to the app stores, and then I would need to wait for my users to download that new version. Instead, we can use Expo updates to help you provide small fixes between builds like this. So let's look at how this works. Expo Publish ends up making an update, and an update is a bundle of code that's JavaScript and also the assets from our app. So in order to fix this Sparrow Dress problem, we would go into our app and then we would fix the Sparrow Dress to say AeroPress. Once that code change has been made, we could run a command like Expo Publish. And in the command line, you're gonna see that it builds the app, at least all of the JavaScript and all the assets into what we would call an update bundle. And then that gets uploaded to Expo servers. So once we have the new update on our servers, it becomes available to users. And it's important to think about what users have in their app. So essentially apps are built into two parts. One part is this native code that's built into the app binary. And the native code is stuff that you can't change with an over the air update. This is stuff like the app's icon and some of the configuration about how the app runs. But then there's the second side of the app, which is this JS code and this update code that we're able to interchange with other updates. So if I'm a user using an Expo app and I open my app, there's a module that's going to query our servers and say, is there any new updates? And if there is, then we're going to look for any new updates based on a configuration inside of that app.json file that we saw when we set up our project. This makes it so if you have critical bug fixes and things that you need to get out to users right away, you can do that with Expo Publish. So in this case, if I ran Expo Publish with this arrow press fix, then my users would open up their app, they would download that new code, and then they would see the typo fixed. It is at that point that I could start making new builds and then submit them to the App Store to get review. Now, there are a lot of different options that we can opt into with Expo updates. Let's look at those. Okay, so I'm here in the Expo documentation, and inside of app.json, there is an updates configuration, which I can see here on the left. There are three different configurations I could configure, which is whether they are enabled or not, when to check automatically, the different options are on load or on error recovery. On load is the default here, so when users force close their app and then open their app, it's going to check for an update. But probably the most important one is this fallback to cache timeout. This is saying how long should we wait before launching your app while we download the new update if there is a new update. So if this AeroPress update was actually like really large and it took people a while to download or if they're on a very slow connection, we could cap it at 30 seconds or three seconds or something. And if they don't download the update within that time frame, then they will fall back to the cache version of their app that's already downloaded on their phone. We want to make sure that users can always get their app so that they don't get stalled on that splash screen. 
Now, there is sort of a trick here. By default, we set this fallback to cache timeout to zero, which means we won't wait at all for any new updates, which means if we push an update out to a user and they open their app, it's not going to wait for the new update to download, and it's actually going to download in the background while they continue using the app. Then the second time that they open their app, it's going to load the update that was downloaded in the background the last time they used the app. This is preferable for some developers, but it's also might be preferable for you to let users wait a couple of seconds to download the new update so that they can get those new updates even faster. So it's just good to know about the different configurations we can set with updates. So this is a lot of stuff that you can do with Expo, and there's a lot more configuration to all of this stuff that I haven't talked about yet. But I do want to mention just quickly some of the recent updates and things that have been going on ex at Expo in case that you've used Expo before. So one awesome change that we've come out with this year with EIS is that you can build an app with any native code. You can add native modules like Bluetooth, or you can also add in-app purchases or things like a blur hash module that will allow you to uh, add in like a native module that like blurs out your images as placeholders. There's tons of these and you can add codes like this and we will still build your app for you. And that is now possible. We also have something called custom dev clients. Before I showed Expo Go, and Expo Go works great if you're not using any custom native code. If you are using your own custom native code, you can make your own version of the Expo Go app and still get all of those niceties around opening up updates on your phone. And also your colleagues can do this too. And finally, we're coming out with a service that updates our, our updates called EAS Update, and this is incoming. This fall and early spring, we'll be rolling this out. So keep an eye out for that. You're going to be able to do things like roll out updates to your users and see exactly which builds are pointed at which updates at all times. So the point is, let's iterate together and figure out how to iterate faster. Expo allows you to do this in development by implementing an app without requiring knowledge of your native code. You can also review your work faster with internal distribution or with Expo Go. And you can build and submit your apps in lightning speed in the cloud and make it consistent across all of your teammates. Finally, you can fix critical bugs with updates, which helps you fix things that might have slipped through the review process. Which means, hey, it's coffee time. So if you haven't had a coffee today and you like coffee, please have one. I would love to have one with you next time we can have something in person. Uh, hit me up. I'm always free and available. And thank you so much for iterating with me and listening to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it and can take some of these concepts into your work life and into the projects that you build in the future. Let me know if you have any questions and we can't wait to see what you build with React Native and with Expo. Thank you, John, for this talk. And um, I'm really happy to see that Expo is you know, developing quite rapidly and has more and more features these days. Uh, so I keep my fingers crossed for your future developments because I know that your roadmap is pretty ambitious. Now, moving on to the next speaker, Shivai. And uh, he's going to talk about machine learning with React Native using MediaPipe and TF Lite. Now, these are like mysterious keywords to me, so I'm not going to be introducing you much to this talk because I guess machine learning with React Native is all we need to know and we will learn more from this talk. Uh, what's interesting is that they know how to build that machine learning experience in a cross-platform way that works nicely on low-power devices. So let's see what he has prepared for us today. Hello, everyone. I'm Shwai Lamba. Currently, a Google Chrome Code Mentor at MediaPipe and TensorFlow and a Developer Advocate at Fabrica. I'm really excited to be presenting at React Native EUCon 2021. And the topic of my presentation is Machine Learning with React Native using MediaPipe and TF Lite. So we'll be going over what exactly is machine learning and how can we integrate it with React Native and what exactly are MediaPipe and TF Lite. So without wasting for further time, let's get started. Now. Of course, we all know that how incredible machine learning is. Probably each and every different aspect of life that we see, whether it's some kind of an industry, healthcare, medicine, is today utilizing machine learning. And machine learning in mobile devices is something that is gaining a lot of attention today because a lot of the different applications and processes are happening with the help of smartphones and websites. 
and it becomes imperative to also be able to include machine learning within mobile devices. Now, generally, mobile devices are having lower end processors as compared to, let's say, standard computers and servers. Therefore, there is a need to be able to actually run uh, machine learning models on lower end devices. And that does require you to have specific changes be made to your machine learning models or support for running these machine learning models on these devices. And uh, we can also uh, have on device machine learning for faster processing. So uh, removing the need to actually connect to a machine learning model that might be hosted on a separate server or on a cloud, which can result in increase in the latency uh, that can be covered up or that can be reduced by actually introducing the machine learning to take place on the device itself as the processors of uh, the various devices and um, as the machine learning application and the models themselves are becoming more compact and becoming easier to run uh, by increasing their performance and reducing the overall uh, you could say processing that they actually require. So both of these different techniques is actually helping us out to do a lot of different things like on device uh, translation of languages on device classification of images being able to detect different things and do a lot of different uh, on device algorithms that can run machine learning algorithms can, that can run on mobile devices and that is making machine learning really uh, you could say accessible on these mobile devices as well now We'll be talking about a few different solutions that are there and we'll be looking at how can we integrate the two different methods that is either media pipe and TF flight both for uh, react native applications. Now let's take a look at this particular slide and let's see like, okay, from all these different images, what are all of these different images having something in common? So you see an Android picture with face detection, you see an iPhone XR showing you poses and basically landmarks of your hand. You see the web where you can see the different kind of effects happening on uh, this girl. Then we have Raspberry Pi and we have uh, basically the webcams and uh, all of them are having something in common. And that something in common is that they are all having different applications of machine learning and that is being powered by one technology. And that technology is MediaPipe. MediaPipe is an open source uh, cross-platform framework that is provided by Google that helps to build uh, perception pipelines or we can also say that they actually help us to build a lot of different audio, visual and video based uh, pipelines. And it is widely used within Google for a lot of its research and products and uh, probably till uh, 2018 it was internally used by Google and not really known by a lot of people but after having been introduced uh, and open sourced in 2019 now it is being widely used to also do a lot of different machine learning implementations and pipelines built around video, audio and sensor data. So it can be used to basically do data preparation pipelines for machine learning training, or it can also be used for doing ML inference pipelines. We'll be also looking at a lot of different examples on how it is being actually used. And uh, that will give a better perspective of why machine learning using MediaPipe and being able to integrate it is really popular and useful. Now, some of the uh, features that are actually provided with MediaPipe, uh, it first of all, helps us to actually include end-to-end -end acceleration. Uh, that means that whatever uh, acceleration is required for uh, the machine learning models to actually work, that is provided by the uh, on-device support that is, you know, there uh, when we are actually implementing MediaPipe on the uh, mobile devices. Now, you just need to build it once and it can be deployed at multiple places. So um, if you are creating a MediaPipe based machine learning solution, uh, you don't need to just, you know, it's not just okay that it will be limited to mobile devices. It can also be used for the web, for Python and for other places as well. So you just need to create one MediaPipe solution that can be deployed to various uh, places. And uh, these are completely ready to use solutions. Uh, there's no requirement to actually write post uh, code for doing things like object detection, face uh, recognition, and the solution itself will be provided to you with the help of uh, the MediaPipe solutions that we are building. And it's completely open source as well. 
Now, taking a look at some of the popular solutions, uh, we'll, you'll see selfie segmentation that allows you to basically run segmentation masks that allows you to uh, recognize the humans uh, and their faces uh, in the current window. And that will help you to basically do things like changing your background that also we see in things like Google Meet or Zoom. Then you have face mesh. Uh, now face mesh, uh, basically points out 468 different landmarks on your entire face and uh, this can be used for a lot of different applications like let's say putting up makeup uh, and we'll see a lot of uh, their use cases as well in the coming slides. Then we have hand tracking that basically has 21 different landmarks for tracking different points of your hand. Then we have basically human pose which has total of 33 different poses that you can basically have uh, to do things like let's say exercise monitoring. Then we have hair segmentation that only detects your hair. We have uh, the standard object detection and tracking that can be used to detect certain objects and identify different objects. Then we have face detection. Uh, holistic tracking is basically combining all face mesh, hand tracking and the pose uh, in our right. And uh, you can do a lot of different things with that as well. Let's say create VTubers or, you know, create such kind of animations. Then we can use a 3D object detection also called as a uh, detectron, right? And all of these different solutions are ready-made solutions that are that have been provided by the MediaPipe solutions team. And you can just go to mediapipe.dev and look at one of the solutions and look at their implementations for Python, uh, Java, Android, iOS, uh, web, right? And you can uh, start utilizing these solutions. Now, one of the, again, these are some of the examples where, you know, it is being used right now. So for example, you can see the AR lipstick try on uh, where you can see that uh, it is using the media pipe face mesh model to basically um, detect the lips. And whenever you're putting some kind of an effect, it will be able to actually detect that. Then you can see some uh, of the media pipe being utilized within, uh, you know, YouTube itself. And you can see that being utilized in the AR movie trailer that is, you know, being shown over here uh, on YouTube. And you can see uh, being able to detect uh, things, of, for example, in the lens live uh, living surfaces, then showing augmented faces that again is utilizing the face mesh. And uh, then we have some kind of on device uh, machine learning capabilities that are happening, let's say, with the help of uh, lens translate. All of these are essentially capturing the data that is there on the device itself and you know uh, helping to carry out different kinds of machine learning uh, media pipe based solutions and uh, these are of course just a few of the examples but there are so many different different kind of applications that you can build and that is why media pipe is becoming really popular for creating machine learning based solutions applications on mobile based devices because of its easy integration and uh, really great performance as well now, uh, to just sort of, you know, look at, okay, what are the current, uh, things that have been released, right? So of course, um, before it was released to the public, uh, there was a lot of application of media pipe use cases within, uh, Google, uh, you know, ever since starting in 2012, uh, it was being used a lot in YouTube, uh, whenever there's any kind of a YouTube upload. So the processing in that, uh, in that, and then it is also being used in YouTube stories right now. We actually see it being used in things like nest cam, the security cams. We see it in Google lens, AR ads. Uh, we see it even in, you know, GCP and specifically in the cloud vision API cloud, uh, AI video. So all these are basically different solutions, uh, provided by Google, which does internally use media pipe. And that is why it makes it so versatile across different platforms and not just being limited to mobile devices. And uh, let's take actually an example of one of the live perceptions. So let's say that like what we are trying to get is uh, the hand tracking to actually work with the help of media pipe. Now let's see how does this actually work. So let's say that what we need to do is that we have been given an image of a hand and uh, all the different landmarks, the 22 different landmarks are uh, represented uh, over there inside of the right hand side. So that is our ideal, uh, you know, case that we want to generate the landmarks and then superimpose them with the live footage or the live video that is being represented right now. So what we can do is that 
let's say that this is our uh, you know perception pipeline so the first thing that you'll see is basically your video input which is uh, providing uh, you the live footage of whatever you want to actually track then uh, you'll see the next uh, process taking place which is basically the uh, image transformation which takes in your video input and converts it into a, a relevant size that is required you know by uh, the image processing algorithm and uh, once it has been resized and scaled to a relevant size uh, we are basically converting that image into tensors so since uh, media pipe internally uses a tf light we are basically going, going ahead and converting our image that we get from our video input into tensors now if you are not aware of tensors tensors are essentially these uh, numerical arrays high dimensional arrays that contain uh, values and again uh, these can be used for different kinds of calculations and then from let's say any particular given machine learning model we run the inference on these uh, tensors and uh, we are able to decode information about uh, the tensors and then basically what we do is once we have gotten the information about the tensors we render uh, basically the landmarks on top of these images and then we display the resulting video output that showcases uh, the you know basically this particular like you know the same thing uh, that it renders uh, the landmarks on site on the video that you are showing so basically that is how the inference of any kind of a media by based solution takes place where you give an input and it runs uh, you know the inference on top of it and poses the uh, landmarks based on uh, whatever it is detecting and uh, when you're talking about MediaPipe, uh, if we go a bit deeper into how, you know, MediaPipe actually works. So you might have heard about the graph data structures, right? It's really common. Uh, it's representing various types of edges, vertices, and the flow of information takes place through different, you know, edges and vertices. Similarly, in MediaPipe, we have the MediaPipe graph that uh, is sort of laying down the path of how basically the different um, you know information uh, about let's say the input and the respondent uh, the responding uh, or the relevant output you know is flowing through that media pipe graph uh, essentially we uh, are containing the entire solution when we whenever we're talking about like any kind of a media pipe based solution uh, your input uh, that you're providing or sort of the image that you're providing uh, will be given to the media pipe uh, graph and that information will flow and again we do have these edges and vertices now specifically these vertices that we have they contain uh, configuration information about um, the different aspects about our media pipe solution and these configuration information are essentially you know our calculators now of course we'll be talking a bit about calculators but of course the node of the graph is basically showing us you know that it's the calculator and of course um, the entire media pipe graph is representing the overall flow of how basically the input image is that or the input information that we are receiving how we are able to you know uh, put up the landmarks on top of it and get the resultant output now uh, basically any two uh, nodes are connected by a string which can be you know represented as let's say an edge of a graph which basically carries the packets and these packets are actually containing the information about you know uh, the let's say whether it's the in, uh, input image the tensors or let's say it is providing relevant uh, metadata that will be required for you know further uh, processing and it will contain the timestamps alongside that data now if you talk about the calculators right that are uh, representing the nodes so they have been written in c plus and they declare basically both the input and the output ports that what kind of input do they expect uh, when you know any kind of an input is actually coming to them via the packet and what uh, once that like some kind of processing has been done like what is the expected output that they will be sending to let's say the next node right and uh, they basically implement something called as the open process close methods which basically means that whenever there is an open process happening or an open method that means that the full graph is currently running processes like let's say that whenever some kind of an input uh, packets have arrived at the node they are ready to be processed and closes that after one entire run has completed now it's time to actually close you know uh, the uh, graph 
So that is basically the calculator that is representing at each edge that uh, is responsible for making changes or bringing changes to the input images that are there. And it will help to basically uh, create our process for uh, converting whatever input is into relevant transformations that need to take place. And this becomes part of the calculator. Now, uh, we do also have some inbuilt calculators. Uh, we can create our own calculators. There are a lot of different inbuilt calculators that are used for image, audio, video processing and that are, uh, you know, native with TensorFlow and TF Lite for the ML inference part. Now, now basically, uh, we also have a lot of different uh, calculators for post processing as well. So those have actually been created. Let's say, for example, for selfie segmentation, we have the selfie segmentation calculator and you can also actually go ahead and uh, create your own calculators as well. And finally, basically what we are going to be talking about is the synchronization. And this is really important because all the inputs that we receive inside the calculators and how they are, you know, being processed and they're going outside, we need to make sure that the timestamps are not compromised. If the timestamps are compromised, then it can actually result in erroneous data. And that is why the synchronization is an important aspect of how the media pipe solution actually works. And uh, we can also talk about a subgraph. Basically, a subgraph will be used, you know, whenever uh, we are having to divide our steps into multiple steps. And um, uh, like you could say that a subgraph is a part of the main graph and it can also have its own calculators and be used to basically do one of, uh, you know, the tasks that will be there. So as you can see over here that um, if you have a larger, you know, uh, a larger task to, you know, take place, uh, we can have one subgraph that is dedicated to, let's say, only the hand landmarks. And then let's say one subgraph only for taking, uh, play, for taking care of the pose landmarks. And of course, um, the main aspect of this is that um, the video will be taken in. It will be passed through the hand landmarks and you'll see the rendered image. But of course, uh, there are certain issues that can, you know, take place because, uh, you know, the hand, uh, let's say if you are using a live video, uh, the uh, scale of the hand will change dynamically if let's say you are taking your hand closer or, you know, taking it further away from the video camera. And then let's say it will actually take a lot of uh, capacity from the model to deal with such kind of variations, that, you know, that, you know, takes place. So there are steps that we can take place, you know, to overcome these issues uh, or basically these issues in real time. And that is why like we can also use a lot of different techniques to optimize our performance of our models as well. And uh, if we just look at uh, an overview of how does the media pipe tech stack look like. So at its core, uh, we, as I, we have described that basically we have, you know, we have created this cross platform framework, uh, that has been written in C++ and it has support for interacting with things like TensorFlow, OpenCV. So, uh, it comes in with helper utilities, uh, from, you know, TF Lite, uh, that can be utilized, right? And if you look at, uh, you know, basically how does the entire functioning work? So. At the core level, you have your graphs that are responsible for showing the path of how the packets are, you know, flowing in from various and uh, when how they're being collected at different nodes. Now, these nodes are essentially calculators. And apart from all of these, you do get a certain APIs that help you in your process. One is the graph construction API uh, that will be help, you know, that will be actually helpful for creating a graph for the first time, the calculator API and the graph execution API. All of these different APIs are responsible for helping run your, you know, graphs. And uh, uh, essentially at the top layer is all the different kinds of applications that are possible to run with on, whether it's the desktop, Android, iOS, or let's say even in embedded devices like uh, IoT Core, or let's say, you know, uh, for example, Raspberry Pi. And uh, this sort of shows you a uh, high level uh, overview of how basically the media pipe tech stack goes from, uh, you know, the top to bottom, bottom being at its more raw level. Uh, and that is how sort of, you know, the media pipe applications look like internally. And uh, you can actually go ahead and look at some of, you know, the docs if you actually want to go ahead and understand uh, some of the parameters. And if you want to look at some of the examples for MediaPipe, you can go ahead and actually look at that. Or you can also use the visualization tool for MediaPipe that helps you to see, okay, if you were to build a MediaPipe solution, how would it actually look like? 
Now, we can also take an example of some of these, you know, mobile examples where, for example, we have the hand tracking GPU based, where basically the GPU is powering, you know, uh, the media pipe hand, land, uh, hand tracking. And you can see the visualization that has been built for that and similarly for, you know, uh, the face detection and the object detection. And now talking about TF Lite, right? So TensorFlow Lite is an open source uh, framework that is specifically, you know, used for deep learning. Now it comes or it stems from the main TensorFlow library and it is used for, uh, you know, on device inference. So whenever you want to actually go ahead and do your machine learning uh, and run your machine learning algorithms, doing that inference on device, on your, uh, let's say mobile devices or its devices, uh, it is a really great tool to use. And uh, again, it supports for on-device machine learning. And again, it gives a really high performance. So one of the questions that we before move on to is, uh, we have these two different ways, right? One is a TF Lite and the other is a media pipe. Now, media pipe is generally used mainly for the audio, video, and such kind of streams because you're receiving these uh, media streams and these are the ones that are responsible for you know being uh sort of shown and then being worked upon but tf light uh, allows you to actually convert any kind of a tensorflow based model into a tf light format that can be utilized on your device so of course with tf light you get much more amount of freedom in terms of what kind of models you actually want to run those might not necessarily be in, you know uh, be uh, just audio or video based so uh, for example again uh, with respect to let's say if we were to create like a solution uh, that has been built for the um, uh, for you know the mobile based devices uh, we can use media pipe uh, for things like uh, doing post detection uh, exercise monitoring right audio and video uh, for let's say doing things like facial um, uh, actions uh, you know creating face masks and all so all that can be happen like can be done very easily with the help of uh, uh, with the help of media pipe but of course with tf light you are open to a wide variety of different kinds of models uh, that you can actually run on your mobile device so after having converted a model that has been written let's say in tensorflow in python you can convert it into a corresponding tf light format and that will actually help you to you know run those on uh, react native on mobile based devices and uh, let's actually go ahead and take an example of uh, TF Lite actually being used for doing an image classification problem in React Native. So as you can see from uh, the code, uh, over here in the first, uh, you know, essentially the third line, we are importing the TF Lite React Native package. Now this is an NPM package that has been created for importing the TF Lite, you know, uh, inside of um, React Native. And so we are importing TF Lite uh, using the, uh, you know, basically the NPM module TF Lite React Native. And uh, the idea is that we'll be using the image picker NP module uh, to basically pick any image. And in our React Native application, our machine learning uh, solution will detect what is the class of the image that we are going to be having. So in the line number five, we are just initiating our TF Lite function uh, or, or sort of our object and the method TF Lite. And uh, as you can see over here, we have just provided some initial, uh, you know, uh, sort of declarations that are there to basically do things like height image of our canvas, uh, things like what uh, is, you know, the uh, detection model that we're using. So we are specifically using the Coco SSD mobile net model. Now we also have some other ones as well. We have the YOLO model, we have SSD mobile net, and uh, these are the some of the models that we'll be actually comparing with. So we are having uh, three different types of models that we're going to be using. Then we are setting up our initial state that contains like the model source, what is the image height and what are the recognitions? Because when you're going to be running these machine learning models on top of your image, they are going to be providing you an array of recognitions, but the most recognized one will be selected. So that is what is happening in our initial declaration of our uh, variables of important deals that are required. Now, uh, let's actually go ahead and look at this particular code where we are going to be looking at all the different kinds of models that are currently being supported. So uh, we have basically taken uh, three different uh, models. The first one is the SSD model. And as you can see, like within, you know, these models, we have a unique TF Lite, uh, you know, a unique TF Lite um, 
file for you know the different models so the first model is the ssd mobile net model we have all the labels uh, so the labels are essentially you know what will be recognized whenever you provide any kind of an image uh, it will act, it will actually be able to provide like a label to it based on whichever uh, you know label it the machine learning model actually thinks is the closest and then we have the yolo uh, again yolo is used for image classification and we have another uh, tf light uh, you know uh, file for it and then we have a standard mobile net version v1 that is you know the tf light so we can uh, sort of you know select one of these models based on the performance that we are seeing using the switch statement and uh, as you can see that the tf light dot load model is responsible for actually going ahead and loading the model inside of your local storage because uh, initially uh, the model will not be loaded directly uh, for you know saving the time and uh, saving the amount of uh, you know computation but using the tf light dot load model we are basically loading now the desired model so by selecting okay, which particular model do we actually want to load uh, we'll be loading that particular model and that will be used for doing the image classification now if we go ahead and look at the next particular uh, next particular uh, code now this is the code that is being utilized for rendering the boxes so of course what we want to do is that uh, once we detect something inside of an image we want to create a bounding box around it. Now, what exactly is a bounding box? A bounding box is representing, uh, you know, four different points, like a rectangle, you could say. And those, uh, you know, are sort of the ending points where we have detected, uh, we have detected something uh, like, you know, inside of the image. So uh, we are going to be using uh, the rendering box function to render uh, basically the um, bounding box on top of the image that are being recognized. And as you can see, what we're doing is that uh, we are having this recognitions.map because there will be a number of different recognitions. And um, for all of them, what we're doing is that uh, we are basically going to be, you know, uh, having set uh, the coordinates for our left top width and height basically this will give us you know uh, the coordinates or the endpoints of that particular image where we are creating the bounding box and we are returning a react native view that view is basically the generated view that is uh, you know created when we have detected something successfully and we want to render the um, you could say the bounding box on top of it so we are returning a view a react native view where you'll see basically it being created by a blue colored background as we take in the text style we have basically also used it and uh, you know we are using the styles.box and uh, what we are returning is basically the detected class so class of you know what type of uh, image like you know that is there so we are detecting that and we are also giving like what percentage is the confidence because as we know in machine learning that uh, based on any kind of recognition or predictions that you're making you'll be getting a range of different predictions but we are going to be taking the one with the highest prediction and we'll be returning that and drawing that once we render when we once we call the render boxes function now if we go ahead and look at uh, you know the code that is our main code we are looking currently at the on select image now in this we use the npm package of image picker and we you know go ahead and select one of the images so you will be providing the path in your os since this is react native so we're providing you know that path and uh, then you will be giving the response uri and the file path uh, we'll be defining the height and the width of the response and uh, we'll be basically giving in the state we are using the set state so since we are using uh, react as well over here so we are setting the state of you know the source uh, path file and uh, you know what is the image height now this is where we are also like as you can see height uh, we are doing basically we are uh, going ahead and uh, transforming the height uh, the image height and image weights in the next couple of lines where we basically are scaling it right and then what we're doing is that whatever particular uh, model that we want to actually go ahead and use we are uh, we have created the switch statements and we have created the different cases now let's say if you want to use the ssd one we can simply just go ahead and call the initial method that we had declared tf light and we can use the detect object on image function from it and uh, in that we'll be basically passing on the path the threshold that is uh, you know that is required and uh, the number of results per class 
and uh, that is where we are then going to be calling right uh, the uh, basically this function and uh, the direct object on uh, image function will go ahead and you know try to detect if it finds out something and uh, if it does right if there is some error then it will throw the error but otherwise if it does not throw an error uh, within our current state that we are maintaining for the recognition we are basically going ahead and you know we, with the recognitions that we have uh, we are providing that resultant array of uh, basically or you could say the map of you know uh, the resultants where basically for each particular uh, different type of result that it gave it has got giving uh, it has given a corresponding uh, value attached to it so it's giving you a map of different you know recognitions that are made for example if an image is of a cat it might have detected cat dog and some other kinds of you know labels as well and their corresponding uh, percentage uh, of you know um, how much percent like uh, the conf uh, the model is actually confident that it will be true and uh, you can see that being utilized for all these different ones now whichever one is the one that is having the highest one that will be again as we have discussed uh, right will be used in this render boxes one because from the state we are first finding out okay which particular model to use uh, what is the map of you know the recognitions and the image height and image width and this will help us to render the boxes and this will go ahead and be utilized you know to draw it on the canvas so uh, apart from this the other steps that you'll be doing is basically create you know um, another uh, create basically components uh, one component would be to uh, you know uh, render the output image uh, that will be there and uh, on the output image you'll be rendering uh, the bounding box and uh, of course if you let's say are trying to do it on live via let's say your webcam you can have another component and use the react native uh, webcam and have those uh, you know and sort of create this entire as let's say a separate view uh, inside of your react native application but uh, this sort of shows an example of how you know it would function so you pick an image you select that image and you put it and the um, machine learning model uh, or sort of you know the TF flight model is actually able to detect multiple objects within a single image and it will be able to create the corresponding bounding boxes on top of each one of these and <coughs> help us to you know create a simple image classification uh, solution on uh, react native now apart from this there are a lot of other benefits as well so there is of course uh, you know the simple example but of course you can do a lot of different other things by including uh, uh, you know tf lite with react native now uh, the support for specifically running media pipe solutions inside of react native is uh, not that great but there are a lot of different you know uh, uh, sort of you know things happening within the google's media pipe team to help you know to integrate because right now there is a great support for running it in native android and native ios applications but very soon we should be able to actually go ahead and get our hands on basically with the uh, implementations of react native with uh, you know like implementation of media pipe solutions with react native so um, that sort of you know is basically the example that we sort of covered today and with that that brings an end to my, uh, you know, to my talk. And I hope that you have liked and you have learned something from this particular talk. Uh, the most important things to sort of keep in mind is that Media Pipe is a really great solution that has been created by the Google team and has a lot of future applications and of course the amount of uh, support and the amount of uh, you know examples that are coming out for the media pipe community those are really great to see so if you are genuinely interested in creating these uh, streaming uh, machine learning applications now it could be something like you know um, like a physiotherapist uh, virtual physiotherapist let's say or some kind of a dance teacher or doing things related to your face and all these will actually be come in very handy and benefit by the media pipe uh, solutions that are actually provided by you know the media pipe team and you can definitely go ahead and check out those and of course tensorflow light is uh, sort of at its core you know it allows you to run uh, the tensorflow models uh, using 
uh, basically, you know, by uh, using a TF light or like sort of a light version of, uh, you know, the machine learning model, but it's been generally created for running on device machine learning uh, solutions, right? And it's so that it can do the ML processing on device. And that makes it really uh, great as, and of course, it's not just for ML uh, solutions, right? Or basically for uh, streaming solutions, it can be used for a lot of different other aspects as well. So with that, that brings an end to my talk. Uh, I hope, you know, you liked the talk and you can connect with me on my Twitter handle at the rate how to up and on GitHub on github.com slash shivailamba to, you know, ask any questions that you might be having with respect to media pipe, how to integrate, uh, you know, TF Lite with uh, React Native and how to basically empower, you know, React Native applications because React Native is one of the most popular frameworks, you know, that are there. And of course, being able to integrate <coughs> machine learning models with them is uh, highly uh, useful. So thank you so much for attending this talk and I hope to see you uh, in next uh, next year in, in person. Thank you so much. Thank you Shivai for this talk. Uh, it's really great to see how React Native can be used with some additional advanced features such as machine learning or sometimes even VR, showing us that React Native capabilities go beyond traditional mobile development. Now moving on to the next speaker, we have Arnaud from Advantis and he's going to talk about GraphQL with React Query, something that they are using in production in, on a fully fledged application. So in this talk, we're going to learn about their experience with that, all the great features and Arnaud, I guess, will try to convince us that React Query is what we should be all using for GraphQL, library, GraphQL development um, and uh, all the features that they are also planning to use in the future. So let's see what Arnaud has prepared for us today. Hey everyone, I'm very happy and excited to speak uh, at the React Native Europe conference. So today we talk about React Query with GraphQL CodeGen and TabStreet. Let's start with a few words about me. Uh, my name is Arno and I am an entrepreneur and CTO. I'm also passionate about developer experience and solving complex problems. React Query, so React Query is quite popular now. Uh, it's a powerful solution to uh, fetch and cache uh, remote data. And uh, the library has been created by Tanner Linsley and uh, is also famous for uh, React table or React chart components. Uh, the library is now maintained by Dominic and you can find on his uh, blog a lot of very interesting articles about React Query and TypeScript. We'll also use GraphQL Code Generator. Uh, it's a simple CLI that you will use to uh, generate your uh, TypeScript types and operations from your GraphQL schema. Uh, this CLI has been created by the Guild. The Guild is a group of open source developers. They have a lot of other solutions uh, for GraphQL. And uh, the GraphQL Code Generator itself is uh, provided with a lot of plugins for popular languages and libraries. So let's have a look at the technical stack for this demonstration. So for the React Native app, we will use Expo, TypeScript, the GraphQL Code Generator with GraphQL Config, React Query with GraphQL Request, and a React Native Paper, and also Suspense and Error Boundaries. For the API, uh, we'll use Hazura with the Postgres database, and everything will be hosted with nhost, which is a great uh, backend service solution. So this technical stack is very close to uh, what we did for uh, for own uh, React Native app in production. So we will be able to share uh, some recipes and some code with you today uh, about how to use a React Query with Code Generator and TypeScript. So let's have a look to the agenda. So we will uh, uh, review and look at the different features and the code uh, in this React Native app. So here you can see the different the topics that we will cover today. And uh, we'll conclude with uh, a comparison with other popular libraries as Apollo clients. And, the and I will share with you the lessons we have learned during this uh, project. So let's start with the stale while uh, revalidate concept to see uh, how it works.
To demonstrate the stale while revalidate concept, I will use Azura to edit the data in the database. Azura will expose my data, my, my data uh, as a GraphQL API that is uh, consumed by this very simple uh, React Native application I have created especially for this talk. So when you click on one movie, uh, we fetch the data uh, about the movie details here. So what we want to offer as a user experience is when you go back to this uh, movie details, you want to use the cache uh, at the client side. So you will have an instant uh, response experience. And in the meantime, uh, you expect that um, your React Native app will fetch fresh data uh, from the server. So this is actually what uh, it is happening now, but my connection is too fast that uh, if I change the data on the server, you can see that uh, it's displayed instantly because I have a very high speed connection. So now I have to slow down uh, the connection to illustrate uh, the stale while uh, revalidate concept. So I'm using the network link conditioner, which is a great solution to um, experience different uh, connection speed. You can download this tool uh, with the Xcode additional tools. So first, let's uh, change uh, a value of this uh, movie title and the ratings. And I just save the data and now I can slow down my network connection and click on the movie details. And you can see that we have, we have one very uh, uh, few seconds just to, to display the cache data and uh, he has just the time to uh, um, revalidate the data from the server. So let's do it again. And now let's use a very bad uh, connection. So you can see that we are still uh, displaying the same data uh, that are in the cache. And if I uh, change the connection quality to edge, for example, we will have uh, the data updated. So this is exactly what you, you, you expect uh, in a modern app, is to have instant uh, response from the cache and uh, in the background refetch the data from the server. So RackQuery has this uh, very good default, is state while uh, revalidate uh, concept. And it's very useful because you will have a snappy experience uh, while uh, optim optimizing uh, the data fetching uh, behind the scene. So let's see now how it works and uh, how to generate the corresponding code uh, with a GraphQL code generator. To use the GraphQL code generator, you have to install the CLI first. Next, you have to configure uh, the code generator. To do that, I will use a GraphQL config uh, that will allow me to uh, also use a VS Code a GraphQL extension. So you can use the same configuration file for both the GraphQL code generator and the VS Code extension. So uh, to configure your GraphQL code generator, you have to define a schema endpoint here. You can add some optional headers. Uh, you can define uh, where your queries and mutations are defined and where you want to generate your TypeScript types and with, with which plugins, like we, here we want to use TypeScript and we want to generate hooks by using RackQuery and RackQuery is using as a fetcher GraphQL request. And that's it. You can now move on your queries and uh, mutations definition. So let's create a new one. And here I'm using, again, uh, the VS Code uh, GraphQL extension. So I can, I, I have autocomplete. So now I can just 
browse uh, my API schema here and I can just select uh, the fields and uh, the queries I want to use. And I can even execute a query. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really great to have this possibility to uh, create very easily and quickly uh, your queries and mutation in this GraphQL file and have a preview of the data. So if we have a look at a more detailed example here that we will use in our uh, demo application, uh, you can see that you can use, you can define some movie fragments that you can use in your queries and your mutation. And uh, you can also define uh, your GraphQL variables and you can also define some mutation. So everything is defined in these uh, GraphQL files. You can have one, you can have multiple files. It depends on how large is your application and how you want to structure uh, your queries and uh, mutations. So the next step is to generate uh, the corresponding types and hooks. To do that, I will use the terminal and I will use my new generate command. And this command is just using um, GraphQL code gen uh, by using the config file I've just defined. So uh, it's quite easy and it's very fast. Here it generates all the types and all the hooks in uh, two seconds. So let's have a look to the generated file. So here you have a very large file with all the types and uh, hooks generated from the GraphQL API schema. Uh, so here you can look at the movies uh, type. Um, and if we go uh, at the bottom, we will find our uh, hooks uh, that are using uh, the requery hooks and the fetcher. So you don't have to, to take care of this file. It will be automatically maintained and generated by uh, GraphQL code gen when you did too. So I mean that um, you don't have to manually edit or add types to this file. You just have to regenerate your, uh, your, uh, this file when your schema has changed or when you have added some new queries or mutation in your GraphQL file. So as you can see, GraphQL Code Generator, it's a productivity booster. Uh, you can just focus on using your uh, requery hooks instead of having to create first all the types and all the queries and hooks uh, somewhere. It will be done automatically by uh, GraphQL Code Gen. So the next step will be to see how to use uh, these generated hooks and type in our components. So here we are in our uh, app uh, component. So as a standard React Native application, uh, we have to define some providers. And uh, here we have to define one provider uh, for the GraphQL uh, client and another one for the query client. Uh, the GraphQL client provider is a custom one that we just use uh, the GraphQL request uh, client and where you just have to define your uh, GraphQL API endpoints. And maybe for your app in production, you have to define some authorization headers. The next provider you, you need is to use the existing query client provider. Uh, it's a provider that is available uh, with the React Query. And uh, you have to set uh, your query client. So here, our query client, uh, is a new query client from React Query. And what is really great with React Query is that you can define some global uh, settings for all of your queries. So here uh, we have just defined that we want to use suspense and uh, we don't want to have multiple retries when an uh, error occurs. It's just for the demo purpose, but maybe the default is three, but you can just adjust uh, uh, this setting according to your needs. And you have a lot of multiple settings that you can define globally for all of your uh, queries and, and mutation. 
So that's it for the main app uh, file. You just uh, have to define these two providers. Uh, next, you have to actually use the hooks generated by the graphical code generator in your components. So let's have a look to the movies uh, list components. So here I have my movie li movies list component and this list uh, is using a custom hook to uh, fetch uh, all the movies from the uh, API. So uh, if I go inside this custom hook, uh, in this custom hook, I'm using the GraphQL client that uh, Requery uh, needs. Uh, and uh, I use the generated uh, hooks generated by uh, GraphQL code gen. And that's it. So it's nice because here I have a very nice encapsulated hook and my component code is very lean. And here I can just uh, add some additional uh, configuration and logic. And uh, I don't have to implement this hook, it's already generated by uh, GraphQL code gen. So in this example, uh, the first parameter is a fetcher. So in our case, we want to use GraphQL client. And uh, after you have some variables. So here, this is the query variables I have uh, defined in my uh, GraphQL uh, file. So here I have also, for example, the offset. This is one available uh, variable I have defined in my uh, GraphQL uh, file. So it's very easy, just have to consume uh, the hooks generated by the GraphQL uh, code generator and use the generator. And then you have to, you get this query info uh, uh, result, but you can, if you want, uh, uh, use all the uh, possible uh, query info uh, uh, fields uh, you need here, like is fetching, is error, uh, is success, and so on. But in this case, we just want to return to our component uh, the data. So this is uh, the movies. Again, thanks to uh, GraphQL code generator and types in TypeScript, I have uh, automatically these uh, nice uh, types. And um, I want just to expose also to my components a refetch method that is exposed by React Query. Uh, use query and uh, I can now in my movie uh, movies list component I can uh, use the movies data and if I need to refetch uh, the list I can uh, use this uh, function in my component to uh, to refetch the data. So this is basically how you can use uh, Red Query and the hooks generated by um, the code generator. Uh, to have a very clean and encapsulated uh, solution in your uh, components. Okay, so we have just seen how to use GraphQL code generator and the generated hooks into our components. And now let's have a look to the other features that RequeryWe uh, provide, uh, provides to us. So first, uh, let's have a look at the initial data. So if we go back to our very uh, simple app here, we have the list of this list of data. And uh, when, so this list just fetch some data from uh, our GraphQL API, like the ID, the title, and the ratings. But uh, so it's just uh, this uh, simple set of information. And when we click on one uh, movie, we want to display instantly the information we we already have have in our list and display this information while loading extra details uh, about the movie. Okay, so again, if I click here, it's already in the cache, so it's instant. If I go here, I have instantly the title and the ratings, and I want to load um, uh, the details information uh, when the screen is displayed. So to do that. Uh, the maybe the uh, nice way to, to use requery uh, to do that is to use initial data. So if we look at our uh, movies uh, list components, when you click on one item, you we use a React Navigation to navigate to the movie detail screen 
and uh, we send as a parameter, as a root parameter, uh, we send the movie, the actual item uh, in the list. So when I click here, I just navigate to the screen and send uh, the movie data I have as a parameter. So I have the ID, the title, and the ratings. And I want to display instantly this information. So to do that, uh, if I go to the movie details um, screen component, so I have this uh, hook, it's a custom hook I use, use movie details, and the parameter is a movie. A movie is a movie fragment, and if we have a look to the fragment here, it's uh, only the, the ID, the details, and the ratings. But the movie details fragment is more. It's the storyline, the, uh, the jar, and the ratings. So uh, what I need here is I need the details, but I want to display instantly uh, the information I have. So to do that, I can go into my custom hook. And here I'm using the generated uh, hook generated uh, automatically by GraphQL code gen. And I have a variable, which is uh, the movie ID. And I have this great initial data query property. So I can uh, say that uh, just uh, use this initial data uh, for this query and uh, it means that it will be automatically used uh, by my component uh, to display uh, um, some information without waiting to have the all details coming from the API. So it's a great way to, uh, to manage this case because your movie detail uh, use as a single uh, source of truth. This is the rec query. You don't have to have an extra movie um, uh, movie list item information somewhere. You just have to rely on the same movie details uh, information here. So this is how you can use initial data to have this kind of very optimized uh, solution because here you can have a GraphQL query with only the data you need for the screen and you don't have to fetch uh, everything. So I know that with GraphQL, uh, you can do that, and it's nice in a lot of cases. But if you have a huge list, or if you have a, a lot of details uh, to fetch, it's better maybe to optimize your list data um, to fetch only what you need to display and uh, to display all the and to load the details when needed. But you can instantly display what you have in your list. Uh, what also you can do uh, with rec query is you can prefetch. So uh, on some events, you can even uh, prefetch some data if you anticipate that the user will uh, display uh, another screen and so you can preload some, uh, some data. So that's it for the initial uh, data. But again, it's very nice to have a single source of truth in your components and to optimize how the data are fetched and displayed. Let's now have a look at the automatic refetch options Red Query provide. And let's start with the on app focus refetch. So here I am uh, in the app uh, components and I have added also some logs about uh, when uh, data are fetched uh, from the server. So on the left, you have my actual device, and you can see that when I manually refetch my uh, list, you can see the logs uh, at the same time. So what I want is when the application uh, goes to the background and goes back to the foreground, I have this automatic refetch. So you can see that it's already done here automatically, and it's working also for the detail screen. Okay, so when the application uh, is going back to the foreground, it, uh, automatically Red Query re will refetch all the active queries. I think it's a great behavior because the user don't the uh, the users don't have to refetch manually when they go back to a screen. Um, so uh, it just uh, uh, automatically performed by Red Query. So how to implement that? Uh, it's quite easy. Uh, it's not um, easy as the web uh, in a web application because this is a default with a React web application. In with the React Native application, 
you have to uh, use um, this uh, hook that will uh, use upstate, which is a React Native hook, that will use this on upstate change um, uh, function. And uh, when it means that when uh, the React Native app state change, uh, it will call automatically this function, and this function will uh, tell to React Native that the app is focused. And when the application is active, you don't want to do a refetch when the application is not active. You want to do a refetch when the application is active. And uh, that's it. And you know that all of your uh, rack query active queries will be refetched when uh, the application uh, goes back to the foreground. So I think it's great. It's you don't have to <laughs> to code everything in your component and 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 in your code to to manage this uh, this case. You just have to add this very simple function and use the focus manager to to tell rack query that uh, he has to uh, to refetch on focus. For the next feature, uh, I won't be able to demonstrate it, but uh, I'm going to show you how to implement this solution. Is when uh, the network is offline and when you go back to online mode, you want to automatically refetch uh, the data. So let's see how you have to implement uh, this solution. So one way to do that is to create a new custom hook and uh, in this hook will just uh, use a React Query Online Manager to set uh, the network status. And to know the network status, uh, you have to use a NetInfo object from a React Native Community NetInfo. So it's very easy. Just you just have to um, to implement and to call this hook in your app uh, components. And uh, when uh, the device is offline and when the device is going back online and you uh, are on the, your app, automatically all the queries uh, will be uh, refetched. So again, it's a very uh, nice uh, UX uh, because uh, with uh, mobile, you can have these issues with, uh, with the connection. So you know that if a user has uh, your application open and when it's going back offline uh, from from offline to online mode you will it will have its data automatically refetch the next refetch options we are going to see is on screen focus and polling on screen focus is when you want uh, to refetch for example, the movies list uh, when uh, you display the screen. So right now you can see that this is actually what we, we do. When you go to a detailed screen and we go back to the screen, we refetch the data. But again, this is still while uh, revalidate feature. I mean that when you go back to the list, React Query will use a cache first and in the background, refetch the data uh, from the server. But to uh, have this automatic refetch on screen focus, we have to implement uh, it. So to do that, uh, in the movies list component, I'm using a new custom hook. And this hook is uh, quite simple. It's using um, use focus effect from Rack Navigation, and it will just initiate a refetch uh, a requery re refetch uh, when we display again a second time the screen. So it will be not done when the screen is displayed the first time. It will be refetch only when we're going back to the screen. So this is a very simple solution to implement uh, this on refresh focus with the requery. And the refetch uh, function here is a parameter of this use refetch on focus hook. And uh, is coming from the use query uh, uh, rec query hook that has this refetch uh, function. So pretty straightforward. You just have to use it where you need to have this automatic refetch when uh, a user is going back to one of your screen.
The last automatic refetch options we are going to see is polling. Polling is when you want to automatically refetch your list, in this example the movies list, uh, at a specified interval. So it's very easy to do. You just have to edit uh, your uh, recurry query options. So here I'm using my custom hooks, use movies, and I just have to set uh, the refetch interval option in my uh, use query hook. So let's say I want a refresh every two seconds. Uh, you can see in the terminal that automatically uh, this uh, query will be refetched every two seconds. You can uh, set this option for a specific query as we do now or globally uh, in the new query client options. So it's great when you want to have this automatic refetch. It can be complementary to push notifications or GraphQL subscriptions. It's good to know that you can uh, use this option, just take care of the energy consumption and if it's really relevant, if the user stays on the same app and the same screen uh, for a long time. So it's uh, up to you to decide if uh, you have to use this uh, refetch uh, interval option. So just to, to conclude about all of these uh, automatic refetch options, I think that uh, Recurry provides maybe 80% of your need uh, in terms of automatic refetch and is quite well integrated with uh, React Native and easy to, 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 to implement. So I think Recurry, one very strong point is that is so easy to have these very good defaults and what uh, you can have uh, and what you can expect from uh, a modern uh, React native uh, application. Now we can explore mutations uh, and we can uh, see how to, to invalidate uh, cache and to do optimistic updates uh, with the React query. So in, your, in our movie details uh, component here, uh, we, we can do some mutation about the movie ratings here. What we want to do is to have an instant feedback. Uh, so I mean that when you click here on the star, you want to update uh, the UI instantly without waiting for a response from the server. So this is optimistic updates. What you want to do also is when you, a mutation has succeeded, you want to uh, refetch automatically uh, the list information to have a consistent uh, information here according to the mutation you have just done uh, in the detail screen. So how to manage uh, cache invalidation and optimistic update in my code? So what uh, we have uh, done here is we have this custom hook that uh, returns a function that you will uh, call when a user uh, click on uh, a star here. So this function will accept the movie ID and the new uh, ratings. If we look deeper into uh, this hook code, uh, you can see that we uh, have this uh, function definition here that we return and this function just manage uh, the new uh, ratings and will call this muta mutate in sync function that is a recurry function that you use to call your GraphQL API and you send this by using these variables. So this is where the, the, uh, the mutation actually uh, happened. Uh, we have another hook where you have to define uh, your mutation that you use here. So this hook will use uh, the, the, the hook ge uh, generated by uh, GraphQL code gen according to the schema and your GraphQL file. So here it will, it will create a new mutation uh, according to the different options you have defined. You have the, the unmutate option, unsuccess and on your. You have also unsettle option, but I don't uh, use unsettle here. Uh, in onMutate, what I want to do first is to cancel ongoing fetching. I don't want to have uh, ongoing fetching if I do a mutation. 
uh, I need to get the, the, the previous movie de uh, details because I want to do an optimistic update. So I want to alter uh, the current data and also need this previous movie details data if I have to roll back if an error occur later, occurs later. Uh, here, this is actually where we do the optimistic updates. So where you, you are using a query client uh, from React Query with the set query data function. So I, I say that I want to update my query data for this query and I want to use this variable. So this is the movie ID and I want to update the data. So I want to uh, change the, the ratings here with the new ratings. So this is how to do uh, optimistic update uh, with the rec query. And if the mutation succeed, I just have to invalidate the queries I want. So in my case, when I change a rating here, I want to update the list. And you can see again, if, if I click on the star, look at the terminal, it will automatically uh, initiate a cache invalidation of the movies list. So I'm sure that if the user go back to the screen, he will, uh, he will try to uh, have uh, fresh uh, data consistent uh, with my mutation. And the last point is error management, is if, my, if I have an error during my mutation, I can, by, by the same solution, using set query data, roll back to my initial state. So here again, I can roll back for this particular query. I can set the data to the previous data. So this is, it's very straightforward. You just have to, to work with uh, queries, uh, queries key and data, and you have to, and you can easily uh, set your query data by this way uh, for optimistic update or when you have to roll back to uh, a previous value, for example. So this, this is basically how uh, complex is uh, to manage uh, mutation and cache admission and optimistic up, uh, update. I think that at the end, it's not so complex. Uh, you have a very good control of, of what is going on and you can do exactly what you want in terms of cache admission and what data you want to update when a mutation occurs. Now, how to use React Suspense and error boundaries uh, with React Query. So first of all, React Query supports both uh, React Suspense and error boundaries. But how, do, how to, to use uh, these features in your code? So actually, our movies list is using Suspense. And it keeps our uh, component code very lean because we don't have to, to manage uh, loading indicator here or error management. It's all done in the movies list screen where you uh, where we use uh, suspense um, on the top of the movies uh, list. And thanks to the React Query support, we don't have to add any additional code. So we just have to fall back to a loading screen. So let's use a slow connection here and reload uh, my app. So we have the time to see the loading indicator. And here you can see the loading indicator and uh, the list will be displayed just after. So it's great. Uh, I think for 80% of the cases, suspense, it's a very it's a very, very good combination with rec query. And the same for error boundary. Um, rec query provides a query error reset boundary provider that you can use. Uh, to manage error boundary and you can just uh, fall back uh, to an error message when a uh, rec query error occurs, for example, a GraphQL error or something like that, a network error. So you can display a nice generic uh, this, uh, screen and you can uh, uh, use a button to reset uh, the, the query state. So it's again, maybe for most of the cases, it can be very nice. But if you need uh, more control, for example, in the movie detail screen, we have this two-step uh, display where we want to display uh, first the data from uh, the list, and then we want to load the details. So we need to have uh, something more precise. 
uh, maybe it's, it's doable with suspense, but to keep uh, to keep the code and the component very uh, simple, uh, we have just eject from suspense from from for this uh, uh, movie details uh, component. So how to eject? You just have to uh, set uh, the corresponding property in the red query hook. And uh, here, uh, I just said suspense to false, but I still want to use error boundary. So you can mix exactly what you, you want here. And now in my uh, movie details code, I can display a loading indicator according to the, to the state or to the data uh, I want. So it's great, you know, to have the possibility to uh, to define the behavior you want or to, to 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 have the choice to to use suspense or not according to your need for each uh, screen. Flat list with infinite queries. So let's see how it works with React Query and React Native. So now my uh, application uh, supports uh, infinite uh, list in, uh, in the movie screen. So when I scroll down, uh, after 30 items, I will uh, fetch a new page from my, from my GraphQL API. So here you can see the terminal that RecQuery automatically fetch the next page. So how it works? So I have this use infinite movies custom hook that will uh, return uh, a fetch next page function. This fetch next page is uh, called by the onreach function handler. And this handler is used uh, in this uh, flat list property. So when the end is reached, it will automatically call this function. And uh, this function will, uh, if I go back here, this function we call fetch next page. And this is a function uh, of requery and requery will fetch the next page according to the settings uh, defined in this custom hook. So here we don't use uh, a hook generated by a GraphQL codegen because there is no uh, infinite uh, hooks generated automatically by, by GraphQL codegen and RecQuery plugin. So we uh, do have to uh, implement uh, our own uh, function. So we use uh, use infinite query func uh, function from RecQuery and uh, we just have to uh, to call uh, the GraphQL client, to, to use the GraphQL client to do the GraphQL request. And we, this function will accept uh, uh, the page number. And according to that, we have to define the new variables like the offset and the, the limit is the page uh, size. So in this case, uh, because we are using an offset for the pagination, it's very easy to configure and to calculate what is the next uh, offset for the next page. And uh, here, we, you have also to implement this get next page param uh, option. Uh, with a function that will return the next uh, page number. So this is how to, to manage uh, infinite uh, query in uh, React Query. So first you have to uh, do your query uh, with the page param you receive, and you have to expose a function to return the next uh, page param. And that's it. Uh, and yes, sorry, uh, you still have to return the data, and the data is all the movies. Uh, from all the pages. So you have to return the pages uh, that are in the current state and to add your new uh, movies here. So by this way, your movies list will contain all the movies. And uh, it's great because now I can just have this infinite uh, pagination and I can, uh, when I do a mutation, you can see that it will refetch automatically all the pages, which is good and not good because in terms of performance, maybe you want only to refetch the, the impacted pages. So this is something we will discuss just after. But here it's a good default. I mean, if you do some mutation, you want to have your list 
fresh when you go back to the list. So RecQuery will handle that for you. You don't have to take care of that. You just have to invalidate your query. And if your query is using uh, pages, no problem. It will uh, refetch uh, all the pages. In your infinite uh, list, you may want also to support uh, optimistic updates. So in our case, when I click uh, on the rating here, I want to have automatically my uh, UI uh, updated here. So to do that, uh, I have to update uh, my uh, mutation to um, in addition of uh, doing an optimistic update from my movie details, I have added this set movies query data uh, function that will optimistically update my uh, list of movies. So uh, to update uh, my list, I again I'm using rack query set query data. And I have to uh, update uh, the list. And to do that, I have to get the previous data and to update the corresponding uh, item in my list. Uh, so this is a movie I've just updated. I want to update the movie uh, that has to be uh, impacted. So this is the way to go. Um, the solution, I think, is, is nice uh, when you really need to have uh, an optimistic update uh, on all the screens in, impacted by a, a mutation. So we don't use that a lot uh, because the query and validation are working very nicely and uh, we don't have an offline uh, support mode very advanced, so we don't have to, to do that. But again, if you, uh, if you want to, to optimistic, optimistically update uh, the list in addition of the current screen, this is uh, also something uh, that you can do with the uh, query and thanks to the set query data uh, function. And now the last but not the least feature I would like to discuss with you today is the cache persistence in the async storage. Uh, this is great when you want to store all the cache data uh, into the async storage. So when your users are going back to your app, you will have all of this data already populated in your screens. Um, so it's a very snappy UX. And it's also very nice when you want to, to implement uh, offline uh, mode support. So uh, to, uh, to activate uh, this feature, you have to uh, use some new experimental uh, React query features. So in the app component, we call this function. And this function will init persistor, it's uh, a custom function, uh, will use uh, the new persist query client uh, function and the new create async storage persistor. So, it's very straightforward. This persist query client uh, just receives a query client, a persistor, and um, a value to, to know when the persist query client has to bust the cache. So here, we want to uh, clean the cache when the application version has changed. So we are sure that uh, we, don't, uh, we, we, we won't uh, reuse uh, data that can have changed according to a new API change or about a new changes in our components. So we want to, to bust the cache uh, when, uh, when, when the app version has changed. And that's it. This is actually what you have to do to uh, persist your uh, queries cache uh, data uh, into the async storage. is simple as is. So you can imagine how simple now is to persist uh, all of your queries cache by using this very simple uh, function here. So it's a great feature. Hopefully, uh, it will be an official and stable feature. Right now, we have decided to use this feature in production. 
and so far so good and we are so happy and so excited to to use it because again it's a maybe 10 lines 10 lines of code just to manage uh, this great uh, feature As you can see, Rack Query is a great solution, especially in terms of developer experience and features, with very good defaults. But how it compares to other popular libraries? I think all of the solutions I show you now are great. Uh, you can create very nice and sophisticated application with all of these solutions. So it's really a question about the philosophy and the strategy you have uh, in your React Native app development and also about the skills uh, of your team and what you want to do. So I think there are two categories right now. There is the, the universal data fetching and caching approach and the GraphQL set management frameworks approach. So React Query is on the first category. It's something very universal. You just have to think about queries, cache, optimistic updates. Uh, you don't have to think about the schema and how your uh, GraphQL API um, schema is defined. It's just queries and just uh, invalidate queries with variables. And so it's something very straightforward. And uh, it's also you have a total control on how your cache will be invalidated and uh, when. So this is something which is can be really uh, good for some team. Uh, because you have this uh, very easy learning curve, but you can have very precise uh, configuration and for sophisticated cases. Uh, in this category, you have also SWC, uh, often used with Next.js, and uh, Redux Toolkit, which is something uh, more integrated with Redux if you like this approach. So React Query in this category uh, is, is really great. Uh, and you have also to have in consideration the community, uh, the maintainer, and uh, all the resources around, like the GraphQL code gen plugin. So for me, it's my better uh, library, uh, is my preference choice in this category. On the other hand, you have the state management frameworks uh, with Relay, Apollo Client, and Urkel. I think Relay, it's the oldest one, uh, it's very mature, but it's opinionated about the schema. So it can be a show blocker in some situation where you want to do what you want about the schema and you don't want to have some requirements about the schema uh, you have uh, created. But if you respect the rules uh, about Relay, you have a really great uh, solution because it's you have all the documentation, all the features, you just have to follow uh, the rules of this framework and you will have great results. Apollo Client is really nice. I'm used to uh, use a lot of Apollo Client on other projects and even in the uh, uh, in the first version of our React Native app. It's very nice. Uh, again, if you like the framework approach and have uh, very good uh, features uh, that relies on your uh, uh, GraphQL schema, is nice. It also relies on a normalized cache. I mean, it will, uh, when you do a mutation, it will automatically know which uh, data to update in other queries. So it's nice, but there are a lot of edge cases. And again, there is maybe a kind of learning curve uh, when you uh, want to, um, to use all the possibilities of this uh, great uh, Apollo Client framework. Urkel, it's something a little bit newer compared to Apollo Client and Relay, but it's very nice because it provides both uh, document and normalized cache approaches. So I think it's great. Uh, maybe this is the one I prefer in this category, very close to Apollo Client. So again, just uh, have a look at the documentation, the, the repo, a real life uh, application example, and just decide first the approach you want. Is it a universal one or you want maybe something more optimized about your GraphQL schema? And the last one is uh, GQLS. Uh, so it's very, very uh, interesting one because you don't have to create uh, your query before. You just have to code 
uh, your uh, your uh, and to use your query and it will automatically generate uh, your GraphQL query. So it's brand new. It's very interesting. Maybe if you want to go very fast and don't bother with uh, uh, creating uh, your GraphQL uh, queries and mutation elsewhere, just use your query and it will automatically generate uh, your GraphQL queries. So I think it's a great, uh, uh, a great new solution and we are very lucky because the GraphQL ecosystem now is so good with very good solutions that we can just decide which flavor uh, we prefer. So it's a question of test and team and uh, how you want to, to manage your React Native project with, with GraphQL. It's time now to share with you the lessons we have learned during our journey with React Query. So first, start your project with GraphQL Code Generator. It's a game changer in terms of developer experience and productivity. It's so fast, so don't waste your time by adding types and hooks. Uh, just uh, use a GraphQL Code Gen with the React Query plugin. It's so fast and the VS Code extension is really nice. Uh, use custom hooks as possible to keep your React components logic clean. Even if the use query, use mutation are very easy to, to use, it's, it's good to have this kind of abstraction so you can keep your React components uh, really clean. Uh, when possible, just use and have a, a single source of truth for your uh, query data. So you can use the initial data property when uh, it's relevant. So it's great because uh, your components just fetch some data and this data can be set uh, by initial data or by an optimistic update or by a GraphQL API. But it will be the same source of truth. So try to, 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 to have only a single source of truth uh, when it comes with uh, your data. Always test with the network conditioner because uh, if not, uh, often your connection is very fast and you don't see exactly what is going on. So if you want to test loading screen errors and just how the optimistic updates uh, behaves, just use uh, the network conditioner as, as possible when you evaluate uh, your feature and your application. Uh, it's very easy, as you have seen just before, to log everything uh, is happening in your cache and your queries. So just monitor and especially at the beginning to understand really uh, how a uh, rec query is working and when uh, the data is fetching. So it's a, it's a great solution to learn and to debug. There is a uh, enable option in use query, and we use this a lot to manage uh, dependent and conditional queries. So again, it's a great solution. And if you use React Query, have a look at this option, and you will see a lot of use cases when you may need to use this enable option. And uh, about suspense, yes. Uh, Suspense, you know, in terms of productivity is great because it, mean, it means less code in your components. But uh, in some situations, you may need to have more control about uh, the loading state or the error management. So at one point, you can be limited with suspense. Um, and so this is not a problem because uh, Red Query supports a lot of status variables you can use to check very precisely uh, what is the status of your query. What's coming next for us? Uh, so we will uh, work with the query for full offline support. So right now we have uh, some limited uh, su offline support features. And, uh, but I think query will provide all the features we need uh, to, to have this full offline support. And uh, the other point is GraphQ Gra GraphQL subscription supports. So right now it's possible, but it's not very well documented in the, in the current uh, website. So you have to investigate a little bit. There is a very nice article uh, by Dominic about using WebSockets with query, a discussion in the repo, but uh, 
we would like to, to see more details and more examples and, and uh, best practices about uh, uh, using GraphQL subscriptions with React Query. So again, I was quite excited and happy to, to, to speak at uh, uh, React Native Europe conference. And I hope that this talk will be useful and with a lot of recipes and code example. And I wish you a great conference and with uh, very interesting uh, talks. Thank you. Thank you, Arno, for your talk. I'm always happy to see people sharing their first hand experience of their production application. I think we can all learn from that and let's discuss this on our Discord channel. And next up is Helena Ford, founder of uh, Stack Tiger and maintainer of a library called Notify. And her talk will allow us to take our notification game to the next level. Helena, the stage is yours. Hey everyone, I'm Helena Ford and I'm the CTO of StatTiger, a mobile dev agency in the UK. I've been working with React Native since the beginning and I'm an active maintainer of Notify, a local notification library by Invitase. You can find me at Helena Ellie Ford on Twitter and I have a blog, Ford.dev. Today I'm going to give a quick demo and talk about how you can exploit the full power of notifications to increase user engagement and retention. We'll cover getting set up with Notify, media support, quick actions, scheduling user notifications, and a few other bits. Push notifications often require third-party services like Firebase to operate. However, local notifications are configured on the device itself and allow you to get them up and running without any such third parties. A good example is your alarm clock that sends a local notification at whatever time you set your alarm for. There are several React Native libraries out there that can help you configure these notifications. One of these, which I'm going to talk about today, is Notify by Invitase. Notify enables developers to build rich notifications with a simple API whilst taking care of complex problems such as scheduling, background tasks, device API compatibility, and more. Okay, so let's get into the code then. So you see on the screen an example project I prepared for this demo, which is some TV shows um, just plain simple JSON data with a display notification button. Um, and if we look here, um, it's just a plain button with an on press. So what we want to do here is display a notification, a local notification. So before we even do that, we should also say we would need to install the library first, of course. So. I've already installed it for this example, but if you can see my terminal here, you can do yarn add add notify for slash react native. And then if you cd into iOS uh, pod install, that's all you need to do to set up notify. And then we'll just get right into the code, so it's fairly straightforward. Um, so make notify dot display notification so everything is typed so it tells you okay what does it expect to take um we'll just start off with simple title and body hello world body world and android requires one extra step which is a channel id um, and we'll have to make it first. I normally just tend to go general, default, any name really you like, but just be keep in mind that the user will see the name. So when you create the channel, create channel, the same ID you pass it to the payload. So general. And then name so this is what the user see so just keep it fairly user friendly and then importance okay so this is probably one of the things that trips people up the most it which trips me myself up too um is if you want it to be a banner like a heads up 
to go over the apps and not just like hidden in the notification tree when it comes through is to do importance of high. Um, also, you can call or create channels as many times as you want. It's not really an issue um, because Android will just ignore it if it's already created. Um, but also remember, once you've created a channel, you can't then update any of its properties. You have to delete it first, um, just to remember that. Um, so if we go ahead and try to display this, fingers crossed, it, there you go. It'll come up, hello world. We haven't added, we haven't specified a notification yet, but we can easily do that. Um, small icon. Small icon. And you have to add this to your project separately, um, which is detailed on the box page. I've added this earlier, and it's just a TV icon. Um, you can give it any name. That's just the default name that Android Studio, Studio uses. Um, so if we try to display this again, you'll see now it has a TV notification icon. Yay. Um, so that's basically part one. And next, we'll go into making this bit more complicated. So this is probably like what you know most apps can do title body is pretty standard okay okay so as you can see i've specified a large icon um this is literally just a random url i got off google and it's a dot png so on android you can add a dot png dot jpeg um, and it can be local or remote. So this is a remote URL. You can also add like require. So here I tried to do but an example of a local and a remote one. So here's a, re um, a local asset file. So if I look into here, you can see I've added some, I've added the image and then some actions. Um, this is probably getting ahead of ourselves, but we'll just take it once at a time. So if I slowly start to build this up, so if I do large icon and then this URL, which just copy from here. I'm not going to type that out. <laughs> okay. There you go. So you can see the large icons on the right hand side which is perfect it's what we want so if I just swipe that away and then we go down into adding the big picture so on Android this is think of styles so you can have different types of styles messaging big picture inbox um, again I don't really want to go into like specifics of um, the API because it's all online, all on the docs, but it's just to give it a feel of what you can do, what is possible. Okay, so, oh, yeah, because I've taken it out of this farm plane here, yeah. it's not recognizing this at six. Okay. So if I swipe down now on the notification, you should see the picture. So this is the large icon, and then this is styles, Android style big picture, which is used just like a local asset. And if we now look at iOS, so on iOS, they don't have channels, but they do require to request permissions. Um, so for the sake of demo, I'll just add it here. Um, Notify you got best permission. You can specify exactly what you want, but default is fine. It will give you the permissions you need to display alert that comes over the app. Um, so I 
just like that. And I was um, so here we want to show a video. You can add images too, um, but this is the cool thing about iOS is that you can have videos. I've got an example again of how you can do the image which is pretty much identical to Android, just the field is in the attachments. Um, on iOS is you can add an array. So It will, if you have loads of images and videos specified here, it will literally just go down the list in order until um, one can successfully um, load. So. Okay, so let's just pull over the iOS emulator and see what this video displays like. So we say display notification. Okay, so this is the extra step. There's way, different ways you can call this and all, where you can call it throughout your app lifecycle to be less intrusive to the user, but demo purposes, let's just call it straight away and display the notification. Okay, so... You know, the first time it um, loads, it might take some time to load. If you've got big files, I've obviously not optimised this video or anything. You could also make it a GIF, which probably speed it up. <clears throat> Excuse me, as well. Um, you can play it. Here you go. Cool. So, if I um, just quickly take all this out and actually see what it would look like with all the white text and everything. So new episode, Grey's Enough to Me, episode name, play. Great. This isn't actually very useful though to the end user. So now we can actually start going into what quick actions are. So quick actions is a cool way for your user to engage with your app without them actually having to be in your app, uh, which is great if they're doing something else and they see a notification pop up, they can quickly interact. And it's not, it doesn't really affect what they're doing. So for Android, let's just, we'd have to go into the API a little bit. Um, he accepts an array of actions, a press action, which is an object, and a title. So a title is basically like a button label. So we've got watch now and save it later. And an ID, so ID default, notify will know this, what you want. When someone presses on that, you want the app to open. And our ID bookmark, this is completely whatever you want. Um, in our case, we want to know, we want the user to be able to bookmark from a notification. So before we actually display this, or we can display this and show you, the buttons won't do anything much until we add the event handlers to know, okay, a user has actually pressed these buttons, so. The first thing we need to do is add a background one. So if we just import notify quickly, import notify. Um, yeah. And then notify dot on the background event, async expects anything. 
Okay. And this um, will give you an event of type and detail. So we can quickly just print that out. to see what we get back from the event handler. And this, as the function is called, background. This will only run when the app is in background. There's also an on foreground event handler, um, which we'll add in a separate place. So with the background event, you'd always want it to be really here before your app's loaded. So it's always there um, and then the foreground one you can pretty much have it wherever you want um, I always try to put it in my when I put it in my apps I always try to put it when the app first renders um, as early as possible really as well but again that one really any time anywhere you want um, okay so as we have two actions um, with these IDs th this is what we want to hook into so we can do if type equals equals event dot action press. Um, not sure. Will TypeScript pick that up? Yep. So action press and the ID. So we can get that from press action to detail dot press action dot ID. Um, um, so if your user presses um, the default action, that will open up app, but also we'll have to cancel the notification, so we'll just do notify.cancel notification and give the ID of the notification. So that's just detail dot notification dot ID. We'll just demonstrate we can demonstrate here what watch now how we would use watch now. So we trigger this um, if this was a real world app out there in the world, this would be triggered when you know the actual episode is about to air or it has been released. Um, so if we put that in the background and then hopefully our background handler will pick up this event which is what we want and we'll cancel it when the app opens. And if you look down in my terminal you will see that you can see all these events coming through. Um, if I do this to make it more user, more easier to detect, um, so two is press action, and you can see it's coming through from the background. Um, next, we'll add a foreground handler. So this can go, like I said, can go anywhere. I always do it this way on the use effect when my app is first rendered or loaded. And if we start on the foreground event, and it's exactly the same as the background one, then we have a type and detail the event and we always want to make sure we're returning that so it's unsubscribed after the app has unmounted and then in here we want to do the same as what we did in the background one so we want to do if and just copy that put it here import event type and this needs to be brick marked now and we want to set 
So our user has actually bookmarked this this episode or TV show. So what we want to do here is actually set update the state of bookmarks. Um, so the user can see that they bookmarked this. Okay, so all we need to do is do set bookmarks. Bookmarks and then the ID which we will get from data. You could set your notification ID to match the show ID, but you could also do data um, and then have it here. Because if you wanted to say have two notifications of Grey's Anatomy, you might, if you just use show ID, that would restrict you. Um, so we just get it from the data, the notification. So also um, just to explain this, every property in data needs to be a string. So dot um, notification dot data dot show ID. This can be anything, any custom property. Um, this isn't a number anymore. We pass it. Um, okay, so if we try that, we should see Grey's Anatomy be a bit mad. Um, yeah. Awesome. So that's Android. Next we have iOS, which if I just bring that in quickly. So on I iOS, it works a little bit different, but also very similar to Android. So if you, it takes in a category ID, so rather than like specifying the quick actions inside the notification payload, you have to create this category beforehand. Um, and it can only be like a one-time thing, so you, you have to create the categories all at once together. I tend to do this again in the use effect, um, just when the app first mounts. But it's totally up to you. We could also do it in when we get display notification. It really doesn't matter that much. Um, so if I just rewrite out an exit function. And call it. So in here, await notification.set notification categories. This is an iOS function only, but on Android with Notify, it'll just ignore this. Um, so you don't have to worry about wrapping it in, in a condition, condition to check the platform. So category, so it's basically the same as this, except for without the press action object, you just need an ID, so ID default and title. So if you go into actions, um, so I can't be some new episode. New episode is the one that we got. Um, we want it, basically want it to be the same watch now, same on Android and iOS. You can also do it differently. Um, um, and then the next action for this category is bookmark, which is the most important one probably. Um, and okay, so 
And then our four corner band will be cut by the press both mouses. Okay, let's give this a uh, whiz. Display notification. Well, we drag down, see the actions, click save later. And things for us, yeah. This updated to be bookmarked. Yay. Foreground tool. So this is actually important on it. So these little um, little differences between Android and iOS, like documented on our thing. So if you do trip up, you just go to the docs, you'll see that. Um, or ask for help on the GitHub. GitHub repos probably is the um, easiest way to get in touch with us who maintain Notify is to just quickly do a Git issue or look through and see if anyone else has had the same issue. Chances are probably they have. Um, but yeah, more than happy to answer any questions um, on there. So we try this again. Display notification, put the app in the background. Do the notification, watch now, yeah. So yeah, don't forget to do the foreground trip. Now we'll go on to scheduling. So now we've seen quick actions for Android and iOS and how they can help the user engage with your app more. We go into scheduling. So next we move on to scheduling. So this is really useful if for like calendar apps, alarm notifications, um, Anything really that you want to um, plan ahead, alert the user ahead of time, um, these are normally great. And they normally, you normally ask your user beforehand if they want these notifications. So like, for example, in our scheduling app, it's on TV shows. So if I just get right into it, if we click on Grey's Anatomy, or Ozark, which is the <laughs> payload already designed for this. Um, you can ask, okay, would you like a reminder when this show is about to air? 10 minutes before, one day before, do you want it to be repeat, repeated every Monday at 8 p.m.? Um, but for this demo, we'll just say 10 minutes before, Ozark is aired please let me know, set reminder. Um, at the moment, this button doesn't do anything. Um, so let's go ahead and give it something to do. So we want in here to start to create our trigger notifications. Need to import notify first. So, so we'll import notify here. So this takes in a notification, so what the notification wants to look, we want to look like, our payload, and the trigger, so when do we want this to be scheduled into the future. So um, I already have this set up to, in my notifications.ts document. Also this will be available online, so can we go back to it. Um, this is exactly the same as the notification I showed above with the new episode, but instead it's just a different show, different image, and slightly different quick actions. Um, we've got default, dismiss default, um, and yeah, a different category ID on iOS, which will have the, the same actions above. The other thing is I do have this here, which is slightly jumping ahead of the demo. this so with a trigger type there are multiple um, trigger types for this one we're just going to do timestamp 
Inkfall is more if you want to like alarm and you want to notify the user every five minutes after they press snooze or you want a countdown like okay trigger in 60 seconds that's what Inkfall is great for. Pirate Sound is more great for um, an actual date and time so if we do timestamp um, and for the demo we'll just go ahead and say we want to trigger in three seconds rather than Monday at 8 pm so um, which might be in um, five seconds while well, time you're watching this right now but for me it's not so I'm just gonna go ahead and Create a date that is going to be three seconds into the future. And um, we've got eight seconds, we've got eight seconds, that's three. And we can go ahead and just add that date then as the timestamp. Also need to import this, which is the payload to the right. Okay, and we should be good to go. Um, I think that's literally all you need. Oh, the other thing, we're doing Android first, so yeah. Don't need to create the category at the moment. And yeah, that's all we're gonna be doing, so. We're just gonna be dismissing it or default. For the dismiss, this is just like, okay, I don't need, I appreciate the reminder, but I don't want to look in the app right now. I'm just going to get ready for my TV show. So we can actually, when they click dismiss, we can actually cancel that. So if we update our event handler, uh, and can ask if, dismiss. Let's cancel this for them. Let's get it out of the notification tray. Okay. Otherwise, they can check it out ahead of time. So this is going to be a ten-minute reminder ahead of the episode, so they could browse the app, get the app ready if they're that eager to watch the show. Um, we hit set reminder and close the mode off. Should get a notification. Yeah, here you go. Oh, Zach, about to begin in 10 minutes. Are you ready? Grab the popcorn. Okay, great. Um, and there's an option dismiss or see more. If we, for demo reasons, put this in the background, you see that on the thing. It's not clear, and I'm not sure why. Um, I think. Did I spot something wrong? Oh, I know why this is. It's because I put it up in the background, but this is what I'm saying about. This is the on foreground event. So yeah. I can quickly just put this logic into the background event. And. I already have one up here actually, just do it over here. You could also have just done, okay, is it default or dismiss? Basically any ID that you want to cancel, you could just have to put them there. I think I'm gonna have to, every time you update the background handler, you, you have to make sure your app updates. Um, Oh, we'll do that now. Uh, we put the app in the background. And just hit dismiss. And it, yeah, yeah, it cancels. Okay, great. So we open up the app. So that concludes, that's a quick, brief look at scheduling. Um, but it really opens up a lot of stuff you can do without a database, like remote notifications, just within the device itself. Um, so that's pretty cool. And 
I haven't even come this I have not even come to half the stuff you can do. This is just I think the features that I think are most useful, like that are more I'm probably gonna be useful the most amount but different types of apps, so images, um, videos, scheduling. There's also loads of stuff you can do with like timers. The code for this demo is live on GitHub, so go ahead and try it out. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Notify is free for development and for production, a license is required on Android. But Invitase has been kind enough to offer 100 free licenses using code RNEU. I'm Helena Ford, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the brief intro to local React notifications in React Native. Thank you, Helena, for showing us the ins and outs of this load notification library. I'm going to check that right after our conference today, which is now because our conference is ending. That was our last speaker. Um, please join our Discord channel to discuss all today's talks and interact with other React Native freaks. Uh, thank you for staying with us for the whole day. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you uh, to all the speakers for their great uh, talks. and. Uh, I hope we'll see each other tomorrow at the same time. We have a great lineup of talks prepared for you. Um, see you tomorrow then. This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts.